Okay. So I think the streaming via Facebook has now started. I think we can now uh, begin with, uh, with a short prayer before we officially embark for uh, the challenge of the day. Okay, so for let's put ourselves in the presence of our God. Perhaps for those who attended yesterday's session, let's try to recall some highlights. Okay, to also transition us for today's uh, undertaking. And for Catholics, okay, say in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So disturb us or disturb us, O Lord. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst okay, for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build our new earth, we have allowed our vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery. We're losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Amen. Okay. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So again, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you have a good day. And uh, hopefully the prayer was able to transition us to this day's event because yesterday was actually full pack. We've encountered a lot of realities, aside from COVID, cultural, technological, educational, political challenges which uh, challenged our moral reasoning, pushed to the edge our intellectual and moral and philosophical perspectives. And eventually we ended up uh, in a way in a challenge mode to take part more in our political realities, political problems, okay? And have a greater engagement to sustain the vibrancy of our democracy. So with where we ended, I think uh, that's where we are also ushered in, in the, this morning's uh, session, which would start with our, our plenary lecture. So let me briefly introduce our plenary lecturer for this morning. He was president of the Political Science Association of the Philippines. His research work have been indexed in Scopus and Web of Science, Social Sciences Citation Index. Okay. He has been quoted by uh, prominent magazines such as New York Times, The Washington Post, and The Economist. He is a full professor of the Department of Political Science of the De La Salle University. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Dr. Julio Tihanki. Let's give uh, Dr. Julio okay. A virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayan, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Social Ethics Society, especially its president, Father Dexter Veloso, and our chair, Dr. Christopher Ryan Mogolo, my good friend, for giving me this honor to be your plenary speaker for this morning. Now, uh, share my screen now. As we count down no, to the end of uh, President Rodrigo Duterte's uh, six-year term, and we are now preparing for next year's presidential election, uh, I'd like to speak about next year's election. And it seems that uh, 
election, uh, conventional wisdom would tell us that uh, after every term, an election is a referendum on the performance of the outgoing presidents. And it seems that next year's uh, presidential election uh, would be a referendum on the six-year term of uh, six years of the Duterte administration. However, with the declaration and initial strong numbers of Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., it has become apparent that uh, the election would instead be a referendum not simply on the three, on the six years of the Duterte administration, but on the entire three decades of the post Marcos EDSA regime. Now, I would like to pose a provocative question this morning. Is the EDSA moment in our political history over? Consider the following. Despite all the controversial actions and pronouncements, despite the longest and strictest pandemic lockdown in the world and its problematic implementation, despite allegations that go beyond whiffs of corruption in the formally investigation, President Duterte has remained popular. Although the recent uh, SWS survey have shown that uh, that uh, the high numbers of the president is slowly falling, which is expected after uh, when you are nearing the term, uh, the end of term of the presidency. Again, the question is why? Next, despite losing the vice presidential and subsequent uh, election and subsequent electoral protests. The son and namesake of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos, Bongbong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has emerged as an early front runner in next year's presidential election. Again, the question is why? Lastly, BBM's candidacy has triggered the decision of Vice President Lenny Robredo to finally plunge into the presidential derby. She has taken up the mantle for the EDSA forces, but abandoned the color, the very color that symbolized EDSA people power revolution, which is yellow. Why the shift from pink to yellow? Why? The answer, my friends, is not blowing in the wind, but the answer lies in the nature of Philippine presidency. And in order to understand the dynamics for uh, the presidential campaign for next year, we have to understand the nature of the Philippine presidency. And I have written uh, extensively about this. The Philippine presidency is the first and most durable in Asia. As a form of government, although uh, presidentialism was implanted from our American uh, colonizers, it was implanted into our land. Presidentialism, as it evolved in the Philippines, uh, tend to personalize the chief executive more than a parliamentary system. And the presidency is different in the context of the Philippines as compared to uh, its origin, the United States. And even institutionally and structurally, the Philippine president has been afforded more powers compared to the American president. In fact, some have noted that the Philippine presidency evolved out of the governor general during the Spanish period. Hence, in the Philippines, political leadership is concentrated in the president. As a political institution, the Philippine presidency has been rendered enough constitutional power to have a formal semblance of what is known as a strong presidency. 
While the Philippine presidency is patterned after the American template, our practice is actually rooted in Latin American political practices. Historically, the modern Philippine presidency was patterned after the Spanish and later on the American government. Philippine presidency has traditionally been accorded more coercive powers and fiscal prerogatives than its American counterparts. As historian Alfred McCoy noted, there is a strong presidency in the Philippines reflected by authoritarian or strongman presidents. And the very first strongman president was actually Manuel Quezon. However, then he was followed later on by, of course, Ferdinand Marcos, who actually became a dictator. And then, uh, of course, we are all familiar with the strongman of Rodrigo Duterte. However, this view of a strong presidency in a weak state raises the puzzle of why presidents are apparently not strong enough to totally control strategic interests in Philippine society. Uh, let's put it another way. If we have a tradition of strong presidents, how come uh, only a few of these presidents were strong enough uh, to go against the interests of uh, different strategic groups in the country? And uh, while some other presidents have not reached that level of strength. The state continues to be captured by particularistic interests, but the presidency, while it is structurally strong, sometimes exhibit levels of strength and levels of weakness. Another major puzzle is that not all Philippine presidents have been equally strong, and some have constantly run the risk of being overthrown extra-constitutionally. Some have been Ill, uh, vulnerable to serious elite military challenge, with one post-Marcos president uh, being ousted and two others being uh, facing repeated moves in their term of office. Uh, these uh, two presidencies have faced repeated moves to attempts by disgruntled military elements backed by key politicians, business and religious leaders, and even civil society activists. Now, before we attempt to address these puzzles, let us review the literature on the Philippine presidency and presidential leadership. The eminent political scientist, Remio Agpalo, noted, uh, and this is part of the traditionally uh, influential theory on Philippine presidency. We can group these uh, theories, the literature on the Philippine presidency and presidential leadership into two types. The first is the actor-centered strongman presidential style perspective, popularized by the late eminent Filipino political scientist, Remilio Agpalo. Agpalo highlighted the role of the presidential leadership by emphasizing the supremacy of the executive in what he termed the Pangulo regime. Growing largely from cultural notions and communitarian ideas, Agpalo place premium on the value of the concept of pagdamay, which is sharing and caring for fellow uh, uh, individuals. For Agpalo, the Pangulo serves as an appropriate metaphor for the body politic. So in his view, the polity or the political system is not structural, but rather organic. It is comprised of the very same people, you know, the aspirations, the norms, the values, the culture of a community. 
And the polity evolves out of that community. Hence, his concept of the presidency as a pangulo is literally a living entity. The polity is a living entity in which the pangulo is the pangulo, the head of that living community. And for him, one of his uh, famous uh, uh, quotation is that ang sakit ng kalingkingan ay damdam ng buong katawan. The pain suffered by the little finger is felt by the whole body. So his concept of Pangulo is this, not only a symbol, but the living embodiment as literally the head of the state. No? The head of the state. No? So uh, the Pangulo is the pinakaulo, or literally the head. For Agapalo, the realization of this Pangulo regime of course, he, just like Al Mahoy, he identified uh, 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 the presidents whom he considered as embodiments of the Pangulo regime. No? And of course, he mentioned Quezon. But for uh, Agpalo, the ultimate embodiment of this Pangulo regime is the authoritarian Ferdinand Marcos. So, uh, Agpalo is one of those political scientists no, who provided uh, a theoretical justification for Marcos's authoritarian regime. And take note that this is one of the views that looks at the agential, no, the agential strongman approach to the presidency. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the other influential perspective on the Philippine presidency is the structuralist. If uh, Agpalo's view is agential, focusing on the person, uh, focusing on uh, human action of the person or the actor, uh, the other influential perspective focuses on the structure and how it acts as a uh, uh, as a constraint to human action. Now, the view of the president as a patron in chief, which derives from the larger literature about how Philippine politics is conducted primarily on the basis of clientelistic links between voters and politicians and patronage distribution among politi politicians and themselves. So, uh, this literature uh, originated from the 1960s, no, 1950s and 1960s, especially those who studied uh, post-war Philippine politics. And the most prominent among these was Carl H. Lande, an American political scientist, who was first to describe the patron-client ties that define politics in the Philippines. Uh, for Lande, the patron-client factional model uh, uh, is at the heart of Philippine electoral politics. And that model has long dominated the literature on Philippine political science. Among those uh, who have continued this tradition in the study of the Philippine presidency is a Japanese politician from Keio University, uh, Japanese political scientist from Keio University, Yuko. Pasuya. Uh, for Yuko Pasuya, Philippine, the Philippine president is the key figure who controls the legislator's fourth barrel through his or her control of the budget execution processes. The president's control of the fourth barrel creates the logic of a party system formation called presidential vanguard in which incumbents who won at the presidential election year affiliate uh, with various parties no? uh, and they switch from one party to the other. So we have seen in the post-EDSA period that the president as the dispenser of the national budget, while it is true that Congress, particularly the House of Representatives, 
uh, is responsible for uh, preparing and passing the national budget. It is the president who has the final say on the, dis on the disbursement of this budget. And because of this, no, it, has an in it had an impact on the entire patron client uh, chain from the national to the local. Hence, it has resulted in politicians switching from one administration party to another. So those who were members of KDL jumped to LDP during Korea King's time, then jumped to Lakas during FDR's time, then jumped to LAMP during ERAP's time, then jumped to Kampi during Gloria's time, then jumped to the Liberal Party uh, during Pinoy's time, and now they're all part of PDP Laban, and soon they will be jumping to the next presidential administration. So the president has become the patron in chief. There is another view, much different from those of Agpalo and Kasuya. And this one takes a discursive postmodern approach. And of course, uh, for Antonio Contreras, my colleague at Del Salle University, is considered the maven of Philippine postmodernism. There seems to be a dissonance in a society that is inherently communicant, where ideally collective interests prevail over individual interests, but also has a tendency to engage in political ideology. So just like Agpalo, uh, it gives premium more to the cultural, to the communitarian aspect of Filipino society and politics. No? And uh, for him, no, in the absence of a grand text to define the Filipinos, no, unlike our, our, our neighbors in Southeast Asia, no, they have this grand narrative. No? Uh, the Thai have their grand narrative. No? The, the Indonesians and the Malaysians have their grand narratives no, to justify, to legitimize their nation building and state formation. In the Philippines, our state is a colonial construct. Uh, the nation is unfinished. So communities are formed from personal affinities based on pakikipagkapwa. And here, uh, Contreras no, uh, adopts most, most of the uh, uh, theoretical and philosophical uh, 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 points of Zeus Salazar. No? and other uh, 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 Filipino social scientists. No? So political order for Contreras, therefore, is not about building political institutions in the Western sense. No? It's not about state or political parties or election in the Western sense. But for him, it is about pagsasaayos no? or putting the house in order. So he agrees with Agpano that a Pangulo emerges as a core of the body politic. Initially, no, if, you, if you follow uh, Antonio Contreras' uh, uh, knowledge products, no, his columns and his media appearances and his Facebook page, uh, page uh, postings, so initially he was highly supportive of uh, Rodrigo Duterte. But later on, he said, no, uh, he agrees with Agpalo that Pumulo emerges to become the core of the body politic, but he detests no, the emergence of a personality cult that nurtures political ideology. So in the end, no, he has become critical of Rodrigo Duterte. No? Uh, Rodrigo Duterte is the Pumulo, but he decries the polarization and partisanship that had uh, resulted from Duterte's politics. And it has, in his view, resulted in the erosion of the Kapwa, Pakikipag Kapwa. Uh, I would like to discuss one of the old. No? Um, Dr. Christian Ryan Novolo no, has articulated a similar yet different perspective. No? 
And I would like to commend uh, our dear colleague, uh, Ryan Mopolo, for being one of those and one of the few who have articulated the view outside Imperial Manila. You know? A different take on uh, Duterte and Dutertismo. You know? And uh, uh, Ryan Mopolo no? uh, was the one who first, the very first to look at the rise of Duterte from the vantage point outside Imperial Manila. No? Applying Chantal Mook's concept of radical democracy, he argues that the rise of Duterte was brought about by the necessity of antagonism and conflict in post-collective nation building. So, uh, Mopolo agrees, perhaps his views are similar with Agbalo, and up to a certain point, even Contreras, but he takes a different view because uh, following uh, Laclau and Mu, no, uh, radical democracy or even populism is a corrective to elite democracy. No? And uh, uh, Mabolo has embraced that argument in his own writings. No? And for Mabolo, Duterte's radicalism is rooted in uh, in the language of descent of the Bisaya. No? Duterte, the son of Mindanao, has consolidated the sentiments of the Bisaya. No? And uh, in Duterte's grammar, you know, for example, Buot no, manifests the appeal to communal context. And Bisaya na pod, meant that the time has come for Mindanao and Visayas to rise. And of course, the catchphrase Atok Nibay is the prototypical populist, he's one of us. Sa Tagalog, kaisa natin siya. So, Mabolo captured that sight guys that is happening in the peripheries outside and that's the reason why you know, some of us you know, in Manila are still scratching our heads, you know, trying to make sense of Duterte and why we have reached this point. You know? So we only need to go and speak to those outside the margins or outside of the uh, regions of national politics. Then my colleague, uh, the American political scientist Mark Thompson, you know, uh, has proposed another approach, which is structurational relational approach. No? And uh, we have been uh, working on a book project you know, for almost 10 years. No? Uh, and hopefully we'll finish it by next year. No? Uh, our book project on the Philippine presidency first started as uh, Aquino to Aquino. No? And then it has become Aquino to Duterte. And if you don't finish it immediately, there is a big danger that it might be retitled to Marcos to Marcos. <laughs> so, and uh, for uh, uh, Mark Thompson no, and I, no, uh, we argue for a relational theory of presidential regimes no, that is situated in political time. And we adopt a theory by an American political uh, scientist, Stefan Skronek, uh, who studied the uh, U.S. presidency, and we uh, provide you no know, an account of uh, presidential uh, regimes, you no know, strength and vulnerability, you know. and we also adopted the concept of structuration by the British uh, sociologist Anthony Giddens, you know, in which human action is shaped by social structures, which are products of human actions. You know or to paraphrase Karl Marx, presidents act, but not in a way they choose. No? So uh, our first uh, 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 premise is that Philippine presidents govern in accordance with or in odd opposition to an existing political regime or what we call political configuration. A political regime consists of a prevailing political or regime narrative, the support 
of powerful elite strategic groups and the degree of uh, control over the state. Presidents can either be imperious, uh, they can overrun the limited legislative and legal constraint, no? and they may uh, uh, further weaken or even threaten to destroy democracy. But for most of the time, they can be imperial or weak. Presidents, especially those whose uh, narratives have been eroded you know, or discredited and uh, elite support have uh, eroded uh, and cannot control the state, usually uh, end up being imperial or weakened. And if we look at the Philippine presidency, it is best not to look at presidents in a chronological order, but rather their position in what I call political time. Political time is the stage in the life cycle of a political configuration or regime and strongly influences how strong or endangered their presidency proves to be. So a presidency can serve as a sequel or a prequel of a particular regime. You know? So what do we mean by this? You know? So there is a dominant regime you know, in history. For example, in the Philippines, you know, uh, the entire post-war uh, republic no, from 1947, uh, 1947 to 1972 constituted a regime. No? This regime was repudiated no, or uh, rejected and uh, overthrown by another regime, no? uh, Ferdinand Marcos from 1972 to 1986. No? And that is what we call the authoritarian regime. And then at the tail end of that regime, it was overthrown and repudiated by the post-authoritarian EDSA regime from 1986 to the present. And the dominant regime we have had, political configuration, which consists of a dominant regime narrative, support from strategic groups, and control over uh, the state, a president is elected either as an affiliate of the dominant regime or as a challenger to that regime. But it depends you know, at what point uh, does the particular president you know, uh, rise to power. If he or she rises to power uh, when the regime is strong, then there is a uh, uh, most likely uh, uh, possibility that the presidency will succeed. But if uh, unfor it's unfortunately uh, for the president to rise at the time when the regime is weakened or weakening or even falling, then uh, that particular president uh, will be uh, in danger. So you can be affiliated, opposed, vulnerable, resilient. And if we look at the Philippine, the history of Philippine presidency in the context of political time, you know, uh, those who rose to power you know, at the time when the regime narrative was strong, you know, uh, uh, turned out to be quite resilient. So uh, you have uh, the likes of uh, Fidel Valdez Ramos no? uh, at the time when the EDSA uh, regime was still at the early stages and quite strong. No? He was the first uh, successor to Cory Aquino. And Cory Aquino was the one who repudiated no? uh, the Marcos authoritarian regime in the same manner that Marcos himself repudiated uh, the post-war regime. No? Now, uh, there are those who are followers of the dominant regime, uh, but ascended to power at a time when that regime narrative was weakened or weakening. No? 
So Marcos himself no, ascended to power when uh, uh, the post-war regime narrative was weakening, but he himself experienced that same weakening at the tail end of his uh, rule, no? uh, and so on and so forth. No? So there have been two essential regime narratives in the EDSA regime. No? The first is the reformist narrative, no? which points to the good governance, liberal democratic, no? it's all about moral politics. No? And it's encapsulated uh, uh, in the saying, trust me, no? I'm morally good. This is the governing script of the reformist narrative. And that script has been followed no, in every presidency that has been aligned with the EDSA uh, regime. No? Uh, and of course, uh, that moral politics has best reflected in the tuwid na taan, or kung walang korap, walang makita, o uh, following uh, the narrative of his mother. No? The other narrative that has long challenged no, the reformist narrative in Philippine politics post EDSA is the populist narrative. No? And the populists, uh, of course, there are different variants of populism. No? Uh, and we only need to look at uh, uh, Latin America and the recent uh, rise of liberalism and populism in different parts of the world, including the United States. But the traditional populist uh, line is that of the economic no? uh, populism. No? But essentially, populism is an us against them. No? Uh, the little people versus the big people. No? Identification with the people is the, at the heart of populism. No? And in the Philippines, in post ed the Philippines, there have been two variants. No? The traditional economic populism, which is uh, quite benign, no? uh, the pro massa populist narrative no? that's been uh, best exemplified by uh, Joseph Erap Estrada, no? Erap para sa Manila. No? And it has been adopted by other populists like uh, Manny Villar, Hugo Manny Villar, uh, and uh, later on, Jejo Night. No? So the pro massa populist. But a different kind of populism emerged with the rise of uh, uh, Rodrigo Duterte. And this is what the uh, uh, Nicole Corato term as penal populism or punitive populism or those who uh, uh, who enforces order no? uh, through any means. No? So if for ERA, it's trust me, I'm one of you. No? ERA para sa mahirap. No? And uh, more often than not, no, uh, most populists are uh, in, embroiled in uh, uh, scandals no? uh, involving corruption. No? Why? Because part of the narrative is the Robin Hood narrative, no? which uh, steals from the rich to give to the poor. No? So trust me, I'm one of you. But for Duterte, it's a different kind of populism. No? It's uh, the punisher. No? Trust me, I will kill for you. And in other instances, I will kill you. Now, we also assert that the success of regime narrative depends on key support from strategic interests in the Philippines. And what are the strategic interests? No? It's the military, no? it's either the military support issue or not. Business, uh, in, in the early years of the EDSA regime, it's Makati business. No? Later on, the challenge to the EDSA regime no? have seen the emergence of other uh, business people, you know, business persons from other parts of the country, you know, the church you know, and civil society, and even external strategic actors like the United States, which has played uh, an influential role in our domestic politics for the most time. Of course, in, re in recent years, you know, uh, the role of the United States is being supplanted by another external player, China. And we are caught in this uh, rising geopolitical competition. Okay, I'll make this quick for the interest of time. Uh, so, in the 
EDSA regime, no? we have seen that the EDSA regime uh, emerged as a repudiation of the Marcos authoritarian regime. It was founded by Corazon Aquino, and several presidents have succeeded her. No? So uh, uh, Fidel Ramos no, was a follower of the regime uh, and was an innovator of the regime. Uh, but uh, that regime narrative was challenged by the populist uh, narrative, and uh, it resulted in the election of Herak Estrada. But uh, that narrative was discredited by allegations of corruption, so he was uh, the second president to be ousted by a people powerful commission and was replaced by a, another follower of the regime, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who, uh, who began as a follower of the regime narrative, but later on turned her back to that narrative because in order to uh, protect that regime narrative, you know, she had to uh, win uh, uh, the 2004 election at all costs no, to defeat another populist challenger, Fernando Co. Jr. But in doing so, uh, she has committed a sin against the Elsa regime narrative, and she was uh, uh, excommunicated by Elsa, and now she is part of the counter Elsa uh, uh, political players. No? And then uh, because of uh, uh, all the scandals during her term, uh, it resulted, and the death of Cory Aquino, it resulted in a revival of that regime narrative in Cory Aquino, who initially uh, was seen as strengthening the EDSA regime narrative, but because of a series of uh, unfortunate events during his term, uh, people, uh, ordinary voters, uh, became disillusioned with the EDSA regime narrative. And there was this grievance and, and all this uh, anger, and it resulted in the election of another populist, but a more deadly populist in the person of uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who has paved the way for a more uh, a revival of a strongman authoritarian. So one of the problems with the uh, narratives is that one can get caught in a narrative trap. You know? A narrative trap, of course, when a governing script or the stories, the storylines, diverges too dramatically from political reality, resulting in loss of support or even severe antagonism from the critical strategic groups of the country. So Marcos stayed so long that his uh, a narrative and script of making the country great again you know, uh, became hollow. Erap no, was involved in a major scandal, in the wedding scandal. So uh, there was a, uh, a divergence from uh, the storyline and reality. And of course, I've already told you about what happened to uh, GNA. What happened to uh, Noy Noy? Uh, Noy Noy delivered no, in terms of uh, economic per performance, high growth, political stability. Uh, he was able to clean up uh, uh, whatever uh, corruption scandal that happened during the time of uh, the other administration. But he himself faced some challenges. No? So uh, despite his personal uh, popularity due to his clean image and lack of personal uh, scandals, he failed to institutionalize the reform agenda of the IOP. So it was still politics as usual. In order to achieve all of his economic reforms, he had to play patronage politics as well. And then uh, his own regime narrative of kung walang korap, walang mahirap, uh, was faced with the uh, DAP scandal, the pork barrel scandal, you know? and then later on uh, issues like uh, 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 the handling of Yolanda and, of course, the Mapa Spano incident further eroded trust not only in Aquino, but the Aquino brand and the entire uh, Ed Sanatip. And why? Because of the failure 
of ESA to bring us to the promised land. So despite all this high growth forecast, uh, credit rating and all, it failed to uh, trickle down to the ordinary. So this resulted in a politics of anger, politics of resentment, and this resulted in the rupture in the post-Marcos and liberal regime with the victory of Rodrigo Duterte, who is a major challenger to the ESA regime. But Duterte himself no, uh, has become so controversial not only in his uh, own populist style, the way he speaks, no? the way he offends people and all that, uh, but for some, that is part of his authenticity. That's the way, and it's part of uh, 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 the non-elite no? slapping the elites no? in their faces. No? And, uh, but of course, it has resulted in the death of many in the war on drugs, the encroachment of China in Western D.C., the handling of the pandemic, no? uh, and of course, uh, the ongoing Senate investigation on the parliament's scandal. So the question is, if people no, got angry with Noe, given, uh, uh, given the performance of Noe, some of the things that Moy 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 failed to achieve under his administration. Uh, some are saying Duterte has also failed to deliver and in fact have done uh, things that are more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more uh, controversial than the previous administration. How come there is no anger yet. There is no resentment yet. How come he remains to have high satisfaction numbers? So, uh, of course, uh, SWS came out with this uh, uh, satisfaction rating and it, it uh, confirms no, what Paul Sisha had been uh, saying all along. No? That uh, despite, uh, you know, uh, his numbers falling, he remains to be popular and his approval rating remains to be high compared to the previous presidents uh, in the ESA period. You know? uh, why? Because, well, according to SWS, he still has strong base of support, particularly in Mindanao and Visayas. And uh, because of the ayuda, perhaps, no? there are, there's satisfaction in his pamamalakan. And there are those who approve of the war on drugs. No? And then there are those who are uh, attracted no? to his uh, authenticity, no? the way he speaks. It's, uh, it's how the, your, 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 your uncle or your tito or your tatay no? would, uh, would usually uh, act. No? Uh, well, for the... Uh, for the United Philippines. But according to SWS, the three types no, of uh, explanation, the strong base support uh, for, uh, and uh, satisfaction with his uh, pamamalakan and even his uh, personal uh, traits, it's the perception of the personal or character that appears to be the strongest source of uh, uh, support for the president. And Duterte, compared to other post-Marcos presidents, no, still maintain a very high uh, uh, rating, even beyond the midterms. No? And uh, SWS have tracked no, the so-called honeymoon period. Uh, for Cory Aquino, it's three and one fourth years no, uh, that her administration enjoyed a honeymoon period, strong support from the public. For Ramos, it's two and one-fourth years. No? For Estrada, it's just three-fourth. No? And it, it went south all the way. No? Uh, Arroyo did not even experience any honeymoon period because her ascent, ascendancy to power was uh, quite controversial and polarizing. No? Then Benigno Aquino, just like the mother, no? almost three years of high 
uh, uh, support, no, honeymoon period, no. But uh, Duterte, no, has always been high, no? and uh, 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 it's only recently that uh, his numbers are falling, which is again part of the trajectory of a single term presidency. Uh, some have said again. The question is why. No? Well, uh, some uh, social scientists have pointed to social desirability bias. No? Uh, when when uh, these firms are taking surveys, no? uh, the respondent no? and just imagine if you go to uh, class D and E in a very small tight uh, community no? in the uh, uh, in the urban poor communities, for example, no? where your answers might be within hearing distance of your neighbor, no? there is that notion of ya, or pakikisama, or not being truthful to your response. No? Then, of course, there are those who are saying of uh, pointing to fear factor no? because of the war on drugs. No? Uh, people are saying positive things about government because they're afraid that they may not get their ayuda. And there are those who are saying it's part of the performative populism. Uh, for the elites, no, uh, they get rattled, they get angry with the way the president behaves in TV, with the not so late night with that kind of But that is actually the, the source of his strength because the president is not talking to the academicians or the elites or the businessmen, he's directly talking to the ordinary. And why is he still popular? Why is he still strong? Why is that residual popularity being reflected first on uh, his daughter, Mayor Sara Duterte? Or now, since Mayor Sara Duterte for now has decided not to pursue her presidential run, it's being transferred to Hong Kong Marcos. Well, because uh, Duterte narrative, which is a challenge to the EDSA narrative, is still strong or has not yet defeated. So the strong narrative of the Duterte brand is the major experiment. We, are, we have not yet seen the peak of this Duterte. So in next year's election, uh, political uh, strategies usually you know, look at the uh, the chessboard of elections, you know, and we either look at uh, command votes you know, or the machine votes, you know, usually uh, generate the ground war, and uh, market votes you know, uh, usually generate the popularity, uh, and popularity is uh, generated to a strong, compelling narrative, you know, strong, compelling narrative. So if we look at the declared uh, candidates for next year, uh, Bongbong Marcos has the money, some support from the government. Then the challengers, actually, the two major challengers, uh, you have the two who are variants also of the populist narrative. Uh, Isco Moreno is more like uh, the era of Estrada, more benign pro massa. Uh, He's more actually technocratic, no? so he's a mix of both reformist and populist. No? Uh, Manny Pacquiao is also uh, uh, the quintessential populist. No? Uh, the only difference now is that we have Isuo and Manny Pacquiao, populists who really came from the poor, unlike the previous populist politicians that we have. No? I'm about to finish, no? I'll wrap this up. No? So, but now we have. Uh, VP Lenny Robredo as the avatar of the EDSA narrative. No? And it is upon her shoulder to defend and protect that narrative. But since the, the brand has been tarnished, has been solid, no? has been attacked, and has weakened no? uh, by the followers of Duterte and Marcos, and because of uh, its own uh, shortcomings, uh, now there is a repositioning, rebranding. You know? Now 
T is the new yet. So, uh, we've had uh, all of these surveys, no? and we have the pre-filing survey which showed that uh, Indai Sara was at the, 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 was the front runner, but she, since uh, she decided not to pursue the presidency, we'll have to wait until November 15th to finally uh, say that she's not running, but uh, she, her votes, no, her numbers no, transferred to Bongbong Marcos, and Bongbong Marcos running no, has triggered uh, BP Lenny to run. So the two of them uh, now benefits from the bouts no? uh, after the declaration, and then uh, you have this Comoreno coming in third. No? At least uh, this is one of the many surveys that I've seen, but somehow that is the trajectory. No? So at uh, this point, no? Bong, Bong Marcos has emerged as a front runner with Lenny Robredo coming behind. No? So uh, before the filing, it was, you know, uh, the storyline for next year's election would be is it Duterte again or who can best challenge or continue Duterte's uh, presidency. But now the entire narrative has shifted to, again, Marcos Aquino. But not Marcos Aquino, the person, the personalities, but the Marcos authoritarian regime versus the it's a democratic regime, no matter how long it is. So it's a question of, are we going back to uh, the strongman authoritarian and uh, Duterte was simply the John Baptist to a revival of the uh, Marcos authoritarian regime in the person of Bongo Marcos? Or... Uh, will this challenge rejuvenate and finally correct the elite democracy that was ensued? That is the question. And the race is on for 20 years. With that, I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Julio for a very interesting but also clarifying presentation, which uh, clearly contextualizes the, uh, the situation before the 2022 election. So now we open the floor for questions. I think we have uh, roughly 15 minutes for questions. So we allow room first for those who would like to ask questions. Okay verbally, but you can also write your questions in the chat box, Sir? which we will try to entertain later. Okay, so it's the first one. Can, can I hit the first question, sir? Uh, this is uh, Sir Edgar. Okay, go yes, ahead. Sir. Uh, go ahead. If for anything else, I would like to uh, greet all participants of this conference. Pleasant morning to each and everyone, especially to my uh, professor in USET, uh, Sir Christopher Ryan Mabolo and Dr. Sable. Uh, actually, sir, the topic uh, was very interesting. And thank you very much, uh, Sir Tehanki, for sharing that one. But I cannot help no, to also air my personal reaction based on the topic, which actually will lead me to my questions. Uh, the topic actually has 90% inclusive of political issues. Uh, before social media actually came into being as an integral form of the fourth estate, uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Tihanke is also a columnist no? in one of the prestigious uh, newspaper outlets. I, I heard uh, one specific, siguro, before. Uh, Nga, no? uh, the social media uh, became as an integral form of the fourth estate. No? Uh, traditional media or mainstream media controlled or all information before. No? Uh, all information and shows only news information that serves their purpose. 
I am referring to the to the to the oligarchs now, which control media outlets like TV, radio stations, uh, news outlets, telephones, as an institution of information. But with the onset of social media, everything shifts from the mainstream to the common or the masses. Meaning, even the most destitute who lives in the far flung areas can now access information, process this information, and decide based on what they see and believe as seen in any social platforms. <laughs> My question, sir, actually, th these are three uh, questions, though. No? Number one, can social media uh, really make and then make a precedent? And number two, is social media popularity, social media popularity, uh, sir, huh, can slowly make uh, the demise of the mainstream media? Okay. Number three, okay. what do you think uh, is the best solution of the minority at this point in time, huh? uh, because the election uh, is already about to take place next year? Uh, to counter the popularity of the current administration with the combined power of social and mainstream media at their uh, disposal. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, quickly, no. Uh, social media. This is a topic for another plenary talk. No. So perhaps next year you can invite me again. So, uh, uh, but yeah, at the heart, well, social media, just like traditional media, are tools. No. So you know. Print, it used to be uh, broadcast and print. It used to be print, you know, newspaper. Then later on, broadcast, radio, then TV. You know? And then social media emerged. You know? These are all part and parcel of what we call in political uh, uh, strategy as uh, air war. You know? uh, but air war, you know, which is uh, media, you know, uh, now has a, again a variant, you know? net war, you know, which is the social media or internet. War. Now, uh, internet is uh, and social media are tools. No, again, I point to my uh, primary thesis. It's all about the narrative. No, if you don't have a comp compelling narrative, then it will not uh, resonate with the people, no? with the masses, with your target constituency. Now, um, uh, it, the latest uh, post Asia survey have shown that. Uh, the main source of news is still uh, television. But the, the dynamics is correct that uh, in the past, traditional media uh, was one of the primary uh, uh, capital of the oligarchs. No? And they controlled this in order to protect their business and political interests. No? And uh, that's the reason why... Uh, uh, the closure of ABS-CBN will have a big impact on next year's election no? because uh, 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 it, it totally uh, shatters the dynamics of uh, the usual uh, presidential campaign in the country. So, ang, ang sinasabi natin dito ay uh, the use of social media should not be treated. And by the way, Pulse Asia has shown that half of the population are uh, connected to internet and social media, and the other half are still connected to traditional media. So, uh, you know where the pendulum is swing. You know? Because half uh, get their information. And usually, this half are the OFWs. You know? That's the reason why uh, 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 President Duterte and even Bongo Marcos are strong with the OFW. Because those who are abroad you know, have only one source of information about the Philippines, no? which is social media. Right? Makes sense. Right? Uh, but we have to also understand that internet uh, connectivity and penetration is still not high in the Philippines. No? Uh, the main source of social media information and say, uh, uh, connection to the internet is still mobile phones, which have, uh, which have a very high percentage of ownership in the country. So uh, these are all the dynamics. No? Ngayon, uh, you have the uh, information infrastructure, and then you have the, uh, the narrative. Duterte was successful because he was able to short-circuit the traditional mode of communication through the traditional media and went directly to his constituency uh, through out, outrageous comments, through his uh, social influencer like Mo Uson, and all of these uh, 
uh, things. No? That is only one aspect. But there's a more deeper magic, and I say that with uh, tongue-in-cheek, no? magic to social media, which is actually beyond simple uh, spreading of information, misinformation, disinformation, or using social media for advertisement. It's the Cambridge Analytical Model of the use of big data analytics to micro-target constituency and to uh, tailor fit messages to specific uh, demographics. And I think that's the magic you know, in all this resurgence of Marcos Nasaja because of this kind of approach. So I hope I answered this. Now, uh, is there a way to counter that? Yes, I think all the camps now are into it and they're trying to outwit each other on traditional and social. Thank, thank you, okay. sir, for uh, the indulgence of answering those questions. Sir, sir, uh, sir Ayan, can I... Uh, okay. Sige, sir Sable, ask, uh, go ahead. Go thank ahead. you, sir. I, I, I am honored that uh, Sir uh, Pihanki followed me in academia that you do. Uh, you are one of my followers in the article uh, Democratizing Democracy in the Philippines. Now I see your face, although in the virtual uh, world. Uh, I'm honored to that uh, regard. Now, my question is, the, uh, the platform of the platform of uh, the current presidency uh, of governance is linked to Tama si Duterte, tapang at malasakit. Now, uh, it seems that it has uh, it has uh, influenced uh, a lot uh, of the population in spite of his uh, radicalism in dealing with uh, governance, in dealing with problems of the country, especially during this time of pandemic. How, how would you uh, assess his presidency at the time uh, uh, from 2016 up to now. Is, is he doing well in that uh, uh, platform? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I've been critical of this presidency. So I, I, I'll say that outright. No, I've been critical of this presidency. No? But uh, I've also supported uh, uh, some of its uh, advocacies in the earlier part, no? particularly uh, the, uh, the promise to uh, push for federalism. No? Because I've long been a uh, federalist even before the term. No? Uh, I've worked with uh, the late uh, UP President, uh, and I was appointed to the Constitutional Commission. No? Uh, and I headed the, uh, I chaired the uh, uh, subcommittee on uh, political and electoral reform. And I, I made sure that all political reforms uh, were uh, were included in the draft constitution, anti-political dynasty, political party development, and all these prerequisite for. Uh, to my uh, disappointment, no. Uh, uh, he could have used his political will to finally implement and institute all these political reforms. So in the end, he has turned out to be just like Noy Noy, who promised good governance but failed to institute good governance. So uh, I'm not the type who would just uh, criticize or reject uh, without any basis. I always give every administration a chance. My experience with all post Mark Marcos uh, administration is at the beginning, they show a lot of promise, but in the end, they fall into the same patronage, clientelistic, uh, dynastic politics that have long been the source of this country's misery and So sadly, he has failed. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, he has not instituted any reforms or radical or moderate that will change the course of this country's politics. And it's going to be politics as usual uh, next year. Uh, I don't see anyone really radically changing uh, this type of politics. That we have. That's the sign. Thank you, sir, for that uh, very good uh, insights on on the current uh, state of the presidency. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Sige. Thank you, Dr. Sable. I think uh, Dr. Valverde, the chair of our philosophy department, was raising her hand. Okay. Mavida would like to ask a question. I'm sorry. Okay, um, thanks, Ayan. Good morning, Dr. July. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vida from the Ateneo de Davao. I, I, I was just thinking, I was wondering, if the coming elections is a sort of face-off between um, the Marcos authoritarian regime narrative and the EDSA elite democratic regime narrative, I guess, um, I was thinking, uh, what factors do you think can swing the decision either way? So what will make that compelling or tipping point narrative? Okay. Since, thank you very much. Thank you for that very interesting question. Uh, indeed, no. since I am now speaking in front of uh, fellow philosophers, I, by the way, I minored in philosophy. So <laughs> I am one of them. So, uh, uh, in philosophy, social philosophy, you know, of course, uh, there's that structure versus agency debate. You know? So uh, while history and political time may be structural constraint you know, to the narratives you know, and dynamics of the Philippine presidency, there is always uh, that thing called human agency, our capacity to act. You know? So it is not just in stone. So uh, as you have seen, no, uh, before the filing of the candidacy when Inday Sara uh, was at head of the PAC, no, people were looking at Isco Moreno no, as the possible competition to, because of the mayor narrative, no, uh, doing uh, things for the masses and all that. But when uh, Inday Sara uh, dropped out of the race and then uh, Wong Bong Marcos uh, benefited from that and emerged as a front runner, you know, suddenly it re-energized you know, uh, the camp of Vice President Lenny. So suddenly the terrain has shifted from a potential uh, two young mayors facing off to suddenly a return to that Marcos versus Aquino. You know? Again, no one can blame people from thinking along the lines of Marcos versus Aquino because now Marcos is a presidential candidate. And definitely, Marcos, the Marcos record, the Marcos authoritarian regime will be front and center, will be a major issue. And uh, now, no one can speak of other things, not other narrative, but that narrative. Uh, do you want a return to a strong man uh, regime? And apparently, there's a growing constituency who believes in that. You know? uh, or do you want uh, uh, a preservation and uh, to improve uh, the democracy that we've had under EDSA no matter how long? And it goes back to uh, Ryan uh, Mohollock's uh, uh, discussion of uh, Laclau and in which uh, one aspect of populism is that uh, when it faces with elite democracy, it tends to populism is a corrective to elite democracy. So it's not that gloomy. In fact, uh, uh, a challenge by Marcos, a, a challenge of a Marcos uh, resurgence and restoration might knock senses out of this country's need to finally consider real political forms that will fix this country's politics once again. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Lai. I like that. Um, knock their senses. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, I think most of them are still thinking it's politics as usual. No? Akala nila it's the same. Right? Hindi nila alam that the very uh, future of this regime is at stake. <laughs> so, uh, wala. Kanya-kanya pa rin sila. So, There's a question okay. here I'd like to answer sa chat box, no, if I may. No? Is oh, he yes. Bongbong's Sige father's up. repetition? No? Ah, pala yung sinasabi ang kasalanan ng ama ay ng kasalanan ng anak. Ang problema ay, ang anak ang tagapagmana ng kayamanan ng ama ng nakahoso. <laughs> so, until i-recognize naman niya no? ah, na may talagang may nagkaroon ng nakawan at ibalik yung nakaw na yaman, eh, sana bago siya tumakunan po sa buhay. Eh, kasi, Punta tayo yung South Korea. In South Korea, the daughter of the assassinated dictator Park Chung-hee, Park Byung-hee, no? uh, ran for the presidency a couple of years back, apologized no, to the South Korean people for the sins of the father. And she was elected. No? Unfortunately, she was ousted. Uh, because, <laughs> hindi, kasi nga, dahil sa narrative pa rin ng tatay niya, she got embroiled also in a corruption scandal. And a people power uprising happened in Seoul in South Korea and she was ousted from the presidency. She was impeached and ousted. So even if we see a restoration of Hong Kong Marcos in Malacanang, I don't see any stability because it will be a polarizing regime. Now. So, you know, you know, potential. Okay. Thanks. Can we have uh, one last question? Because I know I, even if we are interested to engage more, we might be uh, running out of yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Doc, there's something else in the chat box. Or yes, maybe I, Sir I Oliver would I like to... Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe Sir Oliver would like to verbalize his question. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Sir Aulio. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So, by the way, I'm Oliver Pirater from Inisio IIT. Uh, so, yeah, no, I just want I just want have to read uh, read my uh, question. Given the data, we have the presidents of the republic always uh, uh, enjoyed the the honeymoon period, right? uh, It seems that this honeymoon period is a chance given by the people to the new president to prove himself or herself. So basically, after that, uh, at the, the, the second half of their, their career as the president, so the survey with, uh, will, will, will uh, fall down. Uh, so basically, except Duterte, is, you know, as you have said. Uh, so basically, still, if, even if Duterte managed to stay at the top of the honeymoon period even until now, uh, still, uh, as you said, he, he failed to de deliver a lot of a lot of reforms somehow that he could possibly do because uh, he's a popular president. He could do a lot, pretty much a lot. Uh, but still, he, he did not manage to deliver that. So my question is, do you, do you think uh, the, the Philippine political system really worked for the Filipino people uh, in, in this? Yeah. So uh, uh, as a political scientist, I'm uh, uh, an institutionalist, no? uh, but I'm also uh, a structure Durationalist. So I'm, I believe both in ideational, discursive, and structural factors. No? So uh, uh, as I've already uh, elaborated, narratives are ideas, no? are, 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 are discourses, no? but they affect structures and institutions. No? Uh, but we also have to consider really addressing structural and institutional so uh, a change of institution will also result in a change of mindset. You know? And uh, uh, first of all, in the short term, you know, uh, the minimum reform that we need are long uh, delayed reforms in our political system, you know? uh, polit electoral reforms and political party reforms, you know? or the, even the passage of uh, a law regulating or even by 
that's been enshrined in our constitution and for three decades have not been implemented. That's in the short term. In the long term, we really have to seriously consider uh, uh, reviewing and revisiting our constitution. But uh, cons any attempt to re revise the constitution has become uh, a life and death political situation for the country because there's that suspicion that the president would tinker and would simply want to extend his term, which is a result of a one-term presidency. So uh, there's a need to seriously consider uh, revising the constitution and reviewing whether we want a presidential form to continue with this type of system or to shift to another form of political system that would best represent our interests. No? Uh, and then there's also that idea of whether to stick with the one-term presidency or to go back to a two-term presidency, you know, uh, which is which has some impact on party building and uh, would have an impact on this so-called uh, uh, honeymoon period. You know? Kasi if there are, we go back to a two-term presidency, then the midterm, uh, then the president will perform based on the incentive of re-election. You know? And then the people can, you know what they say, you know, six years is too long for a bad president and it's too short for a good. So these are uh, 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 institutional engineering that might help us in the long run. But uh, it's a combination of both a change in structure and a change in mindset. And it will take a long time because uh, of other factors like uh, political education, uh, active citizenship. We have to nurture this. Some things that we have long uh, uh, taken for granted. And it's the task of each and every one of us uh, in the knowledge industry as uh, educators and researchers as academics to be a part of this task of uh, political and civic education. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. July, for leading us into that uh, very productive okay, and engaging discussion. Okay, uh, For those who might want to have more questions, I don't know if uh, Dr. July is open to engage them in the chat box later. Oh, teka, sandali, or, no, may, or maybe... Request. May request lang ako, ano, Aya, no? Uh, nakalimutan oh. kong pakita kanina. Okay, sige, sige. Uh, sandali, ah. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, <laughs> in my media appearances and my uh, lectures and oh, webinars, no, please visit uh, my YouTube channel, uh, there, Politics there. with Bihanti. Mm -hmm. And please, uh, I would like everyone to uh, subscribe, like, and comment on my videos. My, it's a uh, repository of all my uh, interviews and lectures, and I hope to engage. Uh, you no, uh, more on this YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Okay. So there, yeah. I think that answers our question where we can engage uh, Dr. July more after this uh, session. And I think we have to give in to his request for a group photo. Okay. For those who, who would like to uh, join me in a group photo, please uh, switch on your... Yeah. So can we switch on our... Video. Video, or at least a photo in your account. And uh, Engineer Nelson will assist us okay, in this uh, okay. photo. Okay, there are 110 of us, so we will have uh, five <laughs> screens <Frame. laughs> in, in my frames. Okay, so uh, please smile, everyone. I'm taking screen number one. Okay, mga ngalay kayo, pero continue lang yung ite. Uh, I'm taking screen number two. Okay, please open your cams. Third screen. Fourth screen. last screen 
There you are. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And again, thank you very much, uh, Doc July. I hope we can still have you in the future for more engaging discussion. So let's give uh, Doc July a virtual round of applause. Okay, so okay, in the interest of time, we will have to move now to our uh, lineup, next lineup of uh, speakers. Okay, let me remind the speakers to at least limit their discussion to uh, 20 minutes, okay, at most maybe 25 minutes, so that we still have room for discussion, which I think is also an interesting part aside from your. Uh, presentation. So I think our next presenter okay, is now around. Okay. Our first presenter after our plenary lecture this morning is uh, a prophetic uh, critic. Uh, is a teaches at San Jose Recoletos in Cebu City. He studies for his uh, Masteral in Political Science at the University of San Carlos Graduate School. He is a host in a popular podcast okay, in Cebu City. Okay. His uh, talk will be about the prophetic critique as precursor to public religion, how biblical dissent counters theological nationalism. Friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Mar Louis Vincent Reyes. Good uh, morning, everyone. Okay, so my topic is entitled The Prophetic Critique as Precursor to Public Religion, although I'll be focusing more first on what is this prof prof prophetic critique all, of, all about. So I wanted to know if, um, because there's this uh, understanding that Christianity seems to be uh, conforming or subservient to the state, uh, uh, we will find out why that is the case. So... Here we go. This is prophetic. This, this is prophetic critique as precursor to public religion. How biblical dissent counters theological nationalism. So one of the most commonly cited, repeated verses of scripture ever to be told, not just by preachers but by secular people as well, by, by those in authority, is Romans thirteen, uh, verses one to seven. So uh, I'll just show the screen here for those who want to read, but basically. Uh, the suggestion is that this means that Christians are supposed to obey authority because they are chosen by God. Now, that interpretation may sound uh, simple enough. It's already written there. It, it did say authorities are established by God. So we have to obey our officials, right? Except there is a problem with this, uh, with, with just, just isolating this passage. Because, and let's look at the next slide. We have a story wherein in the Old Testament, one of the prophets chosen by God was against the idea of a king chosen by God because God did not want to choose a king back then. Okay, so this time I'll tell the story here. Now, for context, uh, this was the time of Prophet Samuel. This is what some would call the age of the judges. Back then, Israel was divided into 12 tribes, and that was actually the division there. There was no king back then. So in times of emergency, they had a figure called a judge. A judge is not necessarily a court judge. A judge can be called a magistrate. He's a military and political leader in times of emergency. Unfortunately, during this time, Samuel had sons, and those sons abused their power. So that resulted in this demand. You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Give us a king right now. God said that, uh, in essence, the demand for a king was tantamount to rejecting God. Because the king of Israel was always God. So what they did was essentially uh, deny the legitimacy of their original king. But nonetheless, God said Samuel should listen. Now, there's something like if you were to compare these two in isolation, there's a contrast. Because on the one hand, this does say this is the start of the kingship of Israel. This is the start of God choosing leaders in Israel. But there, 
but but there's a sort of this uh, disconnection between the two. Some would say the New Testament should be preferred because it is a, a practical advice, whereas this one is a particular context uh, wherein uh, God at that time did not favor and then he decided that he would. Except that, that, that limits God and limits the interpretation of the Bible in a few fronts. So there are two ways to understand. There are a few ways to understand this. But before I go to the explanations, there's one thing to note, and it's that uh, Jesus does fulfill the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. That's why it's called Testament. The problem is just because Jesus fulfills the, the Old Covenant with, with himself being the New Testament, that the Gospel, the, bringing the Gospel, it doesn't follow that the ones preaching the Gospel have, have a, let's just say, have a way of, of uh, breaking or canceling established concepts because that's not, what, that's not what is happening here. So first off, to set the stage here, during the New Testament, uh, those who were listening to Jesus saw the kingdom of God and its hope for them as something that changes the world. For them, the kingdom of God renders everything else irrelevant. And by the time of the early Christians, after the death of Jesus, after his resurrection, and after his ascension to heaven, there was an expectation. Judaism is a religion of expectations. So those who listen to the coming of the kingdom of God, they expected something will change. When Jesus died, that expectation was crushed until word of his resurrection came out. By the time that this word was spread all across the known world, Christians were waiting for the second coming. Some would say it's the end of the world, but a proper way to say it is it's the end of this age, the end of these affairs. The world may still exist, but it's, not, it's going to be transformed by Christ. Now, another uh, development was that after, the, the, after Christianity expanded further into the Roman Empire, when read in the context of that time when Christianity became the dominant religion, uh, 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 start, actually starting with the persecution era all the way to the, um, the imperialism of Rome, some interpretations soften the critical senses of Jesus. Uh, you know, one example is Jesus flipping off the tables or Jesus condemning, uh, let's say, yeah, the condemnations of Jesus towards the religious leaders, uh, for example, with regards to um with, with regards to their authorities, stuff like that. Basically, there are critical stances, even on, on Jesus' uh approach to the poor is also softened somewhat. Uh but not, nevertheless, uh, with regards to the epistles of, of St. Paul, Peter, and other associated uh, figures of, of the age of the apostles, uh, there, was, there was this mentality that Christians had to, as if, no, live holy lives in pagan societies. Now, that's the persecution era. That's the early Christian era. Now, once we transition after the fall of Rome to the medieval period, uh, there was a new development, a new system at play. So one reason why feudalism developed was because Rome's old system, the one everybody was used to, was too complex. Uh, kingdoms could not manage the complex structures Rome could. So what they did is create their own system. It does, I don't know if it's like whether the church came first or it was the state that did it, but feudalism existed for this uh, as a sort of substitute for the Roman system. So there was feudal, there were feudal obligations expected of kings, but there was also feudal obligations on on peasants. So essentially, uh, the, this system was strengthened by theology. One of these uh, means of strengthening the system was the atonement theories posited by different theologians, including Saint Anselm of Canterbury, uh, positing God as a Lord to be satisfied. Okay, so. Uh, Satisfaction theory is also a concept in feudalism. It, your crimes, the punishment of your crime depends on who you offended. If you offended a king, it's either the death penalty or you have to repay at an, ex, a, 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 an incredible amount. It's so big an offense, you cannot pay. That's the logic of God uh, in this context, in the satisfaction theory. So there are contrasts between what is said in the scriptures versus these, these interpretations. Now, 
let's look at the context of ancient Israel. Why was it not ruled by kings? Now, when Moses led the people out of Egypt, one would wonder, why didn't they make Moses king? The simple answer is God is their king. Moses was simply a magistrate, a representative. Some called him Lord, but nonetheless, Moses did not hold authority outside of God. Now, that's important that uh, judges were appointed by God. Their, their authority comes from him, absolutely. Not from the people, not from the king, from God directly. But that doesn't follow that they can do whatever they want. In fact, every time a judge appears, God's eyes were really focused on them because the judges are impermanent officials. They only appear in times of emergency. They have kingly power to enact justice, You know, the literal term mm -hmm. judge. But at the same time, they're... Uh, their place in this society their place in this society is limited for one uh, let, let's compare it to rome's dictators you know the, the roman dictator has six months or less or more of power they were appointed from from the consuls of the senate they were chosen to be the emergency leader they have absolute power judges are like that except there is no such thing as absolute power in the judge system the only thing they can do is god's will that's it the problem was, uh, we'll go to the problem later, but first, uh, let's talk about the distinctions between king and judge. A king is different. A king has his own authority. Now, yes, the kings back then were justified by divine right. That's very true. Except uh, what made Israel distinct was that there was no middleman. There's no middleman well, except for the judge, but he's not even as powerful as he seems to be because Israel's relationship with God was that close. The closeness of the relationship with God resulted in this idea that there is no other king but God. There was no separation of church and state because I, and, and I would argue state belongs to God. That's the idea. So uh, the problem with the king was that regardless of religion, the kings would create a distinct class. The king would be outside the community. Power makes him a god. Uh, the concept of the, of the Leviathan, for example, gives him this godlike power. But nevertheless, uh, that concept of kingship was shared mostly by the people of the Near East, except Israel. So the, the problem for them was actually, it was also mentioned later on, that the problem was that this king would limit the rights of the people based on the authority on, given to his title. And also, most importantly, for the context of First Samuel, to call for a change of the system is to say God's system did not work. In other words, it was a defiance, a rebellion against God. That was why Samuel and God were offended. <clears throat> but at the same time, there was, there was merit to this system. Uh, it's not the Samuel's sons. It was also the sons of Eli. Now, Eli's sons, the predecessor of Samuel, who was also a priest, they were also corrupt people. So the experience, the recent experience of the people with the corruption of the judge system, which, by the way, is God's system, made them think that God's system was inefficient. Another problem was that there was an in there was an upcoming invasion and there was not enough time to prepare. So if a judge like Sammy would say, okay, let's rally the armies, let's attack. That's a problem because they don't have the way to extract more resources from the people. They owed many things in common. So resource acquisition would be very limited. So their idea was, let's create a class system that is more clarified instead of a priestly class, and the tribes, let's create one more class because the priestly cl class gets the offerings, the taxes of the people, but those taxes are used for the rituals. Let's put that money to good use in the military. That's what makes ancient Israel distinct from the other nations because to put money on military affairs like that without the consent of the priestly class or God, that, that would essentially mean that people were acting on their own authority. But yes, there was merit to it, the corruption of the judges, the invasion. The role of the king is it's much more simplified and much more clear that he would face international threats more directly and he would have better control over the bureaucracy. It would not only ensure national security, but expand political and economic influence. So there was a cycle here. Once people wanted kings, they wanted more. They wanted power. 
So essentially, they created a class system in order to become more powerful, which is an irony in itself. So interpreting 1 Samuel's texts, on the surface, this pronouncement by Samuel is quite anti-monarchical. And there is a reason for this. And it is because, according to one scholar, uh, Kaplan, he said that Samuel's con this statement from Samuel is very likely, regardless, there are many interpretations, but it's very likely a mixture of uh, the experiences of the people of Israel in the 8th century, as well as the pre-established um, precautions given to kingship by, uh, by the works of Moses. Deuteronomy, for example, talks about it. So this is what is called the mirror for princess interpretation. That the Bab that there was there, there, this was comparing uh, a work by Babylonian scholars on on the advice for the kings of Babylon or Babylonia rather uh, that uh, their behavior was being monitored by the gods. So there was go there was going to be punishment. It's the same here, suggesting that there is a broad Near Eastern genre of discourse. That First Samuel is not unique. First Samuel is actually part of something bigger. And that's being discussed here. Okay, so this is the text from Deut Deuteronomy. Now, there's one commonality, and I want to, to, to go to the slide here. Let's check here the lines. So God says, let us, uh, he predicted, by the way, not just predicted, this was meant to be, so to speak, because that is how the people would act. Uh, say, let's appoint a king to, come, to rule over us like all the nations around us. Now, that line is important because let's go back to the previous slide of Samuel. What were the words of the people of Israel? They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Very close. And this is the basis for 1 Samuel's precaution that a king essentially uh, would be a problem if it wasn't God. Why is that? Uh, because the king here creates his own class. The king would uh, change the distribution model of resources. People were fine with the distribution model of from the, pre from the regular people to the priestly class because the priestly class doesn't actually hold a lot of land. They just have a specific role, meaning that landowners had limits to how they would gain power. Additionally, there, Israel back then wasn't economically successful. So... Uh, by the time that Samuel died, by the time of the monarchy, uh, the, the structure of governance in Israel became more complex. So I would like to ask, is Samuel an early model for, for, for prophetic critique? And I would argue he's actually one of the best models for this. Later stories, for example, uh, the rebuke of Nathan when David uh, killed uh, Bathsheba's husband uh, because uh, he was lusting over her. That's a form of prophetic critique. It was directed at the abuse of the king. But Samuel had a bigger outline. He followed Deuteronomy. He was talking to people about it, reminding them, you know what you're doing? You are basically abandoning God. So you paid the price for it. So go, you have your king. But remember, the king decides how you would live, decides the distribution of resources. And that is because, as I said, a king acts on God's authority. That is where we get the basis for divine right theory. Divine right theory suggests that the one who rules over the people decides the way that the people would live. So Samuel's concern was twofold. The offense of deciding that God's dominion felt inadequate and the example of pagan kings. So they all, Deuteronomy, Samuel, they all had a basis. Uh, they were based on the behavior of the kings outside of the region. Their interpretation was that because they were kings, because of their existence, uh, being uh, not being the same as theirs, which is a structure of, of, of limited authority, then it would threaten the rights of the less fortunate. And by extension, how a king would promote greater social privileges in class conflict. So if I were to connect um, the transition of, of pe time periods, I would argue that the, the 8th century or the kingdom of Israel periods, this was where there was greater class division because the king promoted a greater economy, which in turn benefited the, the more powerful landowners. There was inequality in the economy, but by the time of the kings, it was much worse. So prophetic critique and public religion. So Casanova had this idea of the division between the private and the public. But for him, this, this dichotomy is a bit limited because it's a binary relationship that suggests that there should be a separation of sorts. 
that was the uh, sort of phenomenon that took place in Europe, that there was a separation of church and state, except that's not actually the reality in different parts of the world. Like in Japan, for example, unfortunately, because of U.S. intervention, there had to be a distinction between Shinto religion and the imperial cult. Now, in the case of uh, Israel, now the thing is, public religion is a modern phenomenon because it's a, it is created by the complex dynamics of modern democracy. So rather than the public sphere being government alone, there's civil society, there are different spheres at work. And in fact, comparing the complexity of dynamics in Israel's uh, so, uh, socioeconomic framework is a good starting point for comparing the two. It's not so much that the uh, pu- that um, Casanova's types of public religions are applicable, it's the movements happening in this analysis made by Casanova. So I would argue it's more of a it's more of a proto-public religion kind of framework here, prophetic critique, that Samuel exists as some sort of second civil, uh, second public sphere. The priests and the king are tied. No matter how we look at it, the priestly class and the kingly class, uh, the, the royal family, they're tied. And that's because the royal family built the temple of Jerusalem. It was not so much a separation of church and state. The prophet became an independent agent of God, distinct from this matrix, this institution, the, 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 the temple cult and the monarchy. So that's the contestation brought about there. It's also to contest the moral ascendancy of the institution established by God, by another institution established by God, prophets. So what are the elements of prophetic critique? Now, this was from a work by Gosai. He says here, there are a few elements to this. The first is the rejection of God. This is probably the most important element of prophetic critique. In fact, this transcends even biblical prophetic critique. This is the very idea. This is the very reason why there is prophetic critique in the first place. So, uh, before go- so rejection of God, what is this? So all the reason why society is broken is because people broke away from God. Now, this passage is the song of the vineyard. The vineyard has God as the vine dresser who shows so much care and love for the vineyard. But then he looked for a crop of good, good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now, that's a problem. So God asked, what did I do wrong? Israel, as the vineyard, had not responded in a manner which reflects the care and love that God has given. So God planted a vineyard of holiness. Now, that's the thing. Uh, Sorry, five five minutes more. Okay, that's the thing. God's One reason why there's a distinction between kings of the pagan world versus uh, judges is that the people of Israel were set aside. That's not their behavior. The outside world, the worldly behavior is not supposed to be their behavior. But the reflection here is that because they broke away from God, then, well, they, the, they deserve to be punished because they, this is the cause of, of, of everything wrong with society. What, God, what did, God wrong, uh, did God do wrong? Was it his care for the people or was it Israel's response? So what he does is he removes the care and stops the rain and l- let's see, is there something wrong with me or is there something wrong with Israel? That was his mentality there. The result was, unfortunately, it was Israel's fault. Ultimately, they did not respond kindly to God's grace. Now, we've seen this a million times. Why is it it took 40 days for the people of Israel to leave the desert? Because they kept rejecting God. God gave them manna. God gave them water. God gave them safe passage. He, they could have gone there in over a week or a month. That didn't happen. They were in circles because God would not open the gate for them to the promised land because they reject him over and over and over again. That's the history of ancient Israel. Now, the second is religiosity and the cult. By the way, the cult here means the religion. It's not like uh, the the one that we know right now in the modern age. So basically, uh, to summarize, grave social crimes cannot be remedied by grand cultic ceremonies. It seems like these ceremonies are so... uh, so separated and disjointed from the realities of the poor. And more importantly, there's a problem here. There's misplaced priorities in that they believe that the only way that they can go back to God is make more sacrifices. The problem was they keep forgetting to be merciful. The affluence at the poor's expense. Again, um, the king is responsible for the creation of rent capitalism. Because of... um, because of the wealth of those, uh, because of the wealthy 
of the wealthy who had who, who had much were blessed by God. Now here's the thing: uh, Israel believed that wealth is a blessing. The problem was that limited framework would keep us from the reality that yes, at first it starts a blessing, but then it continues on to be a curse on the poor. Why? Because once these rich landowners saw the opportunities in the king's economy, they bought more land, they took away more land from the poor, the distribution model was broken, and the distribution was in favor of the rich. In fact, uh, Amos says it here, what's the connection between the, the luxury of the rich and the poverty, uh, the suffering of the poor? You levy a, strong ta uh, a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on the grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Meaning to say that in spite of their comforts, it's because they, they promoted more taxes that will be directed to them. As a result, the poor suffered more. So what's the connection with Romans 13? Now, simple. Romans 13 wasn't a doctrine of the state or its divine right. It was a strategy of conformity. For now, because the world is about to end, or rather this age is about to end, Early Christians had to conform with their emperor and the law. It was to enact the good. But most importantly, this is very important, submission must be in harmony with conscience. If the emperor says sacrifice to the gods, no, refuse that. That is why there were martyrs in the first place. In fact, martyrs existed because they were exiles, outsiders of the secular world. If the secular world told them to worship gods, that wouldn't sit right with them. So there was this wasn't a justification of divine right. It was a strategy of conformity. So these are different exhortations. Another one, render unto Caesar. This one is heavily misunderstood. Some say it's about separation of church and state. In reality, it was once again another call on the, on the hypocrisy of those asking him those questions. Among them were the Pharisees. The Pharisees hated the Romans because they were impure, disgusting foreigners. The problem was, even if they were against Rome, they still oppressed the poor by burdening them with the law. He told them, you hypocrites, you also pay taxes to Caesar. Because that's the thing. That's actually an obligation. But they, they fell short of that. So they were hypocrites for pointing it out. So what is the place of prophetic critique in democracy here? Now, prophetic critique, whether from the time of Jesus or from the time of the, of the prophets like Moses and Samuel, it's the source of the public voice in a plural society. So when we examine biblical contexts, we consider the history behind it, the different situations that the people face, the justifications for those responses, and most importantly, to look at the circumstances of ancient Israel and its relationship with the poor. It's one thing to look at the relationship with God uh, as saying, okay, you guys are hard-headed. It's not just that the reason they were hard-headed is because they wanted too much and they did not see what that did to the poor. So, uh, on hey, the can one we wrap up now, sir? Okay, right. I'm almost done. So, Cornelio's phenomenon of theological nationalism shows, uh, by the way, this one, this is a new phenomenon right now. Because of the distinction of public and private, uh, some religious circles, for example, promoted their own vision for the nation. They may use prophetic critique for the welfare of the nation, the, the claim for it, that is. But the thing is, nationalism is not a motive for the religious fear. It is actually a worldly motive. It contradicts, again, the distinction of the place of Israel, the distinction of the place of the church. So the problem is often readings like Romans 13 to, to promote, for example, the war on drugs by, the, by President Duterte to justify, for example, the imposition of of state law over certain things, uh, especially on religious matters. The, pri the primacy of the state is not what Romans 13 and other verses focus on. In fact, I would even argue that this, this leads to a misinterpretation of the role of religion in, uh, in society, that the religion, whether in the past or now, would present itself as a critical voice in the desert to look at the oppression of the poor and critique the abuses of institutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sir Reyes. So we now open the floor for uh, the virtual floor for questions, especially those who were provoked by your uh, biblical analysis. So some questions. Sir Ian, can I? Uh... Sir, Sir Ian. Go ahead. Go ahead, okay. uh, Dr. Sable. Uh, I would just like to, uh, that's a good presentation. Uh, what I'm going to ask is, how do you do textual analysis? 
uh, okay, actually, um, this one involved uh, analyzing the um, social, cultural, and historical context. Uh, although, uh, if I were to expand on this further, for example, because it's I actually used a limited number of verses for this situation, I I would say uh, there was this method by uh, I, I combined first uh, Gosai's elements of um, social critique as a part of text analysis. Uh, it, it's actually actually I'm actually some, I'm actually somewhat new to analyzing the uh, scriptures, so I use te textual analysis on this. So I combined the framework of Gosai with um, uh, Nissen, I think the one who analyzed uh, Romans thirteen. Okay, uh, his analysis was combining. Um, the, the literary, um, the, the narrative itself of Romans 13, he connected it to Romans 12. It's, it's, they're connected as well as the social historical context. Because uh, if, if this interpretation was separate from, from the context of, of, for example, Paul's relationship with Rome, as well as his, let's say, I would not say favor, acceptance of um, uh, the secular realm, then it would it would lead to this idea of um, Romans thirteen being a general advice because it's not general advice; it's contextual. Do you employ hermeneutics? Uh, does it emblem of Boltman? The uh, sitting in life from which the verse is written, uh, uh, in which the, the biblical verses were written. Uh, Boltman, uh, a German phrase, is sits emblem. Yeah, sitting in life from which the the verse is being uh, uh, written, uh, the perspectives of how the Israelites uh, uh, live during these times, and so on and so forth. Yes, that one. Um, <clears throat> rather than reading it from our modern lens, which is actually kind of problematic, sir, because my analysis is on whether prophetic critique is related to public religion. Public religion is a is a modern phenomenon. So what I did is uh, I look at the particular phenomenon of public religion. What were the trends? The trends were the complex relationships and democracy between the civil sphere, or, or, or yeah, the civil sphere and the state, as well as the private. Uh, whether religion could be privatized or not, uh, I think in in some way there's a loose connection, not really a strong connection between the texts of of the Bible or rather of prophetic critique in the Bible as well as public religion. So um, while I conclude that, yes, that um, there is a place for prophetic critique here. However, the, the, the problem is that um, at this time, I, I'm not necessarily sure if uh, public religion has a good place in it because on the one hand, it does frame the prophets as a competing public sphere. Uh, the idea of a public sphere being... Um, from Habermas, I believe, on his uh, communi communicative uh, action theory, the, yeah, that, that's the that's the part where I lean towards there with the with the, with the text and, and analyzing the text. My problem was um, public private divide is not is not a thing during ancient times, I suppose, especially since Israel had a distribution. Uh, 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 based on my insight is uh, your your paper is trying to pastoralize. Uh, uh, the biblical, uh, the Bible in the context of modern society. So yeah. it's a good attempt to uh, make a pastoral claim, you know, uh, in order to, to provide explanations of uh, the political world, uh, the, the world of politics. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, sir. Okay, Can I ask questions, sir? Okay, sige. Maybe uh, one more question, Sir Arnold. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. By the way, I am Mr. Arnold Open of uh, uh, DepEd Davao City, specifically Biao National High School, a student of Dr. Mabolok. So, my question to the presenter. So, in, in philosophy and theology, the link between religion and, and science in a matter of ongoing debate, what is the limit of religion and science ability to coexist? Are religious beliefs ever conducive to scientific study or are they always black on it? Please, uh, what is your stand on it? Thank you so much and good morning. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Okay, um, I think this question, 
well, while it's not entirely connected to my paper, I appreciate the question because I think, um, okay, I think my uh, my approach to this was that uh, prophetic critique serves as the voice of uh, let, let's call it popular culture, the people. Uh, but popular culture, okay. Now, confession, I think I'll explain that I use a particularly Catholic lens for this, not necessarily for the majority of Christendom, I'm afraid. So, for example, uh, talking of um, talking of prophetic critique, uh, the church's role in prophetic critique is not to try to supplant, supplant science. Religion and science have their own respective voice. They have their own life, they have their own framework of analysis, and they have their own expertise. Science, for example, talks about uh, the necessity, uh, uh, no, talks about the, the vaccines, for example, talks about the production of vaccines on one hand. On the other hand, religion talks about the ethics of such vaccines. And most important, just recently with Pope Francis suggesting that there's an ethical responsibility to take the COVID vaccine because it it is to ensure the security of your neighbor. So uh, there's a harmony, so to speak. Religion, uh, there's, there was a line from another conference I heard. Uh, it, it, says, it, it, it says that the Bible uh, talks about how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sir Mar Louis Vincent Reyes. Can we give him a virtual round of applause? There's actually one question in the chat box. Maybe you can reply, sir, in your time. And oh, engage that one I think in, I actually uh, replied a while ago that I, I yeah. use a Catholic lens. Sige. So maybe you can engage uh, him in a private discussion later. So let's okay. move now to our next presenter. Our next presenter is a faculty member of the Abra State Institute of Science and Technology. He also serves as a designated university guidance counselor of that university's, uh, of that institute's main campus. Okay, so from uh, biblical, we move to existential. His topic is on in defense of death and existential approach. Let's all welcome Dr. Roberto Roldan Jr. Okay, welcome uh, Dr. Roldan. He's still uh, trying to share his screen. But maybe while doing it, you can already start uh, turning on your audio, your audio, sir, so that we can hear you. Uh, uh, there you go. Sir, can you see my slide? Yeah, you can see your slide, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for now, I want you to... You have turned off your mic, sir. Okay. There you go. Okay, na, sir. Okay, na. okay na, sir. Okay. So, okay, na, sir. Okay. okay. So my topic is in defense of death and existentialist approach to the concept of death. Now, for now, I want you to bracket your prejudice about your concept of death so that you could uh, more or less uh, fill in your own cup with the things that I'm about to say. First one here is that death is a reality that nobody can escape from. It's also a fact that once existence that the that the moment we breathe in the breath of life, the person will die. Just as uh, Kudu Sawaki would say, you're worried about death, don't worry, you will die for sure. Okay. So this concept of death is ever present in one's life, but it is a concept that no one usually talks about. Okay. Just as the caption would say, life as death, why do you why do people love me and hate you? And that would say, because you are a beautiful lie and a painful, I'm a painful truth. So to help us understand this thing, my broken says it is a fact of life that every living being is going to die. Death is an escapable fact of man's existence. 
that is not just an everyday conversational piece because of the painful feelings that goes with the word. It is not the same as birthdays or graduations that the emotions is a happiness which is enjoyed in every the, the moment we shared. Okay, so another reason why people shun away from discussing the topic, it is a dreadful, dreadful image that is associated with it. In the Filipino context, Filipino associate death with Kamatayan or the Grim Reaper. Okay. <clears throat> but if you go into the Egyptian civilization, one will be fascinated with death with the image of the dead mass of Tutankhamun. Okay. So with this fact, the researcher believes that everything in this world is composed of opposites of what ancient philosopher Serapul will say. In this context, he wants to deal with death, not on the context of the usual fear of death, but on the other side of the concept of the death mass. Socrates had said, it, is, it was because of the immortality of the soul that death was no evil. The purpose of philosophy was to free the soul by guiding it to the eternal truths. So with death came, it, is, it was a liberation. One could say then that death may be the greatest of all human blessing. In this process of understanding the concept of death, this researcher wants to approach the different Can you hear me now, sir? Okay. So for things to unravel themselves, so we need to barely abandon our views about them. He needs them to abandon for a while his negative thoughts about death in order for death to rebuild itself. Another approach that the researcher wants to adopt in this research is that with the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, the quieter you become, the more you can hear. Therefore, the researcher does not only abandon his negative thoughts and feelings towards death, but also invite the values of silence. Another, another author pushes this ignorant author to work on this paper by Norman Cassin. That is not the greatest loss of life. The greatest is that what dies inside of us while we live. Thus, this author needs really to work on this paper rather than to just being waiting for his own death. So the objective of this is to understand the concept of death in the ordinary lives of a Filipino, my life. So in to identify the deeper meaning of death and the long run to appreciate more the life given. Okay. So this will be my conceptual approach. So we have this uh, concept of death as feared and avoided hated human experience. Then with reflection and reasoning, I came up with the uh, fragmented concepts of death, which I'm willing, uh, that I'm about to share later on, okay? So, <clears throat> so the results of my reflections about death are these points. First, death is an event. And Every man should prepare for this unscheduled death. Okay? Just as we prepare for our birthdays, as we prepare for our graduation, why is it that nobody usually prepare for death? Okay? Since the concept of death is very vague for some, but we must consider that death will come. So it's an event and every man should prepare for this unscheduled occasion. Second, death is... A celebration, okay? A celebration or a man's... Uh, a celebration is a man's journey is recognized. Kasi po pag may, uh, if, if somebody dies, we have this pasham, meron day, uh, we have this 40 days, we have this death anniversaries, okay? So death is a celebration. Second, uh, that is a gateway to the unknown. So a travel, a travel to the destination or is the destination itself. That's the mystery of that. For it is a necessary pain. It is the only passageway to the unknown. I say that it is a necessary pain 
because eventually we will die. Why is it necessary? Okay? It isn't necessary for man to process themselves in order for man to evolve. Okay? Just imagine if we don't die. So if the body dies, then the world gets overpopulated, then all the leaders will be there. So what could have been the system if all of those root, rootless rulers are still alive? Okay, Will there be improvement or there will be anarchy or chaos? Next one here is death is a producer. It creates emotional fear in men, creates longing for being a high for a higher being than man, which is God, okay? And it gives rise to the promise of religion. Because with this, with death, each religion will try to convince us that there is a life after death. So with that, you enter in a certain sense, a religion, and you follow those religion. That's why I said, death is a producer. Another one, death awakens good values among family, relatives, and friends of the departed. Because family members would sacrifice their time when somebody dies. But when that person is alive, nobody goes and see and say, uh, even greet them every now and then because we are busy with our lives. But because when a special someone dies, we sacrifice our time our effort, our energy, and our resources. That's why there's generosity when death is arrived. Then it's also time for people to reconcile to each other. Okay, There's a forgiveness when death happens. Sometimes people uh, reconcile after a long, heated, emotional uh, debacle about themselves. But when somebody dies in a fam family, opportunity of reconciliation, reconciliation arrives. That's why I say awakens good values among family, relatives, and friends. Next one here is death is a giver. It is a giver because it gives us a greater appreciation of what we have. Since we, are go we know that we are going to die, then it is best but proper for us to make our life meaningful and appreciate that we the opportunity that we have okay it is also an opportunity for reconciliation as i have said it reunites families friends clans nations and human beings okay next one here is death is an eternal slip of man's consciousness okay and of man's craving of temporal needs and desire and it creates the absence of bodily psychological and emotional pain okay so, mawawala na po yung uh, consciousness that we have. Kaya nga nasasabi natin na pag yung isang tao, is na, uh, if, some, if that person dies of, a, of an illness, we say, buti pa at well, hindi mo na nararamdaman yung sakit. Okay? No more pain. We always say to somebody who uh, just died of an illness. Then, that is a great equalizer. Okay, everyone is equal in death, regardless of religion, language, race, culture, spirituality, functionalities, and relations. And another thing, uh, last one is death is real. A reality that no living being could escape from, that makes an individual should appreciate, live the life that he or she has right here and now. Because, as we all know, we do not know when that will come. So, so conclusion then, death is a reality that a human being should face and embrace and not a fact that they should run away from. Second, acceptance that everybody will eventually die with the only difference is how we see death and prepare for one's death. Lastly, there are points of view about death that one could use to appreciate the life he or she has, no matter how temporary it is. Let us enjoy living in this earth in the here and now, and not simply waiting for our own demise.
with that i say thank you uh, sir ayan are you there ah yeah you're here Uh, okay, uh, Sir Roldan, while waiting for Sir Ayan Parkon, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for the presentation. Yes, sir. It reminds me of uh, not only the inevitability of death, but also the 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 benefit or the importance of death. Uh, my my sir. question, Sir, is uh, what do you think? This is uh, somewhat personal. I just want your opinion. What do you yes, think? What do you think is the necessary death that we philosophers, uh, teachers, citizens should should undergo this time to be able to acquire a a, a rebirth? Because death uh, necessitate a new life. So what yes, what sir. what do you think is the kind of death that we should experience as of the moment? Uh, on a personal note, sir, uh, I think that the death of. Uh, that everyone should have right now is the death of our own pride so that we could extend a helping hand to others, especially now that we are experiencing this type of pandemic. Because if we just think of our own selves, we might be enjoying the fruits of our labor, but we will see suffering and death all around us. And I think that would be a miserable existence, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, maybe Sir Ayan is already here. Yes, sir. Sir, right, Sir Ayan, can I share something? Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir Ayan, uh, am I recognized? Okay, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the uh, traditions of uh, Christian religion is uh, is beautifully coined in the word in the Greek word kaiminterion. Kaiminterion in English that is cemetery. Hmm. Now, uh, according to the Christian tradition, there's no death hmm. because the English translation because of that understanding that. Uh, Kaiminterion is a place for rest. Okay. You just rest there. Uh, it is coined again by uh, Spanish word dormer, dormitory. So uh, the cemetery is a kind of a dormitory where a Christian sleeps there and wait for Christ's second coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just uh, a temporal state. Yes. So, uh, from that point of view, death is, science defined it as the stoppage of vital parts. Uh, yes, medical, uh, the medicine, science of medicine uh, defined death as the, the collapse, the paralysis of the vital parts. The heart, yes, the kidney, the brain, etc. That's what science is. It's just a biological death. Mm -hmm. But in essence, there is no such thing as uh, death. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, the eschatological views of theologians is that uh, they are just resting in the dormitory. <laughs> they are just sleeping there uh, in the cemetery. Now, mm -hmm. so why should I fear death as a Christian? Yeah. What, what, what's your reflection, sir? Uh, for me, sir, uh, I had this, uh, this uh, thinking about that because of 
uh, before the pandemic came, I was struck with, or I was visited by death, by the death of my uh, grandmother. Then after just a month was my uncle. And there were big features in my life. And I say, why is it that death is not being discussed? Why is it only discussed when somebody dies? Why is it there? So I, I, I said that when I ask people, why do they, I don't not talk about death as just like in kind of event or celebration is because they fear it. And they say, we are not ready about it. And unless we see death as an event, unless we see it as an occasion or it's an event uh, that we will be uh, encountering, we will have that, that fear. But when we accept it as an event and think that would be a start that death will be just as ordinary as you say, it's also like resting in the cemetery. Thank you, sir, for your uh, answer. That's a good, uh, you know, uh, reflection on this. Yes. Uh, uh, I hope that we can be educated by this experience of death. It has educational value. Yeah. We can learn from that experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sir Ayan. Maybe uh, there are, are there are two who ask question. Maybe we can start with uh, my student uh, Elijah Daruka. Can you can you proceed? Ah uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, yes, doc. Uh, thank you, doc. Uh, my question is um, in line with the so-called uh, death. Uh, uh, this is for ev everyone, no, a question for everyone. We know for sure that we will, um, after this life, we will uh, experience death. My question is for, ev for everyone is that uh, when we die, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, soul, you know. My, uh, when we die, um, do we know what? Shin, Shin, Hina, Sara, Good Shin. Where our soul will be going? Yeah. Uh, will also be going to heaven or will also be going to the so-called hell? That is uh, my question for everyone, especially to the speaker. Um, Sir uh, Robert? Uh, to, to answer your question, sir, uh, I need you to go back to what I have said that uh, death is a producer, okay? It gives you, it gives the rise of the promises of religion that uh, there is life after death. So sabi ko, it's a producer. Kasi alam mo, mer, uh, alam mo na mamatay ka, then religion is there to give you a sense of comfort, sense of promise, pero that's the mystery of death. Sabi ko nga, it's just a passageway. But to tell that there will be life after death, I think nobody has come back and said, I had lived life. But since we are going uh, towards that event, 
of death, the religions are there to give us a sense of security, a sense of purpose. But to equate it that there's life after death, for me personally, I'm still an, at a blank. That's why I was saying... Uh, yes, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, I know. Uh, my my uh, knowledge of death is that Hello, sir. Uh, Hello, sir. Uh, my signal is here is very weak. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my knowledge of death is what my father told me since when I was a child, because my father was is now a retired pastor, and every time he preaches, he always uh, assures that everyone will be assured of going to heaven as what God said in the Bible. You know, religion religion for, religion for me cannot save us. Uh, it is our personal relationship with God, you know? Yes. Yes, sir, I agree with you. It's a personal, uh, it's a, they usually say the religion cannot save you, but it's your personal uh, connection with your own God. Yes, sir. It's a spiritual. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, this, this is the uh, the thing that I can share to everyone. Uh, while we still, while we are still alive, we must be sure of uh, after our death when uh, where, where we will go, our soul. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in John yeah. 16, uh, after our death, we will be assured of going to heaven just by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, what my formator in the seminary had said when I asked the same kind of question, what's the assurance? Okay. okay. He said... It's like a wager. Okay? Parang susugal tayo. Na if we do a life following what's pleasing to God, then when we die, maybe we will gain, gain graces for our good, for our good deeds. But when we do this act, and then later on find out when we die that there's no heaven and hell, at least tablado. Okay? So the choice is ours. What we will do no, sir. Uh, before death. Heaven and hell is real. Uh, you cannot say that to everyone, especially the atheist, sir. Sir Ian, can I uh, have? I would like to share my reflection. Uh, uh, yes, sir. sir. I've been uh, in theology in, in regional major seminary for seven years, and we talk about. Um, are you familiar with uh, Karl Runner, a Jesuit uh, theologian? Karl Runner, he has a one-week lecture in our seminary in theology. And uh, one of the topics that he, he was talking about is death. And he said, for a Christian, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith, not a matter of philosophy. It's a matter of faith. Because uh, according to Father Runner, five minutes or three minutes before a person dies, he will be confronted with a fundamental choice. A fundamental choice. His topic is about fundamental options. Uh, the fundamental choice was whether he will choose God, the person five minutes before he died, whether he will choose God or choose the other side. 
uh, hell is a world according to Father Runner, world without God. And heaven is a world with God. So he will be confronted. So I agree with uh, the person that, uh, that, the one who asked Kanina that uh, it's really a fundamental choice. It's a fundamental choice. Kasi it's definitive. If you choose the world without God, that will be for eternity. Mm. Suffering, anxiety, anguish. Mm. Even if you are the most evil, you know, uh, evil person in the world, mm. just like uh, is thus in in, uh, in the seventh last, last words, uh, uh, you know, Tulisansia, he is a robber, yes, sir. a bandit. bandit. But when he said, Jesus, remember me when you will be in paradise. All his sins were erased. And uh, it's a matter of faith. God always give, uh, gives us a chance. He will always consult the person who died whether to choose him or not. That's the fundamental option. And that was uh, agreed also by Father Lambino. Uh, uh, a Jesuit theologian who also uh, happened to be our lecturer in theology uh, along the line, along that line of death. But philosophy, it's beyond uh, beyond reason to talk about death. Death, as Marcel said, is a mystery. It cannot be a problem yes. because there are two realms for Marcel: problem and mystery. Problem, you you can address that with reason, with science. Mystery, no. So it's a matter of faith, fundamental option. A lot of reflections among theologians along this along those lines, and uh, I I agree on that uh, along those lines of Father Runner and Father Lambino, who, who were theologians uh, teaching in Rimasi before. Uh, and we were fortunate to have them as our lecturers. Pero class course lang siya. Class course one week. Thank you, Sir Ayan, for allowing me to share my insight. Thank you, Sir, for giving that support. Appreciate it. Parang nakamute si Sir Ayan eh. Sir Ayan, are you still there? Uh, Sir Ayan is uh, muted. Yeah, po. Di ko marinig kung sin ano yung sinasabi ni Sir Ayan. <laughs> Makinag lang, Sir Ayan. Maybe while waiting, maybe we'll we'll ask uh, because uh, Sir uh, Cartagena of Notre Dame of Marbel raised his hand. Uh, can you proceed with that question, Sir? Um, uh, good morning, everyone, and good morning, Sir. Um, thank you for a very um relevant topic for today. Um, I would like to ask, Sir, uh, in in the lens of existentialism, particularly on on Mar Martin Heidegger's view on death, um, because. Because as as we are go, as we are going along the discussion, um, there is a one passage of, of Martin Heidegger that that it 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 like kung kung baga parang tumatagal sa akin. Um, that 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 is the most certain possibility. And also in the in the view of, of existentialism, um, to to accept death is somehow to to live in an authentic life. But I I would like to ask sir if. If there will be an instance of a particular person who would not totally accept death, what would be his consequences? Would he still have a meaningful life? Would he still have? Would would he still live authentically, just like what the existentialist might might have might have proposed in 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 acceptance of, of death? But 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 on a case of a particular person, 
because there there are instances na hindi niya po talaga matatanggap in that because there there is a sort of attachment and he's indeed afraid of of what will happen if he, if he will die and so on so that that is that is my question po okay sir thank you uh in that note uh maybe that if that person doesn't accept death then he will still have the life that he chooses but to say it meaningful as a meaningful life i think he's not looking forward towards an event therefore he's not preparing for it he's not doing anything he will just be living life day by day as he wishes but it will be unreflected life it will not be a meaningful life in that sense because he is not looking towards it he is not preparing towards it he is not thinking towards it he is not doing something towards it in lang po sir thank you po sir Uh, it appears that our co-hosts, uh, Sir Ian and Doc Roger, are. No, I, I'm here, sir. I'm here. Uh, sir Doc Roger. Yeah, I'm in here. The, in the interest of time, may I suggest that we proceed to our uh, next presenter? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, yes, sir. that's uh, that's my thinking. So, uh, thank you, uh, Sir Robert. And uh, sure. while there are uh, many questions in the chat box, you can just engage the 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 one asking you for e there in the chat box. So let us proceed. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Next uh, presenter. Our next presenter is from uh, the the University of Santo Tomas, and uh, he will uh, discuss. Uh, she, she will discuss a case study on the role of community participation in health program in San Isidro Rodriguez Rizal. Uh, Concepcion uh, Regalado is a faculty member of the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas, and she is a graduate of AB Philosophy and Masters of Philosophy from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, and earned her master's degree in public management from Ateneo School of Government. So, uh, friends, uh, help us welcome, uh, help me welcome uh, Ma'am uh, Concepcion Regalado. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Paul. Good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much for accepting my paper for this. Um, thank you for this opportunity to present a little bit uh, of uh, the project that uh, I've been part of or we've been part of. So... Okay, so sorry, let me just stop share for now. Oh, sorry, um, share. Okay, sorry, sorry again. Mm. Okay. So I would like to share with you. Um, so I would like to share with you the 
So this paper is entitled A Case Study on the Role of Community Participation in a Health Promotion Program in Barangay San Isidro, Rodriguez Rizal. Um, the COVID-19 crisis caused unprecedented challenges in many countries worldwide. It affected health, economies, and even the educational sector. In order to contain the virus, there was a need for large-scale lockdowns, which eventually caused socioeconomic impacts like loss of income and health concerns. Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergencies Program, said at a press briefing that COVID-19 is likely to stay with us and will become one of the viruses that affects us. It is because of this that I would like to suggest to consider using health promotion to enable the people minimize the damaging effects of the virus. The core of health promotion is to enable the people to increase control over their own health and its determinants by means of behavior change aided by community participation. aided by community participation. Even with the presence of vaccines, health professionals are still advocating for the changes of behavior as important measures to stop the spread of the virus, such as COVID-19. Hand washing, wearing of face masks, and physical distancing became essential parts of our everyday routine. Strengthening community participation while creating programs that specialize on health behavior change and sustaining these programs can help communities achieve good health outcomes in the midst of outbreaks. Because of this, I would like to present the experience of the residents of the program managers in implementing the health promotion program in Barangay San Isidro, Rodriguez Rizal. So first, let's look at the members of the partnership or um, so on November 12, 2015, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the National Housing Authority, Community Relations and Information and Operations Department, the Local Government of Rodriguez Rizal, and the Community Extension and Social Action Unit of UERM, or University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center, Incorporated, and the Rotary Club of Metro West Triangle. This quadpartite partnership was created as a response to the ADAPT Community Project initiated by the National Housing Authority and became known as an ADAPT a Community Partnership. The purpose of this partnership is to facilitate the development of the adopted community, um, eight resettlement project, Barangay San Isidro Rodriguez Rizal, in the areas of basic ed, health and nutrition, sanitation, environmental protection, livelihood, peace and order, and utilities. The adopted communities is a near city resettlement which currently covers 8,274 household relocates who originated from Quezon City and other Metro Manila areas, as well as those severely affected by the Typhoon Ondoy. As of 2015, Barangay San Isidro is the second largest in terms of population size in Region 4A with a population of 117,277 residents. So, one of the goals of the partnership is to improve the level of community health. And to achieve this, the partnership has two objectives, and these are, first, enable the citizens to take control over their health, and second, assist the Rural Health Unit in providing health care services to the beneficiaries. The programs under, under these objectives need sustainability in order to reach the ultimate goal, which is healthy population. This is the Bahay Pagamutan. Uh, this is the Bahay Pagamutan of Barangay San Isidro, Rodriguez Rizal. Um, so the goal is to enable the people to increase control over their own health and its determinants by means of behavior change aided by community participation. This Bahay Pagamutan became the center of activities. It offers free medical consultation, free minor surgery, free monthly family planning services, medications, training of barangay health workers, education, etc. Moreover, it became the location for the different health programs such as um, disease prevention, modification, vaccination, uh, and periodic health examination, 
at the garden or at the back of that parang, uh, bahay pagamutan, we set up a, a, a her an herbal clinic. We created um, diabetic club, hypertension club, a club, and metabolic syndrome club in order to support and to um, to help prevent the problems of uh, the health, some of the health problems of um, the residents of the community. We had a healthy aging program for the geriatric community members, nutrition program, the warming program, environmental sanitation program. Etc. So we all have these programs. Now the two goals of the partnership is to first enable the citizens to take control over their health, to enable the residents of the community to take control over their health within five to ten years. That means that after five to ten years, um, the in five to ten years the partnership should be gone and the community should be empowered enough to create their own programs. It includes formulation implementation, funding of health programs, maintenance, and maintenance of the health of the community without the need to ask for assistance from the government. It also, in, uh, one of the goal or another goal of the partnership is to assist the rural health unit in providing healthcare services to the beneficiaries. Although there is a rural health unit in the area, according to the uh, medical director, it is not enough because there are many members of, the, or there's just too many members of the community. Plus, the health unit is very far from, uh, or the Barangay Health Center is very far from, um, from some of the or many of the residents. So, for the first goal of the program, if you would notice, these are the programs that uh, that were started before the pandemic, uh, before the lockdown. The BHW trainings, herbal garden, nutrition program, metabolic syndrome, and the healthy aging program. So these were already started. For the second goal, we have the Bahay Pagamutan, but the Bahay Pagamutan is um, currently closed because, um, because of the lack of staff who are mostly volunteers. Um, they are faculty members of the College of Medicine of UERM. They are uh, faculty members from College of Nursing and College of um, Allied Health Professionals and um, volunteer physical therapies, etc. And also junior interns and um, students. So the, the, the design is that these two goals will be, uh, the design would be make it sustainable. So how are we going to make it sustainable? Make it sustainable by engaging the community in formulation, implementation, and funding of the programs. It is our hope that after this, um, the community itself will be able to create their own health organizations. So their own, they would be able to create their own organizational structure. They would be able to um, strengthen or further strengthen the, the existing community participation in terms of planning, organizing, and implementing. And there will be consistent presence of community health workers. And eventually, we would be able to reach our goal, which is healthy population. So before of the start, um, we find sustainability through community participation. Community participation plays an important role in this project, which is why collaboration has to be seen in every step. This quadpartite partnership believes that community per community's participation during trainings can empower the community and has to be given importance by providing funding for trainings, especially the training of barangay health workers. According to WISE, According to different studies, the presence of health organizations and organizational structure promotes are structures that represent the interests of the community. And at the same time, uh, organizational structure defines roles that leads to accountability. So it makes the job easier. It makes the, uh, the job of the program manager easier and while at the same time contributing to the sustainability aspects of the, um, of the program. 
Now, so we try to demonstrate collaborative aspect in program planning, and organizing, implementing, evaluation, research with other stake and research with other stakeholders and other people who will participate and contribute to the development of the community. Empowerment expressed as participation and engagement has been shown to contribute to the effectiveness of health promotion interventions directly and indirectly. So, barangay health workers are very important in this. Um, the training of barangay health workers are also important. According to the study of WELC, uh, community health workers are considered to be the cornerstone of community involvement uh, because it is through them that the community can be involved and gain control over their health. BHWs in health promotion, the role of the barangay health workers in this particular project in uh, Barangay San Isidro it, are information dissemination, monitoring of attendance of the participants, maintains the upkeep of the Bahay Pagamutan, and represents the residents during the meeting. Another thing that we have to consider is the second goal. The second goal of the partnership is to provide access to healthcare. So another reason for this partnership is to give the beneficiaries easier access to health services by sending doctors and nurses to Bahay Pakamutan. This can assist the rural health unit in providing health care to the community. According to the key informant from National Housing Authority and the Municipal Health Officer, although there is a barangay health station situated in South Bill 8B, it is not enough to cater to all the people in the area. So the provision of health services at the Bahay Pagamutan, the presence of the Bahay Pagamutan is seen as the center of activities. It was relaunched on 2016 as Bahay Pagamutan Community Health Center. For the upkeep of the Bahay Pagamutan, the partners together with the volunteers were given specific tasks which are stated in the Memorandum of Understanding. For the residents of the community, the presence of doctors in Bahay Pagamutan is an important factor. Besides the free medical services, the residents find it accessible and according to the National Housing Authority, the, pres the presence of medical personnel in the area gives comfort to the members of the community. Due to the important role of the Bahay Pagamutan, uh, the partnership is seeking the help of the local government unit to secure the area by sending security personnel, sending financial support to pay for the utilities and to maintain the cleanliness of the said facilities. There is also that need. While doing this study, we found out that there is a need for a more active role of the LGU at the initial or at the beginning of the program. For the National Housing Authority, the active involvement of the LGU is vital for the sustainability of this project. According to an informant, one of the long-term goal of this project is for the LGU to continue the, the efforts by shouldering the responsibilities of the partnership. In addition, according to the study done by ADBI, the role of the government arises from the characteristic and definition of public goods, and health and education are generally considered to be public goods. Moreover, in the study done by Gonzalez in 1998, involving 30 cases of healthcare projects done in the Philippines, healthcare projects are more likely to be sustainable if, besides high community participation, these efforts have support from village community or the central government in terms of resources. This paper found out, or the researcher found out uh, during this study, that in order for us to be able to track the progress, success, and sustainability of this health promotion program, uh, we need active participation of donors, with um, active participation in terms of suggesting, planning, evaluation. Very important is the active participation of community members in planning, implementation, and evaluation. And number three, the presence of government support in terms of financial support, material support, and personal support. Now, what is the uh, relevance of the health promotion during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic or in the post-COVID um, scenario? Strong community participation helps in coordination between the health sector and other sectors in pandemic response. In addition, it helps to ensure that the right information is available, understood, and accepted and applied in the community. 
According to the research done by Brooke, during the Ebola epidemic in African communities, community partners can help improve the understanding of disease control protocols and suggest moderate changes that better reflect the community's sensitivities without compromising safety. In addition, although face-to-face -face encounters are discouraged during outbreaks, community engagement can strengthen the capacity to deal with disruptive effects of the pandemic. Strong community participation shows the community's resilience and provides a strong basis to build on to help organizations and communities cope with the unfamiliar situation, reorganize, and regain control. So it is our hope that during the, uh, the post-pandemic, um, or we see that the post-pandemic um, scenario, health promotion will be very important because it aims to ensure, like what we said earlier, the right information to be available, understood, and accepted, and applied in the community because they do have their own culture and they do have their own language. Improve the understanding of disease control protocols. The presence of community support is very important in, those, in that area. And that the community would be able, if they are empowered enough, to suggest moderate changes that better reflect the community's sensitivities without sacrificing the safety of everybody else. That's all. Um, thank you very much for allowing me or for this opportunity to share with you the findings of my research. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, Sige, we have some questions from the floor. I hope I can be heard now. I, uh, okay, I have changed gadget due to internet connectivity problems. Hey, you're coming in clear. Okay, sige, sige. So we open now the virtual floor for questions. Hey, uh, hi. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Miss Reglado. I am Nelson from Corneso yeah. College. I'm your host, actually. <laughs> <laughs> sige, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I'd be very interested to find out uh, one of the one of the key targets of the project is really the disengagement. No, uh, after five to ten years, where are you at it? Uh, where are you at uh, that stage right now? And uh, what is your assessment as to the capacity of the project to disengage? Actually? Um, right now, it is very unstable because we haven't been to the community uh, for quite some time because. Um, of the pandemic so there were lockdowns and uh we hope that when we go back things will be better um since the program um since the active uh managers really in the program were faculty members of um, the college of medicine college of nursing college of rehab science and college of allied health professionals and interns um, and we are uh, with no face-to-face -face setup it is very difficult for us to find out what is happening in the community in the area. Another problem that we are experiencing is that um, when we left, it was okay. But right now, since, we, uh, since uh, the economy is, um, well, we can feel the impact of the economy, majority of the residents in the area, especially the barangay health workers, the main, uh, the, the main people on the, in the community, uh, yung nakakapa ng tao, these people, these are, um, these are simply, uh, they, they're volunteers. And, and the problem is that there is um, their husbands, and uh, most of them are women, and their husbands um, are, some of them are already complaining that they do not have, or their husbands lost their jobs. So there is a, uh, there is a possibility that we can get back on track um after this pandemic and we would just we're hoping that we can just pick up from where we left off because 
anyway we've been everything has been laid out from the from the beginning and we have strong support from the national housing authority the government support is very important at the initial stage of the project and since um and we are really counting on them that they would be able to help us once we go back to uh, face to face classes or once we go back to face to face um setup okay i wish you could speed this like a lot Thank you, sir. See, so some other questions. We have one in the chat box. Ah, okay. There's none. So if there's none, okay, we give a virtual clap to Ma'am uh, Concepcion. Okay. Thank you and very much, on. sir. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Ma'am. And we move on. So like uh, yesterday, we uh, okay have to go. Okay, have to proceed despite uh, lunch. So we leave it up to you how you manage your lunch break. Okay, especially here in the Philippines. Okay. So our next presenter okay, is actually a colleague of mine before. Okay. He is a professor at the University of Southeastern Philippines in Davao City. He has a master's in management degree from uh, University of the Philippines in Mindanao and a doctoral degree in development administration at the University of Southeastern Philippines. He will be talking about moral contestation and policy action over COVID-19, especially the uh, vaccination governance. So let's all welcome the one who was very active since this morning and even since yesterday, Dr. Sherlito Sable. Okay, Thank sir. you uh, for that uh, very inspiring introduction, uh, Sir I. <laughs> right, I. Okay, I will share my screen. Where is it? Ah, I don't. So the paper uh, that I will be sharing with you are my, uh, you know, is my a product of my reflections on on uh, uh, COVID nineteen vaccination governance that cuts across the world. Uh. So I am going to talk about the moral contestations on policy actions over COVID-19 vaccination governance. Okay, I will just read my paper. Uh, in a civilized human society, the predominance of preponderance of ethics is an intrinsic requirement to foster a just uh, human government. What would happen if at this period of international pandemic, it is the pharmaceutical corporations who will rule the world in collusion with international bodies if their actions are not tempered with ethics principles, then injustice could have moral justification. It is along this line that this paper is constructed. Inspired by the above mentioned premise, this paper would like to articulate the moral contestations on the demand for COVID-19 vaccination and the state response in terms of governance. Contestations, uh, just uh, a brief explanation of what constitution, contestation. This is a theory which seeks to move beyond observing the effects of social practices by making a normative claim. It is defined as a social practice that entails objection to specific issues that matter to people, for example, in international relations, public health, etc. So, uh, moreover, uh, this is also inspired by the by the critical ontology uh, premise that every policy is not final; it is always contestable. 
in Nepalese, it's a theory in political philosophy that uh, uh, a state action or a state policy should be open for contestations, moral or political. Uh, that is basically the, the direction of this paper. The paper seeks to highlight the basic moral issues surrounding on the issue, does the state have a moral claim to implement mandatory vaccination? This paper defines vaccination governance as arrangements and strategies in the conduct of vaccination in terms of policy instruments and procedures. Ethics of policy actions in this paper refers to applications of moral principles regarding policy actions of the state in securing public health. In view of this claimed proposition, a good number of moral debates arise. First is on the question of moral ascendancy slash authority of the state to make vaccinations mandatory in the name of public health. Second is the question of institutions involved in vaccination governance in terms of actors, interests, and dynamics. And the third is the question of access to vaccines. Utilizing the critical theory of Finberg, as cited in Arnold and my, uh, my, Michel 2017, addressing medical technocracy as the tool of crafting decisions associated to pandemic, the paper examines the issues raised through an analysis of the behavioral and so sociological imprints of governmental power apparatus in the governance of vaccination. Secondly, the paper employs political economy analysis in addressing the question of how the institutions involved in vaccination governance in the global context handle the high demand of supply and scarcity supply scarcity for vaccines. Political economy analysis is a process of analyzing the interactions and dynamics between structures, institutions, and actors on how decisions are made to respond to vaccines, high global demand, and supply scarcity. That's uh, cited from Kion 1988, Sparks, Susan Jess, Bump, uh, Joseph, and me, Michael Rich. Okay, discussions. The first is the issue of moral ascendancy of the state to make vaccinations mandatory. The question which arises from this claim is, does the state have the moral authority to make vaccinations mandatory? Now, varied responses on this question were presented by the experts. This question cannot just be viewed as the, dom, uh, as the domain of ethics, but can be man responded in multidisciplinary lines. As such, we have Mayer and Mori. They argued that our, a rights-based approach to development, placing obligations on the state to regulate individual rights due to the fact that individual right to health is in a state of failure to account for the damages for public health. From the lens of rights-based approach to development, Mayer and Fox argued that the state has the moral authority to impose restrictions and mandatory governance framework. Thus, with a broad conception of public health viewed as a collective public good, no individual can rightly make a claim against the state under an individual right approach for the public goods comprising of a public health system, which is public health safety and security. And no state can make a claim against the international system ex ante for the subversion of the rights of its people. In a state of pervasive insecurity and unease, government may take mandatory actions for the security of the public in terms of public health. Baldwin, uh, cited uh, Baldwin, Garrett, and uh, Bigo, Colgrove, and Bayer. The state has the right to claim for mandatory vaccination when there is an immense 
Philippines state of public health insecurity. Now, on the other hand, informed consent in medical ethics positioned itself as a requirement for mandatory use of medical interventions, in this case, vaccination using COVID-19 vaccines. Informed consent in this context intends to promote trust in the use of the vaccine. Trust in the use of the vaccine is enhanced when the public is well informed on its risks and effectiveness. Deciding to be vaccinated on the part of the public must be tempered with a tense of informed consent. Questions on vaccines effectiveness and the risks attached to it have to be understood well by the public. Thus, it is only when the public are sufficiently informed on the negative and positive effects of the vaccine that mandatory vaccination is morally justified. The medical technocrats must ensure that the public has sufficient knowledge on the positive and negative repercussions of being vaccinated so that they may decide favorably for the vaccination program of the state. Moreover, uh, Cell Glid 2016 argued that consent of the person for vaccination are agents in charge of their lives and bodies. Hence, they deserve to be respected of their rights for informed choice. This is made clear in this argument stating that respect for persons emphasizes that individuals as agents in charge of their own lives and bodies have the right to make decisions and choices free from undue interference. Respect for persons forms the basis of informed consent, namely the right of patients and human research subjects to be informed of and to assent to medical or research procedures they might undergo, especially uh, procedures that pose potential harm or risk. Conducting research on human subjects or performing medical procedures on patients without their prior knowledge or consent, in most cases, violates their personal autonomy. However, profession, uh, health professionals have a special uh, obligation to look out for the welfare of people with diminished decisional capacity, such as those in coma or the very young or to protect the, uh, and to protect them from harm. Now, is there a balance between personal choice and the greater public good? Davis, 2012, proposed a strategy to strike the balance between personal choice and the greater public good. Those citizens who refused vaccination after having been fully informed of the negative and positive effects of the vaccine shall be quarantined not to compromise the public health of the communities. Schumacher, 1999, Immunization Action Coalition, 2009. Daniels and Sabin, as cited in Selgin, provided for conditions to strike the balance between personal choice and public health security. For a mandatory vaccination policy to be moral, morally justified, it has to meet the following conditions. The decisions and the rationales for them should be made public. They should be based on reasons of all uh, things are relevant. All on reasons all think are relevant. They should be revisable in light of new evidence and arguments. Uh, this condition should be enforced so that the public can see and become enlightened. Some explanations is needed for these conditions. The first condition mandates the state to be tr uh, transparent, has to be transparent on how the medical technocrats and public actors decide. While the second condition requires the importance of rel and relevance of the vaccine, the third condition emphasizes that it is based on scientific evidence, while the fourth requires enforcement when the first and second conditions are met. Now, the second issue, the institutions involved in vaccination governance, host reality counts. 
This question seeks clarification on the political economy of vaccination governance. It is essential to analyze the institution's economic behavior as revealed in the interactions between structures, institutions, and actors within the ambit of ethical principles and human rights ethics. This is the long-held tradition of ethics. Uh, Curtin, Daly, Cobb, and Chambers. The structural dynamics of COVID-19 vaccination governance requires a global structure perceived to have a legitimizing role in pronouncing the global risk of COVID-19. In this context, the legitimate international body is no other than the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, given its medical technocrats, constructed the risks and enacted the preventive strategies, and one of the strategies is vaccination. The enactment of vaccination as the most effective strategy by the World Health Organization is given to its member countries to implement the same. This preliminary enactment creates a motive from pharmaceutical corporations at the global scale to revitalize its research and development structure to conduct research uh, an initial phase of the production function of these firms, the global pharmaceutical corporations, and allocates, allocate huge investments along this area of concern. In fact, they would seek assistance from the governments. The world is categorized into two major worlds, the North and the South. The Northern world are the most blessed with wealth comprising the advanced economies of Europe and the United States of America. While there are emerging powerful economies of the East like that of China, Japan, Korea, and the most powerful ones are in the Northern Hemisphere. The need to highlight these economically powerful countries is essential because majority of the global pharmaceutical corporations are located in their governments. It has implications on the production dynamics of vaccines, which are globally demanded. There are possibilities, as alleged by uh, social science, uh, of vertical collusion among, along this line of explanations. Uh, the, there are explanations from the social science perspectives along these lines of possibilities. From the standpoint of political arguments, the enactment of vaccination as a preventive strategy, as recommended by the medical technocrats, could usher the view of the capitalist modality of medicine, restruct, uh, medicine structuring. The Marxist political economy perspectives argued that vaccination as the best recommended solution for this COVID-19 pandemic could be an outcome of the global capitalist structure implying that the manufacture of vaccines by the pharmaceutical corporations might also provide the tens of disease creation by them. But according to Moynihan uh, et al. Uh, and Williams et al. This might be a plausible conjecture of those analyzing the impact of the structural dynamics of implementing enactment of vaccines as the best preventive strategy to contain the global pandemic. It must be argued that the World Health Organization, together with its medical technocrats, is not a party of possible collusion with global manufacturers as alleged by the political economy arguments of the Marxists, uh, according to, to Sodepa 2015. Now, Institutional dynamics in the crafting of the rules by both the formal and informal institutions is one aspect that need to be analyzed by the lens of ethics. The possibilities are immense that the rules of carrying out vaccinations may skew to the powerful groups and leave the powerful and vulnerable, vulnerable groups excluded. Questions like who will first be vaccinated and who will be the last ones need ethical scrutiny. The pattern of decision making of the institutions, uh, the pattern of decision making of the institutions 
may be influenced by the historical decisions in relation to pandemic management. Therefore, the decisions may be the same procedure in addressing vaccination implementation. Thus, the view on vaccination for all may have a vague stance as a matter of bureaucratic workings. The ethical ambivalence is therefore glaring in this type of policy decision among formal and informal institutions. The ethical consideration, considerations in addressing the institutional ambivalence and dynamics is to strengthen the rules and other regulative agents to foster a sense of transparency and accountability in the implementation of mandatory vaccination. The actors in vaccination governance are the individuals and coalition, both public and private. Their interests matter in the overall spectrum of articulating policy propositions. An approach to come a common framework of vaccination governance among these actors, multilateralism come to the fore as initiated by the whole World Health Organization. It is, however, noted by Patnaik and the People's Health Movement that it is debatable whether, as a result, multilateralism have been strengthened. To be sure, countries have come together in an effort towards solidarity in this time of crisis. However, whether donor-driven international cooperation couched in the language of charity, as witnessed in 2020, can address the tricky questions on equitable access to medical products is hard to say. In general, fairness in global health decision-making processes at the multilateral level has been lack lacking during this crucial period when the foundations of the response to this pandemic were being laid. Countries have become have come to the negotiating table to ink multilateral agreements with highlights on the language of donor-driven cooperation and minimal price approach to access the vaccine. However, the scarcity of vaccines produced makes agreement to be implemented because the rich countries who can afford to purchase these vaccines who are sovereign states has to give priority to their constituencies as an integral part of their nationalism, according to Mabuluk 2021. The approach in addressing this concern of vaccine scarcity is vaccine nationalism, as mentioned by Mabuluk. This is the problem of geopolitics. We first before others approach in the name of nationalism. In this context, less developed countries have to wait for a certain period because it could have sufficient access. Before it could have sufficient access to the vaccines, whether price-driven or donor-driven, can the Philippines realize its targets of vaccinating 30 million Filipinos by 2025? Given this scenario, it is very hard to say. The Philippines have to content itself with mask and facial strategy, restriction of movements, and contact tracing approach while queuing along with other less, de uh, less developed countries. This is a scenario of wait and see. Maybe it is morally important to settle this question on the less developed countries' capability in terms of medical technocrats, experts, scientists to upscale themselves from being a cultured to dependency trap. These countries have to depend on the scientists of advanced economies. There is an institutional gap here because in view of the lack of governmental effort support in the research and development of these countries. Last issue is access to vaccines. Who will be the first and the last? Access in the lexicon of development administration is a guarantee of the state to the citizens to gain freedom, self-determination, and in advancing their interests to live a life in the state of happiness, according to Amartya Sen, Well Cell 2013. This was explained by political science perspectives, arguing that it is the primordial duty of the state and world governance body to guarantee access to whatever opportunities available in society. 
according to Holler and Hadler, Hedy, Muffels, and Wagner, 2012. Hence, in whatever context, access is a fundamental right in a civilized world. Access to COVID-19 therefore takes into account these explanations. It is, however, noted that in the global context, the first to be vaccinated are those in well-developed economies invoking the principle of geopolitics of vaccine nationalism, the invocability of the vaccine nationalism and power capability is bereft of moral justification since vaccination access is a fundamental right to attain public health for all. In fact, it is uh, the global pandemic should be construed as a global threat, global threat to global security. It is more rewarding from the standpoint of pharmaceutical corporations than expecting more from the less developed economies. The less developed countries depend more on multilateral agreement in for the purpose. Most of these countries depend more on debt financing scheme from international multilateral banks and the supply management bureaucracy. These countries have to contend with bureaucratic politics, budget politics, leadership politics, and beneficiary politics in their own respective backyards. According to Sparks, Bump, Oselic, and Cochin and Rich, 2019. To access the vaccines is an experience of burden in terms of time, assurance, and commitment from the suppliers at the global context. There is no clear policy on how the suppliers allocate the vaccine. The World Health Organization categorized the vaccine as a global public good. It is, however, noted that multilateral agreements to access vaccines, whether donor or price, remain vague. The immense global demand for vaccine poses a problem on how to mass produce it. According to World Health Organization data, base, uh, database, the rich countries have an average vaccination of 40%. 40% of their population, while those in less developed countries has an average of less than 3% of their population vaccinated. The vaccination prioritization framework of the WHO, World Health Organization, only applies to the domestic geopolitics of countries. The prioritized groups to be allocated for vaccinations are those in the healthcare system workers, adults, etc. COVID-19 vaccination is a global public good and therefore it requires a global justice system. The need to be vaccinated take, takes its basis on the theory of transpositionality of healthcare as the basic universal right where human value, uh, where humanity value health. This uh, thus the issue of provincialism in COVID-19 vaccination governance is not within the ambit of trans Transpositionality approach. Transpositionality approach is an approach of vaccination at the global scale through the initiative of a world global governance structure, which is the United Nations and World Health Organization, uh, to equitably distribute vaccines. That's according to the theory of transpos transpositionality. Thus, the question of we first, then units approach, positioned as vaccination nationally is an ethically flawed behavior of advanced economies. The transpositionality of healthcare as the basic human right justifies state policy on mandatory, gober, uh, mandatory vaccination, assuming there is sufficient supply of COVID-19 vaccines. Conclusion, there are three major issues that this paper addressed. First, moral ascendancy, etc. On the question of mandatory vaccination in versus informed consent, this has a legitimate body, has a moral claim for mandatory vaccination, arguing from the lens of human rights development approach. Uh, okay. The question of institutional dynamics in vaccination governance, the paper concluded that there are indeed issues on the manner 
how existing structure influence decision making. There are possibilities of vertical collusion among the players of the production function of global pharmaceutical corporations and the institutions that provides definitive pronouncement that vaccination is the best strategy. Multilateralism as a path of international cooperation, whether donor driven or price driven to address vaccine scarcity remain vague. The question on this or whose reality counts may be addressed as something that highlights the, the basic economic behavior of powerful economies. The last issue is access, who access first. The, this, the paper concludes the imperativity and operativity of equal access to vaccines invoking the approach of transpositionality. Transpositionality strategy uh, of Yale University, according to Dr. Roger, 2014, in his uh, article in uh, Medical Ethics, invoking public health as a universal good entail an actionable world governance framework from which vaccine allocation and distribution shall be conducted to benefit every country, whether powerful or powerless. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, multilateralism is slowly grinding itself towards good outcomes. Thank you very much, Sir Ayan, for giving me the floor to share my reflections. Okay, thank you, sir. It was very... Yes, well-organized presentation of how we reflect on our <clears throat> COVID vaccination in the global scale. Okay, so again, we open the floor for uh, the virtual floor for questions. Any questions? Clarifications? I need uh, your your uh, insights so that I can okay. improve my paper. <laughs> okay, sir. Actually, I would. I am. Uh, I will uh, throw the first question. Yes, sir. Uh, your presentation seems to echo, even if it's specific to COVID nineteen vaccination, seems to echo the same problem with the idea of global justice. Uh huh. And the idea and the problem with global justice is it's morally uh, valid, but institutionally uh, not so feasible. So in other words, uh, most of the problems addressed, for example, to Thomas Pogge is his theory of justice is too ideal because in the global scale, we don't have the same uh, governmental structure that has the same power at the national scale that can enforce this uh, <clears throat> justice uh, mechanism at the global level. So I think that's the same problem that the idea of uh, promoting uh, vaccine justice distribution <laughs> and access also faces. So I don't know, even though you, I think you have presented that one, I don't know what is our way out of that one. Thank you, sir, for such a very uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm teaching international development theory and policy. Yeah. One of the topics in our uh, PhD program is world governance, <laughs> world governance. It's just a creation of uh, the United Nations. The United Nations is emasculated. It has no muscle. It has no muscle to enforce global justice. Global. That, that's correct. That's correct. You know why? Uh, it has to be construed by the Security Council as a global threat so that the Security Council will pass a resolution giving or distributing all the vaccines produced by the pharmaceutical corporations at the cost of the United Nations. 
to all countries across the world. No? Uh, for example, in in African countries, among the African countries, only three percent are vaccinated. In the Philippines, pilaka percent to we are twenty million against one hundred million. That's only uh, I don't know what's the percentage according to the report of uh, of our Department of Health. Uh, thirty percent, your sir. Uh, what about Botswana, Myanmar, uh, Ethiopia, uh, the, 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 the poor countries? So they will just die uh, probably uh, because of that pandemic. Because the World Health Organization cannot uh, enforce a resolution unless it is the Security Council, the world governance, uh, because the World Health the United States has no police power. It has no power to police to enforce laws. Thank you, sir, Ian. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, how about the others? Uh, the uh, others? Here also. <laughs> Who might also be engaged in global justice because I think this is a global justice issue. Yes. I am actually... Uh, I was able to read the book of Dr. Roger uh, of Yale University, uh, The Theory of Transpositionality. The Theory of Transpositionality tells us that uh, enables us to view first the pandemic as a global security threat. Then after that, the United Nations should ask the Security Council to come up with a resolution declaring it as a global health uh, insecurity, a threat rather, and then command all countries to gather resources. The world had, because every country in the United Nations contribute 1% of its GNP every year. 1% of our GNP is contributing to uh, United Nations. If uh, that's a billion pesos. That's a billion pesos. And the highest uh, contributor of, I know, is the US and then uh, etc. Because they are uh, in dollars. So it, it it's feasible. The theory of transpositionality could make global justice feasible or it can be done uh, to be able to have universal access to uh, 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 vaccines. Uh, for example, why is it that the Security Council acts immediately when a particular country uh, conquers another country? For example, when the U.S. Uh, uh, conquered Iraq, they need a, a National uh, Security Council resolution. But in terms of global health, why is it that the Security Council just confine itself, it's a, uh, themselves to militaristic uh, resolutions to address global uh, problems? Th these are problems, actually, Sir Ayan, that uh, that entails a lot of reflections and probably uh, uh, a good researchable area. Okay, Murat sir, mix. Sir, mix. Uh, racing, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> or maybe taking their lunch, sir. Maybe taking uh, their lunch. But uh, I think, sir, mix. Sir, mix. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, good. Have a nice day, po, uh, Dr. Sable. Po. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I would like to ask about your assessment regarding uh, currently our uh we 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 become dependent to bigger countries in terms of the donations of the vaccines no? uh, particularly china and the united states i am interested about what do you think is the impact to our country in terms of uh, political and economic uh, restrictions and in terms of the the liberal trade I agree with our, you uh I am country. very much uh, thankful of that.
are there are ethical and an ethic and why why should I give you for free without uh, any although I did not tell you I did not tell the country uh, the, the president about it pero na amana gitawaga there is that uh, what we call uh, implied implied statement what is that implied state that that is the hidden statement <laughs> i give you this vaccine for free but there is an implied uh, tinatawag sa literature undertones the undertones of free uh, uh, vaccines there is an underlying statement there hidden statement and that is the unethical side of grants. Now, can we blame them to have uh, that kind of thought, uh, kind of thought patterns? I think we cannot blame them because, uh, well, in the context of humanity at large, you know, maybe they are blamable. But in the context of capability, we are not yet capable of doing research on vaccines. We don't, our, I don't know whether we are capable, whether UP, PGH is, uh, is already ready to develop a vaccine. We have the OST. The OST. Wala bang taga the OST? Department of Soka and Toyo. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I have students from the OST also uh, uh, who are uh, taking PhD. Ano yung ginawa ng di ano yung mga scientists natin? What happened to our scientists? Bakit? Until now, we do not have the capability to develop vaccines. Thank you, sir. That's really a problem. We cannot deny the hidden statement uh, uh, of free. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. You're welcome, sir. Okay. Sige, thank you. Uh, sir Aguilan wrote something in the... Uh, chat box. Uh, would like yes, to verbalize, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, yes. yes, sir. I verbalize, na lang, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, my 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 question has to deal with the mm, the use of since you mentioned a while ago the the role of the Security Council. Yes. Uh, and when we talk about Security Council, it's enforcement, and enforcement is the use of military force. And my problem now with, with that is uh, we are talking of morality and justice. Are we now reducing, if you, are, you mentioned vaccine justice, are we now reducing justice to the old, old ancient question that might makes right? In order for something that we believe to be right, we have to use force. And to me, that's the dangerous, you know, dangerous uh, no, uh, argument, uh, position because we are now going to legitimize the claim of the powerful, and they could invoke it in the name of justice, but actually it's their imperial interest, their imperial ambition. But they, they would, you know, we know that how the United States used the name of justice when they invaded Iraq, when in, in the fact that there was no weapon of mass destruction, uh, when they also uh, sent the Marines in Ethiopia, uh, we, it was turned into a movie humanitarian in the name of humanitarianism they use military force and this became an issue i think just responsibility and irish young raised the issue of solidarity as a better uh, framework when we deal with global justice uh, again it would boils down to citizenry pressuring their own respective government in other words as a citizen of an advanced advanced advance you know more powerful nation as a citizen and that's a democratic uh let's say in the united states or in europe one can uh, can exercise its citizen uh citizenship to pressure their own government but the weakness of that argument is that would not apply in china when it's least democratic so i'm i this is my my problem with the notion of global justice how do we enforce it how do we really con <laughs> so that's my question or else uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you have a very right. good uh, question. Yeah. Uh, 
the theory of transpositionality states that uh, there has to be a global structure, a global governance structure that must first define or uh, that must first define COVID-19 as a global threat. Transpositionality is bringing the problem from the domestic to the global governance structure. And then after, real, after defining it as a global threat, because global threat is fixated to militaristic threat, which is wrong. We have also inclusive theory, inclusive development. We have to look at all angles of global problems uh, when, re, when experience at a global scale should be construed as a global threat. If it is a global threat, it is a threat to global security. And therefore, if it is a global security, the, the United Nations should function as the legitimate global governance structure to distribute the vaccines, to distribute the vaccines to all countries across the world so that the poor country, for example, according to the World Health, health poor countries in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly African states, the, the, the poorest countries classified by the World Bank, like Botswana, uh, Utopia, Ethiopia, etc. The only box, uh, they oh, they only vaccinated three percent of their population, and yet they have the they have the world's biggest population. Sila yung maraming tao. So. Why can we not use the global structure, world governance structure, as a mechanism to distribute the vaccines for free? For free, without incurring costs. Because the government, it's govern every member country of the United Nations contribute 1% of its GNP to the United Nations in billions, yeah, na? in billions per year. So therefore, it's feasible. Global justice is feasible only when pandemic is, is construed as part of this uh, uh, global threat uh, interpretation. Because the United Nations interpreted global threat in a limited sense, fixed na siya, military opportunism of other countries. That's the time nga mag muak ang security concept. But looking at the pandemic as a global threat, a threat to global security is one angle for global justice. So nangangailangan tayo ng uh, dynamic, proactive World Health Organization or United Nations to address the problem. Kasi if we rely on the economies of its member state, that is where geopolitics come to the fore. As uh, argued by... Sir Sable, are you still there? Where is me? I was lost. Okay. Is Sir Sable still there? Hello, Doc.
Mukhang nawala, Sir Sable. Oh, so, ang akong internet. Ah, yeah. uh-huh. Okay, sir. Okay, sige, sir. Okay, sige, sir. So, I think we just have to end here. Yeah. And I sir. think you have uh, you have sufficient uh, information now to improve on your <laughs> research. <laughs> yes. Thank okay, you. Sir. So let's give uh, Dr. Sable a virtual round of applause again. Okay, let's move to our next presenter. Our next presenter teaches philosophy at the Department of Philosophy at USP, or University of Santo Tomas, where he also attained his master's degree in philosophy. He will be talking about a necessity for a riot, Badu on ontology of courage and militant subjectivity. Let's all welcome Sir Marvin Einstein Miharo. Uh, thank you po, uh, Sir Ian, at uh, magandang okay. hapon po sa lahat. Magandang hapon. Uh, apo, i- ano ko lang po yung aking um, screen. Sige, sige. Go ahead, sir. Sige po. Ayan. Nakikita na po ba yung ating screen po? Yes, sir. It's now visible uh, from my end. Sige po. So, ito po yung title ng aking simpleng panayam sa hapong ito, no, The Necessity of Genuine Riot, no, but you on the ontology of courage and militant subjectivity. Uh, sir, malina po ba yung boses? Medyo mahina kasi yung net. So, ayun po. Yeah, from my end, okay um, naman. Okay po. Let me just read the abstract po. Uh, the observation that Badiou's project seems to be in between the radical reinfusion of the role of mathematics in ontology and the concrete concentration on politics has often been a part of any critique, let alone commentary on his work. On the one hand, the apparent schism places his philosophy at the formalist end interpretation of ontology, while on the other hand, it also proves the autonomy of his politics, devoid of any need for an ontological grounding. That's why there are several scholars who are not too familiar with Wadiu, who try to peruse no, and read his works no, based on the latter without a consideration of his ontology. What I would like to present here, part of my argument, is that the ontological or the ontological parang preoccupation of Badiou is not alien no, to his political pursuit. No? Um, the seeming divide, however, and in greater consideration of his philosophy is in fact uh, necessary. No? Further, the intrinsic nature of the necessity for a mathematical ontology becomes the essential representation of the possibility of change or how, how change can happen in the world. But in making sense of the latter, but you establishes of a need for that which is not happening, happening. The praise is no deridian play, but the actual discourse on the making of the impossible. Rioting, especially if it were to be historical and genuine, says Badiou, is a declaration. It's a, for Badiou, it's a declaration of truth, but later we, we will try to see that the declaration of truth is tantamount to a discovery of what Badiou calls as an event, which I'll also discuss, explain later. It is a naming of that which at the beginning is what can only be named as a statement declaration. But I, I would also like to say that when Badiou refers to riot, that he does not refer to parang, parang he is not trying to say that every kind of riot is is good no? or every riot is valid no? uh, we would discuss that uh, each of these uh, riots no, are have a particular role no, in 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 his politics no? uh, which is always about the politics of change so for example later he'll talk about how the immediate riot no, the one that we often observe in the streets no would lead to another kind of riot. And that kind of riot would lead to the genuine riot, which, which is basically the, the goal of the paper. So the goal of the paper then is to identify that genuine kind of riot, you know, which is closely tied to his politics. You know? 
Uh, the naming no, in relation to Badiou is also a belief without a concept and hence could be perceived as courage of being a militant. So there are three sections to, to this presentation. No, I'll be first evaluating the divide no, uh, in Badiou. Second is a discussion of historical riot as an example of the intrinsic nature of Badiou's ontology. And finally, I would like to propose no, a reconstruction of that which can be named as ontology of courage and a new version of militant subjectivity. Although it is, of course, not a full-blown articulation of Badiou's idea of courage, no, because the main material under which this paper is written is based on the rebirth of history, no, times of riots and uprisings. No, but there are, of course, explications no, of parang ontology of courage from other books no like uh, the second manifesto no the first manifesto communist hypothesis metapolitics and and the rest so therefore the paper is limited by my engagement with the rebirth of history and how the specific militant subjectivity is present in in such a book okay let me now go to the to the first one no um, philosophy politics divide. So on surface, there seems to be a two versions of Badiou as a philosopher. So on the one hand, uh, there is this Badiou who is keen into solving the aporias and debates concerning the history of philosophy, particularly the history of being, uh, with published works under this direction, such as but not limited to being an event, logics of worlds, and the recently published immanence of truths and of course, conditions and the like. Um, and uh, one thing that you notice about Badiou is that he's, he's looking for a new space from which we can philosophize. And so he desires to, me, to move beyond the debates that are so prevalent in post-modernity. And so by doing so, by moving beyond the post-structuralism, post he wants to identify a particular beginning by which we can still say where philosophy can still work you know, uh, against the obsession, for example, of analytic philosophy, the obsession, for example, of uh, you know, post-modernity. You know. um, but on the other hand, there is this Badiou who is in grip of the happenings of the world and a Badiou who is directly participating in the change occurring in the same as evident in his involvement in organizations, one of which he himself founded, the Li Organisation Politique. Such militancy, should we say, has a direct effect as well in the crafting of their many books, of, of his other many books, you know, like the play, The Incident at Antioch, you know, uh, Philosophy for Militants, Metapolitics, In Praise of Politics, to name a few. And the main material under which this paper is anchored, the rebirth of history, times of riots, and uprisings. No. Given this interest, it can be said that Badiou is apparently on two different directions, no, with, with paths not in congruence no, uh, to each other. No. But in becoming familiar with Badiou's philosophy, it can be argued that there's actually no divide between the two, you know, as the latter, hence this concern for politics or of being political, is the natural trajectory of his more ontological project. Further, and whereas his ontological project is highly theoretical, with tomes of mathematical discussions from Gior Cantor, Paul Cohen, Didikain, Sarmelo Frankel, until contemporary mathematicians like Stuart and Wooden, his politics is immediate and radical with the clear goal of a need for change, a commitment he embraces for himself to shake off what he calls in the conditions as the status notion of politics, which is according to him is a politics of repetition. Later in the talk, I shall reveal why such a representation of politics is directly connected for a need towards finding an exit, let alone shaking the foundation of the state and where riot, at least in this initial investigation, be placed. What this implies as well is but use the satisfaction with democracy's tendencies to place a barrier to any attempt for change and its tendency to normalize everything as status, as if there is, as what he says in Metapolitics, a beast lurking within. Let me explain at this point why the politics and philosophy divide should not be 
an issue no as uh, to any investigation of Badiou's philosophy and why the seeming divide no as i mentioned earlier is a necessary no and part of the unique vision of what a just society is away from the politics of repetition the goal i intend to do is to prepare the discussion to my second point that is of where there is a need why is there is a need for a historical and genuine riot and the latter's investigation is not, in fact, an end in itself, but would hopefully lead us to a much comprehensive investigation, um, let alone reflection on his politics, no? emphasize why he, uh, uh, which is, of course, not about uh, political philosophy. No? So I, I placed there a note that I should emphasize the idea that it is not about political philosophy. So, come, uh, but you is quite allergic to the idea that we have to term the political philosophy. No, parang the political philosophy tends to totally determine that, that there is a parang there is parang an agreed upon idea of what political parang how do we do politics. So parang what he does is to to say that it we have to remain as well no to to the idea of parang the dynamicity of politics. No? Uh, now. Uh, although this is not the entirety of Badiou's uh, ontological project um, or vision, but one of the actual telos of his project, aside from the meta-ontological thesis that ontology is mathematics, is to show the crucial importance of his notion of the event. The notion of the event is one of the most identifiable terms, no, if not the term that distinguishes Badiou's philosophy from others. The event is fibotal, no? That but you often returns to it, often reposits the question leading to its actual site, and often pursues its, its impossible occurrences within the status quo. The preoccupation as well distinguishes his own philosophical project along with his own personal style. Um, Sigropo, I can say that although the studies on Badiou at least uh, is not yet, po, sa Pilipinas not yet in full blown, pero one what we can say as of the moment especially what's happening abroad no, in the anglophone anglophone world is that there is already a badiwan gesture you know which can be characterized by a number of things you no know, which i would like to parang to just say for you no know, uh, from his reimagination of the role of mathematics in philosophy that opens a renewed and perhaps the most crucial ontological project at least to me you no know, since heidegger to give to giving an art the right domain from which it can exclusively operate, argued clearly in Handbook for in Aesthetics, Rhapsody for the Theater, to name a few, to a representation of a discourse on love first written in an article, The Scene of the Two, and Book in Praise of Love. And perhaps most specially, which is basically the, the goal also of this paper, is to, to, to present this creative re-engagement of politics after what he termed as the death of Marxism, not to mention being himself a nobilist and playwright with stage plays under his belt. No? Now, theoretically, when we return to an event, but you says that the event is this being that is not being qua being. No? Later, um, the notion of the event is important as it is tied to the inexistent, no? parang the, the, uh, parang the goal of a riot to make existent what is inexistent within, within a kind of control no, made by the state. So therefore, parang riot itself is an event, no? Uh, and, and why is riot as an event, no? Parang related to an event, no? Mamaya po, no, let me explain that. Um, what it also implies is that the notion of an event is a break or rupture within a presentation. So one of the Ano po kasi, no, one of the parang siguro sabi natin, uniqueness of Badiou's philosophy is how it is also based on his parang extensive study of set theory. And so um, the event, therefore, is a kind of a set that is within a set but not totally within it. <laughs> so kumbaga, parang it is a set within a set that is not being controlled totally but by that set. No? So... Let me give you po, uh, an example. If U presents R, S, and T, and yet T, although an element of Q, is now itself another multiple that is not presented nor exactly presented by Q. So, um, and, and this is where rioting 
also happens, no? Although mamaya pa po yun, pero parang riot happens because the ones no, who are doing the riot, especially if it is genuine, seem to be inexistent no, within the presentation. So the presentation of the state of what the community is, no, the people under, under that presentation no, is not represented. And so what, what, what happens is that the one that is not represented want themselves to be presented in a manner you know, from which they can exit you know, from that representation. So kubaga, that's why riot is a declaration of what, what has been presented, what, what could have been presented but not presented because of status control. Parang ganun po. No? So parang dito po papasok why uh, parang may necessity, at least for Badu, you know, to, place, to place this no, not just politically, but also theoretically. Because his, his parang philosophical in, engagement theoretically you know, brings to fore innovative ideas that, that could be parang also present in politics. You know? And so the intersection between Q and T, there is clearly a void where the whole side of Q is not related to T being itself an event. So the T as an event becomes what would you term as a super numerary to the side. You know? uh, what can be inferred is the idea of excess. So that there is an idea of excess, uh, which is ironic because if we apply the excess to rioting, parang the one rioting is not being considered you know, as important by the state. And yet, the, 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 the riot is a declaration that there is an excess which the state cannot control. The event, therefore, as being presented is also non-presented as the other element of the event, which is the signifier of the event itself. Now, term X, EX, no? being an element of T. No? So, sige po, alis na po tayo dyan. Bin, uh, binigyan ko lang po ng ano, because ang para lang din po, hindi natin ma, ma, ano yung, ma water down masyado yung idea ni, ni Badiu no? doon sa, sa, sa event. Now, given all this, uh, now the impasse of belonging or non-belonging provides two hypotheses which can be found on Badius being an event, on Meditation 17. <coughs> First, the hypothesis that the event belongs to the situation from the point of view of being presented, Badius says it is that although the event is a singular multiple, the whole uniqueness of its multiplicity belongs to the whole site. So, ibig sabihin po, Kung i-apply po natin to sa rioting, rioting is not happening in a vacuum. No, the reason why there is a rupture within such presentation and the reason why there is an event within within that, no, it, it is because you know, there is an excess to the presentation. Now, second is that the event does not belong to the situation. Nothing is added. It is subsumed only within a void that the multiple cannot be able to respond to such an event. So yung pangalawa naman po, parang sinasabi kasi dito is that eventually, if an event no, is able to go towards its own path, it will eventually create its own presentation. So ibig sabihin, it will create its own, as what Badiou calls, its own infinity. No, and uh, parang if we apply the <clears throat> idea of set theory, no, based on all of this, there are different infinite truths and that the event probably would start you know, from something multiple previously to another multiple, which is a multiple of its own multiple. No? Yun po yung sinasabi niya dito. Now, um, hence, but you explain no, in being an event that the undecidability of the events belonging to the situation can be interpreted as a double function. On the one hand, the event would evoke the void. On the other hand, it would evoke... Uh, it would interpose itself between the void and itself. It be both the name of the void and the ultra one of the presented structure. So, puta na punta susunod. Now, given all this, and if Badius philosophy can be summed up at least in a single world, however futile such reduction might be, they are strongly binded you know, by the philosopher's pursuit for the new. You know, this pursuit for the new. Um, consume Badiou's life, let alone his whole philosophical life. It is towards the new that Badiou is after, always after the new that he departs, and always within the new where he resonated. Badiou himself describes to be that new voice that will 
free philosophy again away from the shackles of contemporary sophistry and doxa. No doubt there is in Badiou a grand hope to return to something universal, an affinity, an affinity, uh, an affinity, you know, that uh, strongly tied to Plato's influence uh, in his works. You know, the pursuit for the new adds Badiou is the very pursuit for the truth and ultimately so the same pursuit of philosophy since time immemorial, from Plato's antiquity to Leibniz's modernity, to Sartre's, um, to Sartre's forlorn world down to his present ultra capitalistic society within which Badiou and his philosophy tries to break through. The event then can be considered as a novelty. You know, it is this rupture within multiplicity, creating a new possible world from a former world of repetition. So hence, the event is the site of a possible new situation previously thought to be impossible. Now, the event then is the impossible becoming possible, the dawn of a new world with a new situation and perhaps with new persons who are considered to be faithful to the event. Now, given all this, we can see that the theoretical pursuit of Badiou's project is ontology, in ontology is intrinsically tied to his pursuit you know, for what I call to be as the new politics. No? This politics is a politics that desires to create a space that is not contaminated by status control. So hence, um, now in Logics of World, no, but you mentions the truth is an exception to what is being presented. The pursuit for the exception, therefore, both theoretical and political, is also but you's project. What he desires then, and where genuine riot comes in, which is the second point of the paper, the necessary excess that would be a challenge on the situation, starting from something unique, but it in inexistent at first both indiscernible and unrecognizable, and yet can potentially break through within the regime of the same, something which I want to pursue for my second point. Now, to start off, po, let, me, let it be clear that not all riots are an option. So hence, to place Badiou under the notion of persons who per, per, to perpetuate anarchy is, um, is a plain misreading po of his position. Nonetheless, and which is something important to point out as well, that a riot should not be to automatically equated to subversion, no? let alone to terrorism. In a Sir, book, The minutes, Rebirth of... Five minutes. Ay, ah, five minutes po. Sige po. In a Rebirth of History, sasabihin niya po dito that those involved, ang parang sinasabi ng mga tao, that those involved in the riot no, are nothing but gangs, hooligans, thieves, brigands. In short, they are dangerous classes of people. And that parang... Ang sinasabi po nila is that it is coupled with an announcement of a ruthless sustained repression which is blind on principle. So, ang implic pero kung makikita din po natin, ano, parang what what happens is in a riot is that the riot is being considered only as a kind of destruction. No, destruction yung una nilang nakikita. Pero parang kay Badiou, parang he cites that when riot happens, there are two important implications that also show the strength and power of the state. At ano po yun? The primacy of things over existence. Na mas mahalaga yung mga bagay kaysa dun sa pag iral ng mga tao. At dito, nakikita din po natin how despotic no, the state is. No? Para lang po ma ma mabilis lang. No? Now, there, there are three kinds of riot no, for Badiou. So this is the immediate riot. Ito po yung madalas nating nakikita sa lansangan. Meron din naman yung latent riot. Ito yung parang it's neither below immediate nor genuine so kumbaga parang it is a riot na hindi nagtagumpay which wanted to go back again no? parang ganun. so parang there's a possibility of possibility no so it's uh, although it is not the genuine kind of riot so the genuine kind of riot according to Badiou is the historical riot no? it is the riot of eventual dimension towards a sequence or sequences of something new in politics no now, historical riots no, represent a challenge for the state because in demanding the departure of those who rule it, they invariably expose it to the brutal and prepare change even to the possibility of, of, of its complete collapse. No? Um, what Badiou sees, in fact, in the historical riot is now the ability of people to be more deliberate. No? Kaya ang isa din pong characteristic of historical riot is that it is also a riot that happens after a riot. So it's a deliberate it's a deliberation of people, no? And yet, 
even by not doing anything, no, they place a kind of threat to the state. No, uh, according to Badiou, the masses, no, is still, no, are the one that is, kumbaga po parang they are still the ones that are feared by the state. Um, so there should be, according to Badiou, the embrace of the actual nature of the inexistent and the value of a gradual, open, laborious, protracted path towards what he mentions as the change of the world. So there is an acceptance though, for a historical riot that immediate change cannot happen, that if we want change to happen in the world, according to Badiou, we have to be patient. You know? And by patience, we mean it's a gradual exit towards what imprisons us. Uh, now, historical riot then maintains the event and becomes faithful to the discovered truth of the same. It is a transition from we just used to exist, but now, as in real, as in real now, we exist and we can now determine that history of the country. Na so, bilisan ko lang po, no? Ayun nga lang, we also have to know that riots do not possess all the keys, no? para masolve yung sagot yung sagot ng natin no sa nangyayari sa state no it could be a point of departure for a change no now paano po ba yung nasasabi niya dito no so uh, let me now go to three points po no na mahalaga about this historical riot uh, what happens po in historical riot is that it intensifies our existence no there is a new localization of truth and then politics becomes an idea that must be pursued so um, ang nakakatawa po kay Badiou, no? when, when he talks about intensification of existence, parang he tries to tie up no, yung idea niya ng love no, at saka po yung politics. Ang sabi niya is that if change could, should really happen in the world, no, there should be an intensification of existence no? na, which happens in love no, between two people, which is the scene of the two, and happens in community, which is the scenes of many people happening at the same time. No, existing, no, in, that's an intensified existence of a lot of people. So, ang gusto niyo pong gawin dito is that we have to move beyond the politic, political idea of what politics is and to create an extra political space no, for the intensification of existence, which seems to be absent under a subverted politics. No? And then, uh, the new localization of truth, uh, yun nga po, no, parang para kay Badiou kasi parang truth is something generic no it is carried over no by 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 not necessarily a body no but it is carried over by a localized no uh, kaya nga po pa, one thing na mamaya no isang challenge din no is yung political organization no napakahalaga nung political organization na not necessarily tied no to the principle of party system Parang yung idea natin, yung parang obsession to party politics. No, para sa kanya, parang it should be a politics without a party. And a politics without a party should have a new localization of a truth no, from a organization no, which is coming from an idea of a new politics. No, kaya po yung, yung number three is also important because in politics is a process. No? It's an idea that must be pursued. Therefore, what he suggests no and how the riot is also tied to the parang politics no as it parang becomes a catalyst no for the possibility of a politics that will pursue no the idea is that we have to look for something new no we have to look for something new he even criticizes no yung communist idea that the some communist ideas that we have seem to be obsolete and we have to reimagine these points not to make it more contemporary to uh to, to the practice happening today so let me just para po read these three points no, before i end so not all riots are valid no uh, rioting is part of a process of a people's desire to exit from the politics of repetition historical riot is a declaration of a truth based on an event in c2 however what is found as a truth in an event in c2 should be continuously embraced through a subject so dito po papasok yung tatlong klase ng subject na and these subjects are the faithful subject, the obscure subject and the reactionary subject. And for Badiou, we can only embrace the truth through a faithful subjectivity. And the faithful subjectivity is a belief without a concept. Because what for example, <laughs> a rioter, what where would the rioter you know, base his beliefs? Probably it's not 
totally definitive. But since he believe no in what he really thinks of, no what he thinks of and believe in is not really a concept the way concepts are parang found in in for example in contemporary politics. But uh, but since he, he believes in that idea and to, to him that's genuine, no, that would lead to something new. Kaya ang example po niya dito is si Saint Paul, no, because Saint Paul, no, is quite stubborn, no, parang he really embraced the truth and and makes this truth, no, possible, no, to be known by people across nations. So that's it. Thank you po. Marami salamat. Okay, thank you, Sir Marvin, for introducing us to the politics of Badu, the politics that is a non-politics. So now we open the virtual floor for questions, clarifications, or insights. Oh, Sir Migs, go ahead, Sir Migs. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. Sir Marvin. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, po. Po, po. Um, I, I am interested uh, to the question whether um, this uh, riot or so-called historical riot, uh, is it something that is abstract or, or are there specific guidelines that, uh, that Bedu has, has, has come up? So because I am I'm thinking in the, in the Philippines uh, historical sense no, that uh, could, 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 could uh, for example, is there uh, my question to you? Is there a counterpart like that? Uh, this historical riot in the in the Philippine history. Mm -hmm. if... uh, uh, so yes, sir. No, I think the meron. No, um, one thing I said. No, thank you for your observation, sir. Thanks. No, uh, one thing I said that is so present. No, in but use discussion of riot is that there should be an acceptance that the riot is a minority of minorities meaning it is not even the minority it's even the it's in fact the minority of the minorities so meaning there is really an inexistent aspect to a riot no nga lang what but you says is also parang cautioning is that riot should not just be immediate no kasi parang what we notice on the streets yung mga immediate riot no yung mga riot na yung nangyayari talaga yung mga uh, balibaga ng mga bag uh, eto yung mga properties mga ganun ang ang sinasabi ni Badyo is that there should also be a process no by which this riot should mature no doon po papasok yung from immediate to latent to historical where in fact yung historical riot in fact may element na siyang historical riot ng the game of waiting kasi parang we have to be more deliberate sabihin parang riot it should also be parang a riot of reason not just a riot of action parang ganun. of course he does not dismiss the fact that there that it could also lead to to action but it should be something that should be thought of um uh, dito sa pilipinas um meron naman ano, meron namang mga ganun pero marami pa din sa atin yung uh, tinitingnan yung riot bilang yeah, immediate. Oo, parang suntukan kasama yung mga polis, balibaga ng mga ano. Um, katulad ngayon, kumbaga parang tapos na ba yung ginagawa sa Hong Kong? Probably hindi pa. No, probably may iniisip sila ngayon. Probably nag-transition na yung riot sa Hong Kong into something more historical rather than immediate and latent. Uh, probably <coughs> meron pa probably china no they probably not yet has no a grip no of the country kasi parang akala natin no, sa ngayon di ba parang wala na tayong nadidinig pero we don't we don't know no probably they are doing something to no to tie themselves into something more historical that eventually would lead to to ano no, parang ganun po sir Is there more questions? Uh, sir Ayan. Hello, sir. 
Okay, sige, sige, Thank sir. You, Oliver, Hi. go ahead. Uh, sir, good afternoon. Uh, sir Marvin, uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, that presentation. Uh, this is my first time to hear uh, the, the, the philosopher. Now, uh, I don't know if I have uh, taken well the thread of your presentation, but if I remember it right, I have mentioned something about the, the death of Marxism. Uh, by the way, how, how, how do you differentiate? I mean, how, how would you dif differentiate the the idea of riot uh, and the class class conflict theory of Marx? Mm -hmm. Class conflict theory of Marx. Uh, um, because, because so when you talk about when you talk about mm -hmm. riot, it is assumed that there is there are two camps at least uh, two camps that are uh, that are fighting against each other. Uh, in, in the case of Marx, it is the classes mm -hmm. that are that are okay, uh, that are, that have uh, opposite interest, and uh, the, the, their conflict is irreconcilable. And uh, that if that conflict is irreconcilable, it, it could be reconciled only by revolution, and that means a historical mm -hmm. event. Uh, basically, I mean, how how would you differentiate that from a riot? Uh, okay, idea of riot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, what, what what we can I thank you, Pupala, sir. No, uh, first of all, let me just answer yung the death of Marxism. No? At the death of Marxism, as you see, it's more of a parang meta claim. No, it's a meta claim. Of course, Marxism is not uh, dead. No, um, in fact, uh, si 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 Badiou, he even says in an interview that he is a Marxist. No, but but the idea of a Marxist today should be appropriated with with of course the the challenges no made and posed by capitalism so in fact in the first chapter of the book of the rebirth of history he discusses capitalism although since it is not part of my my paper hindi ko na siya sinulat po no? but um so it's a more of a meta claim but he is but he would like himself to be called more of a communist and how the communist hypothesis should be pursued today in a more novel, parang in a more innovative and parang, parang therefore he's looking for novelty of how communism should work today against the capitalism. Parang so at least masagot ko lang po yun. Secondly, what we see in Marx is a very clear conflict no, between the masses no, and the proletariat no, and the capitalists. No, we, we do not see that in Badiou uh, and in, in some other philosophers no, today no, with, with that, with that po, parang focus. No. So parang what, we, what we see in Badiou is uh, an acceptance no, that the conflict between the masses no, and the state are too dynamic, that they are, they are not just transparent no, and it's not just between them. And so there should be as well no uh, a preparation no no na gagawin natin na dapat mas mataas din sa mga ginagawa dati because yung capitalism is parang five steps ahead no sa mga possibly pa nating gawin no um, therefore po parang ang gusto ko lang sabihin is that the problem is myriad and that to solve the problem means to expand no our notion of what a proletariat is or what a masses is. Therefore, it's not just a masses of the factory. You know, it, it should be a masses that would in, be inclusive of other plights of people, other the ones identified clearly by Marx. Yun po. Siguro po yung sagot ko doon. Okay, sige. Uh, Dr. Aguilan, okay. raising yeah, his hand. Just, yeah, just like to follow up. The, it's related to the uh, question a while ago. Uh, riot is actually can is a it's in the penal code as a criminal offense. So it's always taken from the perspective of law enforcement agency. So that's the reason when you use the word riots and the perpetrators are called rioters, they're already labeled as criminal or have violated the law. So it's a way of delegitimizing a violent action. So I have a problem with that definish uh, with 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 that because from whose perspective are you uh, looking at and that's also the difference mm -hmm. when you say resistance when people engage in resistance and resistance can take non-violent and violent form so when would mm -hmm. you draw the line because 
the moment you say it's a it's a riot, it already connotes something that is negative because it is viewed from a law enforcement perspective. And it's a way mm -hmm. of, and we know in history, many legitimate resistance uh, were labeled as riots. Uh, freedom fighter during the American Revolution, they, uh, they were called as bandits instead of freedom fighter. Uh, now, maybe the terrorists today, in the future, they'll be called uh, <laughs> resistant fighter. I, so uh, I, I, it's similar to the question. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you look at riots from whose perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you po, sir. No? Ang ganda po ng tanong nyo. No? Uh, what, what we can find in the book is parang a two-layered parang discussion. You know? Parang on one hand, but you also diagnosis the history of parang resistance in a way, no? parang to call it generally. Uh, although his focus is to identify no, no these resistances as riots. No? Now, from whose perspective are we looking at at riots po, ano? Um, dito po sa libro ni Badiu, parang pinabibigyan niya yung state na ganito yung tawag ng state sa mga nangyayari, no? So, it's a statist idea, no, of resistance. And so, parang, but in fact, what he does in the book is to counter-argue the statist notion of, of what this resistance is. But, but not to change the name. No, I just don't know po bakit hindi niya binago yun. Siguro po parang ang one characteristic din po kasi ni Badiu is he wants to maintain some sort of radicality of a position. And so parang he does not change it. But what he in fact does is to, to provide a counter argument against riot and uh, kumbaga parang to really to use it against the state, against the state, not to... To, to, to parang use it as a kind of an exit from a status position uh, uh, and how the state uh, po, um, how the state uh, labels it no kaya ang ginawa niya po is that what is yung kanyang bagong nasabi is that rioting no, if it is really historical is a proclamation of a truth found in an event in C2 that must be embraced by a subject in perpetuity towards a new politics. So kumbaga po parang uh, gusto niyang baguhin no yung yung ganun at siguro to legitimize no what other people no uh, have done. Although gusto niya din po sabihin that immediate riot should mature towards historical riot. Kumbaga po nads nasabi ko din po yun kanina na not all riots are valid. <laughs> not all riots are valid. Yeah, uh, just a just a uh, comment. Uh, everyday uh, everyday form of resistance have been have been you know, from the point of view of the status quo are not legitimate. Uh, and everyday resistance, yeah. actually, from yeah. the point of view of those who are resisting, they look at it as justifiable. So again, it's a question of <laughs> it's a question of how how yeah. <laughs> how history will judge. <laughs> them how will history mm -hmm. judge the event <laughs> thank you thank you po thank sir you. very very nice insights but thank you sir Victor, ganda po okay sige. so let's uh, give uh, a <laughs> virtual round of applause to sir marvin thank you very much Salamat for po. introducing thank us you. and to the works of badu and uh, <clears throat> for uh, facilitating a uh, interesting discussion now, our next presenter is a full-time instructor at the uh, MSU, Mindanao State University, IIT, or Iligan Institute of Technology. He previously taught at the Colegio de San Juan de Letran and University of Santo Tomas. He holds a master's in philosophy from Holy Name University. He studies communication for his doctorate at uh, UP Diliman. He will talk about the value system in the nation's history an attempt to examine the no notion of moral collectivity and nationalism. So welcome, Sir Menelito Mansueto Jr. or Sir Migs Mansueto. Take the floor, Sir Migs. Thank you, Sir Ian Clark Parkon. Let me share my screen, sir. 
Um, I think Sir Marvin is still sharing his screen. Can we ask Sir Marvin to? <laughs> Sorry po, ayun po. Thank you po. Sige, sige. Okay. Sige, I think uh, Sir Migs can now share. Yes, sir. Ayun. Sige, it's starting to share na, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, have a good day or good afternoon, everyone. Um, there, there has been a minor change in my title as I narrowed down my presentation. So, wait. Could I close this? War on drugs through the eyes of the moral collective. Um, so th uh, this is an attempt to problematize the possibility of a collective moral politics through the issues on the government campaign against illegal drugs. Uh, there are two parts in this presentation. One is an attempt at illustration of a legitimate entrapment operation. And the second part, is a theoretical input on the notion of the people as a moral collective. A strong argument against uh, extrajudicial killing is based on the concept of due process of law found in the Bill of Rights, that is Article 2 of the Philippine Constitution, uh, Section 1, uh, states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. And also in section 14, number one, no person shall be held to answer for a criminal offense without due process of law. And to ensure the due process of law, there are uh, specific mechanisms. And some of these, some of these are the so-called search warrant and also the warrant of arrest. A search warrant is an order in writing issued in the name of the people of the Philippines signed by a judge and directed to a peace officer commanding him to search for personal property described therein and bring it before the court. Uh, an arrest warrant is issued by a judge or magistrate and must be supported by a signed and sworn affidavit showing probable cause that a specific crime has been committed and that the persons or person named in that warrant committed said crime. An arrest warrant is a warrant issued by a public officer, uh, a judge, which authorizes the arrest and detention of an individual. But there are exemptions to this uh, search and arrest warrants. No? Uh, for example, the case of an entrapment uh, operation. It is a valid way of apprehending perpetrators of sale of illegal drugs. Upon the consummation of the sale, the entrapment team is authorized to immediately arrest the seller of illegal drugs. There is no requirement of an arrest warrant or even a search warrant, uh, considering that the arresting officer is himself the witness. And a specific type of entrapment operation is the buy bust, whereby a police agent disguised as a buyer of illegal drugs undertakes a sales transaction with a seller. Uh, very important in this part is the, the term consummation of the sale. So it's very important that in the buy bust, uh, the agent posing as a buyer should be able to, to tender an amount no? that there should be 
uh, probably counting of the amount in the presence of the seller and that the seller would be able to accept the marked money, the amount. So this is very crucial because if there is no tender of amount, there's no exchange. Uh, in other words, the, the sale was unconsummated. No? Hindi, hindi nagkaroon ng transaction. And in that case, uh, you cannot use the, the evidence. And also, uh, hindi, hindi nagkaroon ng, ng legitimate uh, sales transaction because walang nag, hindi nangyari ang tender of payment. That is very important. And uh, in that case, maaring uh, makasuhan ang drug seller ng possession of illegal drugs, pero hindi mo pwedeng makasuhan ng selling of the prohibited drugs. Uh, the Dangerous Drugs Act of 1972 is the law that regulates the uh, entrapment operation. The Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Law itself uh, provides that the apprehending officer or team having initial custody and control of, of the drugs shall immediately after seizure and confiscation physically inventory and photograph the same in the presence of the accused or the persons from such items were confiscated or seized. Meaning na uh, immediately after the arrest, uh, the person who was able to found the drugs, the suspected drugs, should immediately maybe count or weigh the the items and also photograph the in order for that to be used as evidence. The effect of non-compliance with the requirement to conduct an inventory and to photograph the evidence is the non-admissibility of the confiscated drugs as evidence. The judge therefore cannot consider said evidence in writing his decision. The net effect is the failure of sufficient evidence to convict. So you shall see that there are really requirements no, in, in the conduct of a by bust operation. And also, in addition to that, the arresting officer is also required to read the Miranda rights. So, uh, uh, yung the Miranda rights, no, uh, basahin ko, ay, uh, ikaw ay inaaresto sa salang paglabag, for example, sa Republic Act uh, 6245, ikaw ay may karapatang manahimik at magsawalang kibo. Ano man ang iyong sasabihin ay maaaring gamitin pabor o laban sa iyo sa anumang hukuman. Ikaw ay maroon din karapatang kumuha ng tagapagtanggol na iyong pinili. At kung wala kang kakayahan, ito ay ipagkakaloob sa iyo ng pamalaan. So usually, the apprehending officer ay merong daladalang kodigo nito. So at the same moment that you are arguing with uh, the suspect, uh, trying to make sure that he will not be able to escape, you're also required to read the Miranda rights no? with Godigo, maybe in your cell phone or a piece of paper. And then it is on the last part, saka palang maggalit-galitan yung police no? as an officer, naunawaan mo, naunawaan mo ba ito? Naintindihin mo ba? No? So, because you need to be able to read the Miranda rights properly and exactly. So it is a requirement. Now the question, what is the consequence if I am not able to uh, render the Miranda rights warning? The penalty, possible penalty, an amount of 6,000 pesos or a penalty of imprisonment of not less than eight years. Imagine how long is that, but not more than 10 years or, or both. No? You are fined and at the same time you are imprisoned. And also if you are uh, 
repeating the same offense, a penalty of perpetual absolute disqualification shall also be imposed upon the investigating officer who has been previously convicted of a similar offense. So just to show that there are specific requirements for uh, for the conduct of uh, entrapment operation. To convict a person for the sale of illegal drugs under the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Law, the prosecutor must prove the following. A, the identities of the buyer and seller. Dapat they are clearly identified. The object to be used as evidence later and consideration. And B, the delivery of the thing sold and the payment for it. In short, the prosecutor must prove that the sale took place and that the accused was the seller. So that's why it should be immediate. Hindi pwedeng uh, mamaya na lang, no? So there are, these are scenarios. I'm sorry. Uh, so for example, the case of People versus Sorin is, uh, let me read. Here, here, the accused was acquitted because of an irregularity in the by bust operations. Specifically, the apprehending officer who seized the sachets from the accused, Sorin, during the by bust operation failed to mark the sachets and instead turned them over unmarked to another police officer. The latter officer was the person who marked the sachets of Shabu who eventually took custody of the confiscated drugs and delivery to the PIDEA. Um, according to the Supreme Court, the fact that the sachets of drugs were not marked for inventory in the presence of the apprehending officer who confiscated the drugs is fatal to the cause of the prosecution. The court cannot overemphasize the significance of marking in illegal drugs cases. The marking of the evidence serves to separate the mark evidence from the corpus of all other similar or related evidence from the time they are seized from the accused until they are disposed of at the end of the criminal proceedings, thus preventing switching, planting, or contamination of evidence. The purpose of the requirement is also to ensure that there is a proper conduct of the entrapment operation. And the Miranda rights is, is also to warn the suspect that anything that he would be ad admitting to the to the, the to the apprehending officer can be used against him. The same case occurred in People versus Sabdula, where the accused was also acquitted because of failure of the apprehending officer to mark the confiscated drugs in the by bust operations. The Supreme Court noted. So Anyway, I'm not going to explain that, but just to show that um, hindi ganun kadali, no? because maring ikaw pa yung makasuhan uh, with such failure that kailangan in the conduct of an entrapment operation. Now, in the issue of extrajudicial killing, no? uh, the case of extrajudicial killing is different from the what, what transpires in a legitimate uh, maybe entrapment operation of the policemen. Uh, so my stand is this, no? If extrajudicial killing pertains to those who were found dead in the streets in the absence of a witness, nor, nor an absence of any lead to its perpetrators, it could not just be easily attributed nor accused to President Duterte for the obvious lack of sufficient proof or evidence that would link Duterte to that crime. So I think that even if you would say that uh, as a public um, servant, he had been telling these things, no, and even Bato would say that kung hindi lumaban, bigyan ng armas. Palabanin. But uh, listening from the words of these uh, public servants would 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 actually contradicts 
uh, in the actual pursuit of operation on the ground because it's very obvious that there are um, legitimate restrictions that that uh, is being provided that serves as guidelines for the the apprehending officers. Now, uh, there are various ethical discourses on the drug war problem. And uh, I'd like to cite one. So this is not my, my claim, but uh, I just want to show that there are existing ethical arguments. No? One is uh, Duterte's drug war as a utilitarian um, mechanism. And let me quote from Dr. Raymond E. Barbaza of ADMU in his article in Inquirer, Is Duterte Utilitarian? Uh, what do we care about decency or virtues or principles if they can't bring about the change we need? Duterte supporters can easily ignore or tolerate, even simply take as a joke, whatever character flaws he might have such as the use of foul language and crass mannerisms. Even the thousands killed in the war on drugs are accepted as mere collateral damage. But um, Dr. Raymond Barbaza uh, maintained his claim that for him, um, Duterte's drug war does not qualify to the strict requirements of John Stuart Nails um, idea of utilitarian utilitarian ethics so uh, also from dr barbaza not everyone can carry out a utilitarian calculation the greatest happiness for the greatest number can only be entrusted to noble people and for dr barbaza uh, duterte uh, does not fit or does not qualify to that um, character of nobleness but I would like also to show that there are other uh, approaches to social that social justice that we can also consider as um, probably utilitarian. No? Uh, to give an example, Soviet Marxism, led by Joseph Stalin, and he himself declared uh, or recognized as the autocratic dictator of the Com Intern. Politburo. In the event, uh, to quote from the program of the Communist International. So, in the event of the imperialist states declaring war upon and attacking the USSR, the international proletariat must retaliate by organizing bold and determined mass actions and struggling for the overthrow of the imperialist governments with the slogan of dictatorship of the proletariat and alliance with the USSR. So my point here is only to show that uh, even Marxism uh, had these utilitarian tendencies. Now, uh, a very recognized uh, Filipino uh, modern philosopher, the late Romualdo Abolad, no? uh, the term apology of Duterte is not mine. Uh, there is an, a very interesting article written by a philosophy professor from the University of Cebu, uh, Professor Regleto Imbong, and he, uh, the title of his paper is uh, Abolad's Ap Apology of Duterte. No? So that, that is not mine, just a disclaimer. And let me quote uh, from Dr. Abulat, I did not vote for Duterte because of the risks involved of which he has been thoroughly open about it. He did not lie to the people during campaigns, telling them exactly what to expect. Yet the people voted for him. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. The voice of the people yeah. is the voice of God, especially since the elections turned out to be reliably clean as well as credible. Now, um, there is an article uh, entitled De Morality and Democracy. And uh, they quote, so for Socrates, morality is the art 
of self-possession or self-government, rule over self is a fundamental virtue. While democracy means the people rule over itself, the government of the people by the people. So as comparison between the concepts democracy and, and morality, if morality is to human dignity, democracy is to national dignity. When morality is viewed in the collective spectrum, morality is democracy. And still from Emil Boutreau, uh, from his article, Morality and Democracy, I quote, the Greek philosophers conceived of morality as including politics, no less than industrial life. When Aristotle distinguishes politics from ethics, strictly so-called, he does not set it as, a, as he does not set it outside morality. Politics, he says, is a fuller and more perfect morality, which includes individual morality, as act includes potency. Some have become alarmed at the idea of isolating the individual in a selfish and a natural independence. Concrete individualism finds in the individual himself tendencies that can develop only if he enters into a relationship with his fellow beings. This is the principle of so-called solidarity morality. And this allows Aristotle uh, to speak of an individualistic uh, virtue ethics while at the same time declare that man is a political animal. Again, uh, five minutes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Brother Romaldo Abulad in an article in Pavisminda, uh, Philosophy and Politics, do they mix? So the title is a form of a question. In that article, Abulad maintains that ethics in the normative sense cannot be mixed with politics, as in Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince. However, Abulad believes in the manner of Sun Tzu's art of war that ethics can marry with politics as a management or leadership style. This is also echoed by Dr. Christopher Ryan Mabolok in his concept of radical politics. And I quote, radical politics is about that substantive approach to governance that bypasses deliberative norms in favor of an anti-establishment principles that seek the improvement of the society beyond normative procedures. In political ethics, this, there is what is called the dirty hands problem. The paradox is that politicians sometimes must do wrong to do right. The politicians uses violence to prevent greater violence from Michael Walzer. And then as a response, uh, Dennis Thompson came up with the problem of many hands. In a democracy, citizens should hold the leader responsible. With the unjust act, the people's hands are dirty also, no? because they are consenting to the leader. The concept of collective responsibility uh, still from Thompson. The collective consists of moral agents similar as persons, the individual members of the organization who will also suffer from the wrong consequence of an unjust act. The deed was done with the citizen's implicit consent and implicit approval. The accountability should be within the organization itself alone. Reason that it's improper for ICC to meddle because they are not part of the electorate of the Philippine Republic. And to end, sir, I'd like to leave this uh, quote. No? Uh, galit ang nagsabi nito. Woe to you. Uh, let me alter. You, you, beautiful, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your sister's eye. From Matthew Godotzele. Actually, Matthew 7 verse 5. So and that ends my presentation and thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Sir Minx, especially for that provocative uh, ending. Okay, so now we open the virtual floor for questions and uh, clarifications. Any 
question and clarification. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Angel Aking. I am say, a say, go ahead, sir. I am a student of Dr. Polok and Dr. Sable. Um, uh, just uh, ano lang po, uh, to affirm lang po yung idea dun sa discussions kanina. Kasi I, 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 I remember something from the idea of Jeremy Bentham. Uh, I, I guess uh, alam niyo po si Jeremy Bentham na sabi niya, um, if the action is um, nakakabuti, nakakabuti sa karamihan, then that is morally good. Even if it is, uh, it has the means na hindi maganda or yung means niya is bad. But if it is for the good of the, uh, ng marami, so then it is morally good. I don't know kung it affirms ba to the, ano, one of the discussion kanina, sir. Yun lang po. Yes, thank you, uh, Angel. I agree with uh, your statement. Similar to that uh, that I present. Okay, some more questions. Clarifications. Okay, there being none, let's give a virtual Thank applause. Uh, Sir Jan, Migs. Can I? Can I? Hi, pero pero pero. Sige sige sige. Uh, si Mix, um, there is this uh, contention that the uh, drug war of uh, the Duterte administration is a um, failure. And uh, of course, uh, there are uh, various uh, parameters to look into this. Although on the other hand, uh, from the point of view of uh, local uh, governments, um, there's also something uh, concrete that it has achieved uh, in so far as in terms of uh, the reformation of many of these uh, drug dependents. There were actually more than a million who uh, using uh, the term surrendered uh, to the authority so that uh, they can have uh, themselves a rehab. And it is a finding that uh, was uh, not really um, a, 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 a a thing that was uh, observed in the previous uh, administrations, uh, meaning to say uh, there is uh, that element uh, upon which uh, the will of the president in terms of pursuing the drug war uh, has uh, actually resulted into something that is um, quite uh, from the viewpoint of uh, local governments uh, laudable in so far as uh, it has uh, helped, uh, for instance, uh, um, improve uh, the situation when it comes to this uh, problem of uh, drug addiction. And I can uh, observe that because I studied in Cebu, um, going into the uh, seminary where I stayed, I, 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 I know when a, a, a person is a drug uh, delinquent or not. And uh, I observe uh, when the, because when I began, it wasn't uh, Duterte yet as president. And uh, when he was uh, elected as president in 2016, then uh, immediately after that, uh, I, I, I noticed that uh, a lot of these uh, people who are, uh, quote unquote, uh, allegedly involved uh, in drugs uh, were uh, suddenly uh, gone from uh, that uh, place going into the seminary. But on the other hand, um, there is, uh, of course, this uh, very uh, obvious, uh, say, protestation um, in view of this uh, context of the human rights narrative and, and the, the, the president uh, has uh, won many enemies uh, in view of uh, this uh, context. And uh, the question when it comes to yung uh, tanong kanina, when uh, we talk about uh, this uh, drug problem, the utilitarian approach, uh, people actually benefit uh, from it in so far as, of course, if uh, there is, uh, say, relative peace and order. There are no snatchers, uh, for instance. And that, uh, in a way, gives uh, people a sense of uh, security and comfort. But on the other hand, uh, the obvious uh, counter to that is the idea that uh, you cannot sacrifice uh, not even a single life when it comes to the issues of uh, concerning justice and most especially the issue on uh, human rights. And uh, obviously, of course, uh, 
Duterte mentioned uh, your uh, concern is uh, human rights. My concern is human life. But uh, in a way, um, they are not uh, actually mutually exclusive because to live, uh, you must uh, have uh, uh, your rights uh, because uh, these rights are defined for you and actually protect also your uh, life. And so given these uh, many uh, contestations, uh, mix, uh, what do you think is the way uh, forward? And uh, do you consider the uh, drug uh, war of the president uh, successful uh, in this uh, respect, uh, knowing this uh, many vantage points, the many narratives. But of course, uh, it's not about uh, persuading people. I'm just uh, asking you uh, about uh, your, uh, say, uh, viewpoint as uh, regard to this uh, problem. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yes, sir. I, uh, Dr. Ryan, thank you for the input. And also to respond is that uh, in my own personal belief and opinion, um, the number of cases, not in incidents uh, of deaths in uh, the drug war would only mean to show that the government is really doing something. Because uh, in the past, in the, in the previous presidents, when hindi naman ganong maingay ang, ang drug war but we know that drug is proliferating also at those moments, at those times. Alam naman natin yan eh, you, in Cebu, you go to Pasil, alam naman natin yan eh, uh, in Osamis, uh, alam natin kung saan yung mga bagsakan, hotspot ng drugs and hindi naman yan gawa-gawa no? and, and there are people who could testify to that. Totoo yun. So, but there are let us say, uh, walang, walang deaths uh, that could be related to extrajudicial killing. And then um, another point is that uh, this, or, uh, this criminal organization, so-called drug syndicates, they also conduct their own cleansing. No? If their members will not be able, for instance, to remit the money, and maybe for security purposes, they also conduct their own internal cleansing uh, procedures that we might say it's unfair if we all um, accuse that to the to the president. So, yung ano ni presidente, the problem, uh, sinasabi niya no, na uh, siyang bahala sa kanyang military men. Pero I think that on the ground, iba ang talagang the real thing because alam ng mga police that they are also subject for a, a criminal case if they are not able to do uh, their job according to what is provided by the laws. Thank you, Mix. Thank you, sir. Yes. Okay, so I think that uh, wraps up our discussion of the third war of drug from uh, Sir Mig's perspective. Again, let's give him a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Okay. So our next uh, presenter is a faculty member of the Department of Arts and Sciences at the uh, Eastern Visayas State University in Tacloban City, Leyte. He is a member of the Philippine National Philosophical Research Society, or PNPRS. He will be talking about okay, uh, something also related with uh, President Duterte political positions of President Rodrigo Duterte in the perspective of Chantal Mouffe's radical democracy. So let's all welcome Dr. Josenon Purog. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sir, thank you for that acknowledgement. Uh, so actually, I, I pre-recorded my presentation. That's why I will, I will play it na lang so that whatever intervention in the net, it will be. so let's see it, all of us. Just, just wait for a while. Okay. 
So just for a while, we are we are doing some technicalities and. Okay, see, sir. Present my paper on political positions of President Rodrigo Duterte, the perspective of Chantal Mafi's radical democracy. Can you increase the volume, sir? Okay, okay. Democracy, an abandon to the collective will and accept antagonism, and Chantal Mafi's radical democracy speaks of President Duterte's political positions. Then. The scope and limitation of my presentation will be on radical democracy also and openness to antagonism, the currents of conflict and transliteration of values, and the last is the popular concept of it. Of course, the method that I'm using is what we call content analysis. Now, in Mopis, radical democracy is about opening to conflict and antagonism. Meaning, this kind of democracy is a state wherein it is open to opposition or hostility. No? This being op opposed or hostile to a certain democratic uh, principles and So radical democracy is actually giving voice to what is silent. No? So that's what Mop is trying to do. So that's why if you are a proponent of the radical democracy, there there are sometimes you are in that situation that you are the antagonist, no? You where your character you, your character is to create conflict for the main character. No? Now in the openest antagonism, according to Malfi, is also means overcoming challenges. So in a democratic government, there are so many challenges that we have to face. And one of which is that challenge is how we would try to overcome it. And openness to antagonism is the conflict struggle. It's not simply that you settle on certain degree or have an agreement or negotiations. It's really a conflict. In, in from that conflict, you really have to struggle because you want to live and survive any political positions, especially in a democratic form of government. Also, in radical democracy, it is openness to antagonism, which means the centering inequality. No? So the real equality sometimes in a democratic country is impossible, but if we just you know, accept the the, and find solution to immediate problems. Maybe the differences will try to, to be uh, solved and recognized, and people's problem will be addressed right there and then. And the idea of also of openness and antagonism is also a political action, a form of political action. That it is not enough that we have agreement and negotiations on paper. There must be an immediate action needed in order to solve certain public problems in a democratic government. In Mopi's radical democracy, it is emphasized that it is not autocracy. No? It is not a political system governed by one person with absolute power. No? In the case of Duterte, he is open to suggestions. He is not in complete. Especially if it benefits the majority of the Filipino people. So that's why it is maybe it is uh, maybe wrong to judge Duterte that he is a, an autocratic form of leader for the Filipino people. No, it is not only Duterte who consistently hates drugs, corruption, and criminality, but the millions of Filipinos. That's why his approach to solve this problem is, of course, radical democracy. Now, in Mopi's radical democracy, is not also a tyranny. It's not tyranny. It, it is not cruel and oppressive rule of government, you know, this kind of radical democracy. 
presented that he did not accumulate all powers, he only exercises the executive, and he does not encroach the judiciary and the legislative powers unless antagonized by them and he will retaliate them with conflict or maybe perhaps create some form of institutional crisis. All these things in this radical style of politics, it is not only the that they raise extortion, terrorism, and then the subversive action, but more but the more than 17 million so voted for him. Now, what is the motivation behind the 30s? The motivation behind the 30s political position? Well, the fact is the motivation behind is of Maoist radical democracy, you know? Because in the 30s time, he was able to produce free education to a lot of Filipino people. He was able to have um, that you know, the government launches anti-corruption youth program. So he wants to have good governance and he hates disestabilization. And in the, the problem of Manila Bay garbage, he put some white sand and do, a lot of people are so critical about it, but he still insisted to do it. No? In the aspect of the field health, he assures the packages of uh, his field health assurance, insurance, and it's still available for all members. And he provided housing to the IPs. And he also has this building program. Now, in the third economic policy, he has the building program, the second fastest economy. That's why we got in 2019 survey, we are the second fastest economy in Asia. And in his foreign policy, there is a clear picture of the Turkish opposition in defense of treaty with the United States of America, but it's non confrontal and less formal approach to China and safeguard the interests of the nation and its citizens. So in the Turkish war on drugs, which is controversial, there are also a lot of people who supported this, no? Uh, they, they, they want also to stop these illegal drugs and he wants, they want also that the authorities should address poverty and corruption in government. And also in the third day, he does, he resists on oligarchs and elite you know, where he wants that rich and poor alike have equal opportunity in the new government. That's why he has so many figures in the third day, the so-called country. That's why he would always say on the part of the telcos that I will take drastic steps if you do not improve your 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 services to the people. And in the drug problem, he, he always wants to address it, telling it to the people in the Philippines that he will try his best to at least curb the problem of illegal drugs. Now, in Maoist radical democracy, if we try to define it is an approach to governance based on subsistence reasonable action, meaningfully interpreted coming from a democratic concept. Now, in short, it is a meaningful democratic action as opposed to intellectual democratic negotiable reason. And in short, talk so little, do much, and act immediately. Now we go to Maoist radical democracy in the political position. So Duterte said the trouble with us in government, meaning our representative government, is that we talk too much, act too slow, and do too little. No. So that's why he, he wants to go the uh, to the opposite. No, he wants to immediately address all these problems. Now in this transliberation of values in his political position, social, economic, and foreign policy, we can see here in his uh, pattern of events. No? First, there is this drug problem in the, in the Philippines. Then after that problem, Duterte put some sense of good governance. Then after that, uh, it was protested by people. Then, from being protested by people, it was another people who, you know, uh, once uh, once this protest support this protest to kill the drug lords, no, 
then Duterte again, do, there are a lot of positions he has to implement it because he believes that there's a force, full support of people against illegal drugs. Then a lot of family in the Philippines was able to observe the the success of his steps. No, that's the, though sometimes he's a victim of his own means, but he is trying to look into the common good of the Filipino people. And yet, after that, there was already uh, experience of, you know, security among the majority of the Filipino peoples. It was opposed again by a group saying that stop the killing. And yet, there is another group from who will support Duterte, and then another opposition that will come. It will be antagonized, then another support will come from Duterte. But, you know, in the end, Duterte said, I cannot pray heaven utopia for everybody here. Life is never fair, but I, I said I intend to stop drugs that is destroying our country and criminality. Now we look in the Manila Bay issue. There's also this, again, transpiration of values. There is a problem that exists. Now this president wants to have a good governance. So in this good governance, so he wants to clean Manila Bay and put dolomite sand. When he did that, a lot of protests happened. But he still persists, continue. He antagonized these people who are against him. And then again, he was protested, saying, stop dumping dolomite, give us Manila Bay reclamation, Labanan, no? All these things are against the Turkey. But yet, in the end, what had happened? Now, a lot of people love to go to Manila Bay, have pictures with their families because they have seen the beauty of the Dol Dolomites. And then it was again protested by some people telling that we need food in the midst of this pandemic, not Dolomite, but still Duterte insists, no? In his saying, what's beautiful is beautiful, period. He, he, that, that's how radical his politics is. And when he insisted on this, again, the, uh, a protest took place, Labanan ang pag Pasismo, so he was already accused. But in the other side, you know, in the country, there are people also supported his moves. Then some students in a prestigious universities protested against Duterte, and then Duterte said, Oh, ito na siya, no? Uh, of all this build -build project, he, from the three to four hours travel, there's now 40 minutes na lang, no? And he has accomplished a lot of significant. I the same thing that has happened in the issue of South China Sea. No? With Duterte befriended China, there's betraying Duterte as traitor. And Duterte said, uh, I have to improve my relation with China. And it does not mean that we will waver in our interest on West Philippine Sea. But again, he was also criticized by a, a senator. No? He is an orthodox, but yet Duterte said that it is it is his duty, no, that he has to do something for the good of the government. No? And then he was protested again. Another issue here is on Ferdinand uh, Ferdinand Marcos burial, no, where when there was that news that the president allowed it, there are so many rallies said no to Marcos burial, no, and yet. The burial took place, then another rally took place. Marcos is not a hero. Then Duterte was with the, you know, with the Marcoses uh, giving some message on he is, in fact, had given a red, a burial red to the family, and it was again protested. No? But Duterte said, uh, the very reason that I allowed the burial is because he is the president, he is a Filipino. And he has the right also to be buried in the living ng mga bayan. Then again, in the Boracay issue, when the Duterte decided to clean up Boracay, the, the people protested, please don't uh, close Boracay. And yet, because of his insistence again, whether they like it or not, he has to pursue it, he has to do it. Then when it was already in the process, in the closure, so they want Boracay to be rehabilitated. 
Then when it was in the process of rehabilitation, another rally took place because a number of people are starving. And yet, what did the president said? Boracay Island is just the beginning and the girls are already there, meaning it's already finished and I will open it now. So before we see Boracay how it is, before it was re re rehabilitated here, rehabilitated, then now after it becomes now the number one beach uh, tourist destination in the world. And again here in the same sex marriage, when he was doing the campaign, Duterte was, you know, with this LGBT group. But a number of people again protested by his, uh, you know, being in favor of this LGBT. Then when it was, it happened, uh, Duterte even host a Thanksgiving party for LGBT members in the Malacanang. But later on, Duterte realized that there's, there's, there's no end in this. That's why he, he changed his mind not to support them anymore, but again, the rally took place the violence against the LGBT, LGBT community. And what did Duterte said, the law says that we have a marriage between a man and a woman. And that is the present law. Unless you law, then he can change it. Since Duterte is not a is not the law, so he has to respect the law. So he cannot do otherwise. Now in President Duterte's radical democracy is a people's acceptability, you no? Know? And a lot of people in the survey has approved. In 2018, there is that uh, uh, the, the crime went down and the family were happy. And 73% of Pinoy's believe on drug users decreased since the third took an office. And there was a successful implementation of his intensified peace and order in, and a lot of uh, structures that he had created for for the country and a lot of improvement. So that's why he has these speeches, you know, a leader must be a terror to the few who are evil in order to protect the lives and well-being of the many who are good. You know? So the law mandates it because it is good for the country and for the people. Now, Duterte said, I will crack down corruption, drugs, and criminality. And th that's, that's how he, he had shown in his uh, perspective in Mofi's radical democracy. So in my summary conclusion of this is that radical democracy is the principle behind President Duterte's leadership. And radical democracy of Duterte's political position are the policies that have been shaped and defined the Philippine democracy of today. In Duterte's political position, and radical democracy are responsible to the transvaluation of values in the political. For radical democracy, recourse is pattern of events in political policies of President Rodrigo Roa Duterte. And radical democracy is a public acceptability. It depicts the pleasure of the Filipino people and their struggle to overcome corruption, drugs, and criminality. And radical democracy is another step to Philippine democracy, which immediately addresses people's problems and centers on the principles and meaning behind authentic public service. Seven, radical democracy helps students and teachers to know democracy better and discover the beauty of political life. Nine, eight, there's no absolute interpretation of democracy, and democracy is open to interpretations, and there is a need to reinterpret democracy. The people are the ones who will interpret and reinterpret Philippine democracy. It is recommended that radical democracy should also be viewed using other philosophers' ideas. Thank you very much, and that's all. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Porog. Hey, uh, you're welcome. So, um, so now we open the floor for questions. Uh, sir, Ayat. Good sir, afternoon. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, uh, that's a good uh, presentation. But uh, looking at it, uh, what is really the policy direction? The policy direction direction <coughs> of the Duterte uh, presidency. Ano ba yung talaga yung direction niya? Kasi 
nakikita ko na <coughs> iba talaga yung unique yung kanyang pagkatao, uh, pagkatao uh, yung kanyang pagka-presidente. Uh, authors, experts in uh, uh, public administration would call it tunnel reverse effect of the Duterte administration. I will explain to you what is tunnel reverse effect. In in the tunnel between England and France, no, there is a law there that you cannot change lane. Once you go to England from France, you have to be on that lane until you reach England. Never reverse transfer to another lane, even if there are no. Uh, upcoming uh, vehicles, you are not allowed to reverse your uh, your lane. Yeah, tawag yan, tunnel reverse effect. Be, uh, the tunnel reverse effect is a, is a condition in polit political governance from which the leader is always antithetical to the current condition of policies uh, in effect, for example, in our country. For example, I have heard Kanina the Miranda Doctrine. That's Miranda Doctrine is a traditional uh, legal system for someone to be arrested. He has to be uh, informed of his rights. That's enshrined in the Constitution. That is enshrined even in in the book, in the annals of human rights uh, policies in the world governance. But Duterte is different. He reversed his, uh, his uh, strategy in addressing drug problems. He reversed. So he really, sabi niya, huwag kayong magpauna sa, huwag kayong magpauna sa drugs, uh, drug career or drug uh, poser. Kapag nakita ninyo na your life is in danger, pickhan mo na. Because you have also your families. So, ang tawag niyan in moral system, slippery slope morality ba? Slippery slope. Kanang kan ma-slide ka eh. So, you can make use of that as a justification for killing a suspect. Which is a tunnel reverse effect. And Duterte is exploring along that line. So uh, another example of tunnel reverse effect, sir, the Gordon uh, problem in the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee. Because Duterte questioned the authority of the Senate to put a resource person in jail. So the lawyer of... Uh, the lawyer of the Chinese uh, family owner uh, argued that the Senate has no prosecutorial powers and therefore it has no power to put a resource person to jail. And uh, the lawyer invoked a, a Supreme Court ruling in the US where uh, that resource person was released. Only the courts, only the judge can bring someone to jail upon conviction. So ngayon, si Gordon is pinapa-explain na Supreme Court. That is another example of tunnel reverse effect. He reversed his direction. Another example, sir, is uh, the international relations policy of Duterte. Kung ayaw niyo sa akin, Punta ako sa China. Punta ako sa Russia. Who are you? I decide on my own. Independent foreign policy. So he is not a tuta anymore, but he just changed direction. He might be called a tuta of China or Russia, but that is yet to be uh, uncovered whether talaga ba yun. So... Uh, that's radical democracy. That's radicalism. He is not. He is not uh, uh, afraid of what you will see. Sa kabila, 
uh, but I will pursue this policy because this is uh, uh, this is my way of running this country. So, in other words, sir, what is your uh, take on on that uh, as a radical president? Uh, off your mic, Mr. Okay, okay, uh, Tana, okay. Thank you, Dr. Sabli, for that uh, beautiful uh, information that I have learned. Um, uh, for me, sir, I know uh, upon studying Mafis radical democracy, I see in Duterte, um, it, you know, I, I would like this. The fact of the matter is this, you know, when you say radical democracy, it, it is much of uh, do. Uh, do solving the problem immediately. No, this is a type of democracy where it is steps further the representative democracy. No, it, it, this is uh, the the one step further of a representative because in in in, in this type of democracy, uh, it, there the there are certain love falls in a representative democracy, and the one that addresses this one is the radical democracy. No. Because the, the sad thing with uh, representative democracy, we, we do a lot of agreements, negotiations, and on paper, everything is just... Duterte was able to see this, this, uh, this weakness in a representative democracy. That's why he reversed no? the, 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 the flow. And that's why, that's why he, he acted that's, immediately. That's oh. So that's why he talks so little, he do much, he act immediately, whatever problem, and what is good for the Filipino people. Now, if I was, if I will be asked, what direction is this? I think this is the direction of the of the the typical uh, figure of Philippine democracy, because Philippine democracy is not an American democracy. No, yeah. we have our own Philippine way of restoring our own Filipino style of democracy, and I believe Duterte was able to have these foundations of what Filipino democracy is. Because the sad thing with us, uh, a lot of our theories is from the Western theories. No, we need something that is in a Filipino. No, and this is the person I believe who cemented this kind of Philippine democracy. Our democracy is unique. No, and it's different. It goes out from the theories of what is in the political theories. And uh, as what I have heard yesterday with Doctor. Uh, uh, no comment, sir. Uh, with the, with uh, uh, Dr. Victor, ano, um, that's very true. Our democracy is still young. No, we are still. You are just 100 year old democracy. So many things will happen. No, so we have to focus things that in a typical Filipino way of governance. No, we have to look into that direction because this is the thing. We always copy theories uh, without recognizing. The, the, the Filipino way. That, that's that's because the problem in our representative democracy is typical Filipino. That's it's but it must be addressed in a typical Filipino way of policies. And I believe in the third this way is the typical Filipino way. Which if you use other theories, the Western theories, you will not really understand that. That's what I I, I see it. And the only thing that will happen if we focus on that and focus on that journey is to criticize and criticize and criticize. You know, Filipino way of life is different from that, you know, Western way of life. And another thing uh, that I would like to share, in, in studying Mao's radical democracy, he, is, he meant on the political. This his idea of the political is uh, politics must be separated from morality. Now, the sad thing is this scenario, no? Filipinos, we as a Christian country, we were molded on that, no? Moralizing politics, moralizing politics, moralizing politics. In Mount Peace Radical Democracy, politics is not morality. No, it has to go through its venture because there are problems in politics that have to be addressed in a very political way, no? That sometimes, that's why if you contextualize now morality into politics, now, given the fact that morality has all this perfection, the moral norms, all these laws, you know, conscience and everything, and politics is different. No? Politics is also struggling to become a, a better, to, to promote or to have a better society. That's why Malfi said, you know, you have, there are things that 
in representative democracy that are uh, that has to be addressed because of so many lapses now radical democracy is another step meaning part of being a better democracy is to implement radical democracy because all your negotiations all your agreements should not end on paper it must be acted out immediately and duterte have seen this opportunity have seen this in his presidency that's why a lot of people a number of people the philippine people love him is because of you know the one that is left behind has been seen he he, he helped no that's why he, this is even a question if he's really a populist no actually populism was already there before duterte no the, 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 there was already there among all the presidents in the philippines have gone uh, ahead of duterte uh, who, who, who were presidents before populism was already there but these people the marginalized especially those people you know uh, because you know radical democracy is is does, does not favor to elitist form in even the what, what he's after is in this radical democracy is equality among men equal opportunities in every in, in, for everyone and Duterte was in this that these are a lot of people the majority are left behind by these opportunities that's why he took that action and that's why he, he became popular because he, that was his way his journey towards serving the people in the in the, in the country so if you ask me what is the end of this the end of this is actually on, on the people himself the filipino people because we have started this kind of journey in our democratic life this will be quoted even who will be the next president he will always be there going towards the end of the tunnel duterte will always shine along the way no that's why in my ending i said that radical democracy is the principle behind and you know this this study is um, you know will help us students uh, all teachers to know democracy better and discover the beauty of the so-called political will in governance because this is the thing that had luck no? political will and radical democracy is you know intertwined with it no? so that, that's that's how i see it sir victor i don't know if i have addressed your question Yes, sir. Very well uh, said. Uh, and uh, that is really the, the kind of precedent. Because radical democracy, radix, the Latin word radix, roots, uh, came from uh, the English translation of roots. What is the root of our democracy? Kita. We are the roots of our... We have to, we have to dig further the soil Politic, the soil of politics so that we can get the roots of our problem. And the roots of our problem is that our democracy is a sponsored democracy. We, 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 uh, it's a democracy that is sponsored by the U.S., by Japan, by the Spaniards. That's, that, these are the, this is the kind, and we have not yet really discovered the radix the roots of our democratic principle. And Duterte is trying to unearth that by, uh, you know, uh, looking at democracy in the Philippines as a different one, not as a pattern, uh, not pattern from the U.S., from other countries. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Okay. More, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, um, sige. Angel. Go uh, ahead. Connection lang po sa ano. Connection lang po dun sa question ni Dr. Sabo. Ah, uh, kasi nga um the Philippines um nasana yon, nasana yung buong Pilipino to the kind of democracy na natutunan natin. And this is how we practice also the democracy that we had at the present time. So. Since uh, ang, ang understanding and yung technique or yung ways ni the president in dealing with our own democracy, does, uh, does this action compromise the, uh, the, the people who believe in the itong nakasanayan na natin na democracy? Na compromise po ba siya? Kung ititingnan natin yung uh, moral obligation ng isang president to his own people. Uh, thank you, sir, for that question. Um, Actually, uh, 
definitely, directly speaking, it was compromised because this is, you know, the fact of the matter is this. Once you change something, somebody must be sacrificed. If you are to have the foundation of what a Filipino style of democracy, of course, even theorists will be sacrificed, even, and even a number of people will be sacrificed in this before you, you can implant the right direction of your own typical way of democracy. And I see in, 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 in our president, uh, I just take it as they are, that this is everything that had happened along the way in his presidency forms part of his, you know, of his foundation, that something must be in there, must be changed. And of course, it, it might, I know, lead bloodshed, whatever. But the, the point here is uh, we, we are trying to look into a perspective that goes beyond you know, to see the end of our own typical Filipino way of democracy. I'm not saying, and that's why in, in radical democracy, this is not moralizing. You know? We are looking into how democracy was able to, to you know, to, to, to take that uh, grip on the Filipino people. That we realize that democracy is not the kasanayang democracy. It's not the kind of democracy that we have been used to since we were a child and we grew up. So here is a person who tried to see another perspective. And of course, a lot of people, you know, it is just like, you know, in a tradition, if nakasanayan na and you introduce something new, of course, many, many people would do some reactions. It's just, no, it's just the way it is as they are. No? But the, the point, my point here is this, though that is the thing that happened as what I have heard yesterday, History will judge no? what, what, what will take us along the way in this tunnel. Because whether we like it or not, there are a lot of incoming generations of you know, kind of governance that we will see along the way. And we are also struggling our own kind of democracy in our country. Okay. So two questions to a questionnaire. Uh, those two who would like to ask question first, Marvin, then after Francis. Okay, uh, so let's okay, Marvin. 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 Uh -huh. Thank Marvin. you, Pastor Ian. Uh, thank you, Pastor uh, Joe Snow, no, Sir Pul uh, Pulog, ma, uh, for the very enlightening paper. Po. Uh, actually, sir, it's just more of my comment, no? Uh, okay. uh, dahil ang nakita ko lang in, uh, in the Duterte reader, na siguro, sir, baka makapagbigay lang kayo ng uh, idea dito sa comment ko. Ang nabanggit po kasi doon is that parang Duterte's presidency in a way is inevitable because of the sabi na po natin, ano, parang nagsawa na po kasi yung Pilipino din doon sa mga archetypes no, ng democracy na parang hindi nag-work. No? Tulad po ng parang yung post-EDSA, no, yung spirit of EDSA itself, in a way, hindi po talaga na-establish and, so, and then, ang isa pa daw po, what's, in a way, what's radical, which hindi, hindi pa po natin alam whether, <laughs> syempre, pwede natin siyang husgahan ngayon, but I'm just speaking here of po parang of politics, the way it's happening today, without any judgment muna. Pero yung parang, yung naiba po yung political language natin, parang na, naisama sa language, yung crass language na, na ginagawa ni Duterte ngayon, no? Mm -hmm. Um sir what are your thoughts about this uh na parang there's some sort of an inevitability of of the parang presidency of uh Duterte or, or whether you believe no that the inevitability is um uh, parang is it something <laughs> that we have to believe in or ano uh, okay uh Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, uh, ito naman yung masasabi ko. No? Uh, you know, uh, as I have said a while ago, we are that people, the Filipino people. We have It, it was cemented on that uh, idea that we, we always try to moralize politics, no? that this should be done. Uh, we cannot blame that because that is our nurture as Filipinos. No? We have been Christianized. We have to do this, we have to do that. But if you look back in perspectively in history, so as you have said, sir, kanina na nasawa na yung mga tao, I think it, it's not more than sawa. No? It's, 
there's something in there in that previous kind of democracy we have na kulang siya kulang siya na dapat you know that Duterte have seen na ito yung kulang that it, it should be something to be filled in so that it will become complete no so because of that uh, fact that we have been you know uh, christianized with there there's the tendency in a filipino to moralize politics moralize politics because they find perfection in morality no so it's it's we respect that of course but if we set politics as politics and morality is morality you know looking into the the, the the life of the the filipino people in in the perspective of the the the, the the life of the Philippines, with the perspective of the Philippine history, you know, and in politics and governance. This is only the kind of government that we have seen, you know, a, a clear picture of the beauty of a real democracy, you know, uh, the, 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 you know the, the peacefulness, the order and everything. So, yung nagikita natin ng iba nagmoralize na, it's just normal. It's, it's part of the transition, of course. But I'm not saying that morality should be eradicated. No, it's not. Because it's, you cannot do away with Filipino with that. We are on that type of people who has really that. No? But the thing that I see here is uh, along the way, because this is, we are you know, coming up a typical Filipino way of democracy. Maybe later on, we can have a president who also will live up this kind of moral thing no? uh, with a good political will also. Because the, this is his just, you know, once you are the first, everything will be, you know, you will be criticized, you will be protested, many reactions. I think and I believe this is just normal as it faces onward as they are. You know? So, uh, I thank you, po, I sir. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sir. See. Thank you, sir. Salamat po. Now we have Sir Francis for the last question. Sir Ayan, can I share my comment as the last okay. comment? Oh, okay, 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 sir. So after Francis, uh, uh, Dr. Sable, the last comment. Francis? Kung wala na. Kung wala. Sige, let's proceed to Dr. Sable. Uh, sir, uh, your paper is uh, but I cannot agree on your uh, proposition that politics and morality are not convergent. Uh, uh, they converge. Uh, but depending on how the convergence is, uh, uh, is uh, achieved. For example, uh, uh, are you familiar? Uh, ito yung philosophy of science. No? Meron tayong tinatawag in the, in the philosophy of science there are two ways of theorizing, no? uh, uh, purification. We have, we theorize using the, uh, from action, theory in action and theory in use. Uh, theory in use is normative, uh, meaning we always refer to an existing theory whether our advocacy is aligned to that theory or principle that is normative. The second one is emerging, converging uh, theory in action, meaning we, we try to derive the norms from the experience, the action, and then we develop that as a norm. So a norm is not a given reality under the theory in action mode of science, of inquiry. Ang ibig sabihin, in politics, this applies. Uh, in political philosophy, theory in action, we, we try to look at uh, uh, the experiences, how, how governance is being carried out, and then we develop certain norms, certain principles that would serve as our guiding light in advancing that. So that, that's that's the framework of radical democracy of the 30. He is not, he is questioning the assumptions of, uh, of an existing theory. 
he is uh, questioning the assumptions of a, an existing principle of democracy. Therefore, uh, uh, he is trying to, to uh, develop a theory from an experience. Because if we are going to use theory in use in our scientific inquiry, then we will be duplicating, we will be subservient to an existing theory of the West. We, uh, I call that theoretical fundamentalism, an enslavement of a particular theory for example, uh, in development, according to the American development theory, follow our direction of development. What is the direction of development? Privatize, allow the market system, etc., etc. Then you will develop. Now, if we adapt that, we are uh, the if American uh, the, uh, system, uh, American framework of development they will use uh, riders. They will use riders to advance that advocacy of the American development framework. How? They will uh, uh, come to the US, Fulbright scholarship. You study in MIT, in Harvard. And then you are cultured now by the American principles of development. And then when you go back to the country, you, you transfer that there. So privatization was, was uh, for example, uh, was advanced by the Ramos administration, uh, saying that uh, government corporations are not doing well, so we have to sell that to the public, private sector. That is theory in use. We are a slave of a foreign theoretical framework of development. Hindi tayo nag-develop ng ating sariling development theory. The same also in governance. The same also in governance. Uh, democracy in action and democracy in use. When we say democracy in, in use, we are following the tenets of the foreign democratic principles. It's anti-nationalistic. It's not within the province of a Filipino, Filipino way of understanding uh, democracy. So we just follow them. We just copy them. And the evidence of democracy in use is our constitution. It is patterned from the American constitution, neoliberalism neoliberalism uh, all the uh, all the tenets of market economy uh, neoliberalism nandoon free choice free choice walang collective choice kaya nga si Amartya Sen naka develop siya naging uh, naging Nobel Prize winner siya because he advanced the notion of collect, collective choice collective choice versus individual choice Kaya nga sa mga American societies, may nga well, that's your choice, but not all individual choices are uh, are the basis of our moral actions. It has to be sacrificed for collective choice, collective uh, rights. So, sir, uh, thank you so much. I am okay. inspired by your lecture. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Okay. Okay, so again, a virtual clap to uh, Dr. Porog for an engaging presentation. Uh, Sir Porog, if you have time, mayroong nag-chat nag doon. Okay, okay. Sa chat box, you might want to respond uh, <coughs> privately to them. Okay, sige, yeah. sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sige, sige. So let's move to our next presentation. Our next presenter is an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy, University of Santo Tomas. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy, graduating magna cum laude from the University of Santo Tomas. He is a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Religious and Philosophical Studies. He will talk about sickness unto death, a Kierkegaardian reset in the time of pandemic. So welcome, Roche Avelino Matienzo. Ang po. 
Uh, allow me to. Good afternoon, sir. Share. <clears throat> yeah, please share, sir. Okay, is it uh, there already? Uh, the client? Okay, pa. So, can see so, it now. Let me start now. Um, I hope uh, you indulge me with uh, extra patience. This is the last, uh, I think, presentation. And when I was presenting this a while ago, practicing it, it over time by a minute. So with your indulgence, uh, uh, please uh, bear with me. Now. So let me start right away. Um, so the paper is uh, entitled uh, the, the Sickness Unto Death. A Kaiki Gorgian Reset in the Time of Pandemic. Let me uh, read the paper. In this uh, paper, I uh, aim to explore the Kaiki Gorgian notion of despair, expounded in his uh, work, Sickness Unto Death, published in 1849, specifically to reflect on possible solutions in coping with the ramifications of the present pandemic. As a caveat, the thoughts in this essay were originally written weeks after the declaration of lockdown uh, last year, March 2020, which I will try to correlate with the data at present. I intend to open a philosophical discussion. Um, I would like to yeah, uh, open a philosophical discussion seeking practical answers that may address people in urgent need of a psycho-psychical cure from the spiritual claustrophobia, I would say, and this waning view of humanity towards life because of uh, in these trying times. This paper, therefore, I dedicate to those who lost their loved ones and those who've lost their lives and those who are continue fighting for their lives as we speak. It was December of 2019 in Wuhan, China, when the first case of coronavirus disease was reported. As of October 2021, the Johns Hopkins University Medicine Coronavirus Resource Center says 4.8 million deaths and almost 245 million are infected globally. In the country, there are already 2.7 million infected and more than 42,000 died. With the state-of-the-art technology and nearly 25 months of rigorous research, the cause of the virus remains unknown. Almost every week, different measures are taken in different localities. Dolomite is now allowed, but next week, we're not sure. Face shield previously are okay a month ago, but we don't know tomorrow. Hence, the most certain in the minds of the many is itself uncertainty. The most sensible remedy as so far is isolation by way of quarantine due to scarcity of vaccines available, spe specifically in a developing country like ours. So I made this equation, uncertainty plus isolation equals anxiety. This leads a group of medical researchers and many others to conclude that, I quote, the pandemic poses a threat to society's mental health in the Philippines, unquote. The incessant experience of anxiety leads to depression, a persistent psychical loss of hope brought about by depression leaves many to succumb into despair. So the question, why Soren Kaikigor? To meet this paper's aim, I will use Kaiki Gorgian notion of despair explored in his work, Sickness Unto Death. But why him and this work? Soren Kaiki Gor is a 19th century philosopher, a religious writer whose influence touches Martin Heidegger's Thanatology, we talked about that earlier in a, at length, and even his notion of angst, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's Vertigo and the Curse of Freedom, um, Alfred, uh, I'm sorry, Albert Camus' uh, absurdism, sorry, um, and even Franz Kafka's surrealism, among others. Before this work, Sickness Unto Death, he wrote Fear and Trembling, and the other one is Concept of Dread, and then uh, uh, decades after, a new translation came out, and it is uh, translated as the concept of anxiety. And 
his account of death no? on uh, three discourses on imagined occasions, which uh, Heidegger seldom quotes, no? uh, Kierkegaard, but his thanatology is actually on that one, uh, especially his being unto death, no? which we have talked about earlier. Now, this made scholars describe Kierkegaardian works as melancholic chitesis par excellence. In this time of pandemic, I deemed to explore some of his thoughts vis-a-vis -vis with our disposition about living amidst the health crisis. Sickness unto death. In the introduction, Kierkegaard asserts that being a Christian author is a physician to someone sick in bed. For him, there is a greater disease that obliterates people, which we dread more than death itself. Common today is the fear of what tomorrow might bring. None of us is sure until when we will remain employed. We are left with numerous opportunities wasted, missed goals, resulting in unstable financial and food security. All are afraid of contracting the virus. All are afraid of dying. For Kaikigor, however, all these are symptoms of a higher fear. Unfortunately, most of us are unaware of it. We treat this one basic fear as problem of existentialities that require solutions. The pandemic brought us human awareness anew, I believe, which, refuse, which we refuse to confront. This is where the difficulty comes in. That is, when the spiritual is treated in a reificatory manner with objects ready at hand to fix everything about human frailties. Yet this is not the case, as Gabriel Marcel pointed out. Life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. The advent of COVID-19 brings in more than scientia knowledge in humans but a disruption of wisdom. We physically fear, which is in a real sense, a metaphysical monstrosity. This deception ignores the imminent and considers death as impossible reality that many of us vehemently deny, even the most intelligent and the opulent ones. As a result, professionals fall into idiocy Good-natured couples get separated. Great leaders mess up. Valedictorians lose zest in learning. The toughest surrenders. For Kaikigor, this is worse than physical death since we are afraid with the kind of fear that we are not afraid of. This fear is despair. In a cryptic quotation in uh, uh, Sickness Unto Death, Kierkegaard describes fear as a synthesis, man as a synthesis of the infinite and the, and the finite, of the temporal and the eternal, of freedom and necessity. He is a synthesis. In the same pages, he distinguishes three forms of despair. The first is in despair not to be conscious of having a self. Unquote. The second is, quote, in despair not to will to be oneself, unquote. And the last one is in despair to will to oneself, unquote. The first one is when a person is ignorant of his infinite capacity to be oneself, since the focus is more on the external of the temporal world. I call this naive kind of despair. The person here is unfree since he is unaware of his or her choices and his intrinsic possibility. The second type is a kind of follower who avoids the responsibility of his action and is afraid of making choices. The person here is uh, under somebody else's command. He, he or she is free yet he chooses to be subservient. You see the irony. No? I call this uh, the follower, no? simply the follower, despair. 
The last kind is what Kierkegaard calls demonic despair, where the person deliberately refuses to recognize the love which comes from the power that creates. Uh, theist existentialist, uh, it's, they're divided, no? the theist and the uh, atheist. A theist existentialist interpret this power as God. The, the others, of course, would, uh, of course, resort to human, human freedom. Now, that's, that's, uh, uh, we can talk about no, at length in another occasion. Now, the third merits the highest form of despair since for Kaikigor, it is a direct attack against the source. Of course, being a Christian, he's referring to God. Now, in this context of the paper, the first two are controlled by externalities and classified as material despair, while the third is spiritual. The first two fall into a nowadays psychological notion of anxiety brought about by depression, while the third is the most disparaging of all anxieties because it leads to spiritual death. All three are most felt, in my opinion, in this time of quarantine. In isolation and uncertainty, we fear the loss of things and the people around us. Most of all, we are highly anxious about something we cannot clearly understand but absolutely feel. So what is the root of despair? It is the confusion between the material and the spiritual. As I stated, man is a synthesis of the finite and the, uh, of the infinite and the finite. Human nature is the tension between the body and the soul. A human person is composed of material and spiritual constitutes. This is nothing new, as explained in the ancient medieval anthropology and philosophy. Yet the failure to distinguish the two is still perennially the case. This confusion is the genesis of despair. Unfortunately, we are all victims of this. Kierkegaard explains that despair is a default condition of the individual. Despair is something universal, unquote. So when we mistakenly attribute the spirit with the material, the difficulty sets in. This lures the self more than a physical attraction this results in when we become overly dependent on worldly matters and other people, both naive uh, and following followward kind of despair is actually unto that. Some call it neoliberalism, modernity, and so on, but they are just the same of different name, of different context, of different era. This could be the community, the society, even the religion we belong to. We are so engaged with externalities, we choose to forget, I repeat, we choose to forget that there is more essential to life. This invisible virus is infecting, without us knowing it, the demonic despair. And the paradox is, we are all aware of this from the very beginning, but we choose to forget. This invisible uh, 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 virus is infecting us without knowing it. No? Why? Because this is rooted from within. It is personal, meaning no one can tell us, no one can tell you to choose the otherwise, none other than yourself upon your realization. Lockdowns. Before the quarantine, we dream of lying in bed and sleeping all day. At work, we daydream about a long month's holiday, even still, uh, five to ten minutes of sleep and dub it as power nap, you know. <laughs> at present, we stay wide awake at three o'clock in the morning, waiting for drowsiness to touch our eyes. With our overstaying at home, we listen to the clock ticking of dropping water from the faucet to finish another restful day. For moms, going the grocery store before the pandemic is a tedious and time-consuming routine. But now, even the husbands anticipate this day having the privilege of going out. The food we craved has become a surfeit since they are just a matter of delivery in our fingertips, in our mobile phones. I remember on the month of May, we have putu bumbong. Who can think of that? Putu bumbong on the month of May. 
the tourists trapped in a cruise ship and island destinations turned celebrations into a curse. Our heroes, OFWs, are refused entrance returning to their hometowns. Reunions became a crime. Before when one gets sick, the mother will watch over you. Now a simple sneeze becomes a national threat. Healthcare facilities are extended in the hallways, shaded trees, parked cars, which serve as hospital beds. In countries like Italy and Brazil, street corners have become graveyards. Reports had turned into names. Names have turned into familiar ones. Friends, family members, and we ourselves eventually became victims. One cannot help but experience fear of losing control over things, of our lives. This, among others, bring us to a sense of hopelessness in this world and eventually despair. So what is the cure? Using Kaikigorgian diagnosis, one may find that we are afraid of dying. This is a perennial question, Kanina. No? Uh, one finds that we are afraid of dying, not because of death, but with the very thought that we are not prepared to leave the people and things most dear to us. Uulitin ko po, no? One finds that we are afraid of dying, not because of death, but with the very thought that we are not prepared to leave the people and things most dear to us. It is neither the physical disease nor the suffering that dread us the most, but the unfinished businesses we have with the world. In the moment of death, the individual discovers his or her temporality that is the brevity of life, as if saying, my existence is insignificant to be remembered by anyone. I live alone, by the way, no? and I think this is one of the most uh, painful uh, experiences one may have, that you die, nobody knows <laughs> already that you're already dead. If despair is a spiritual disease, more dreading than the physical death, what is the cure then? Is there a vaccine that provides us with hope and spare us from such a metaphysical condition? It follows that the cure is also spiritual. The antidote for Soren Kaikigor is faith. Faith, however, is something personal. This is true with the COVID-19 survivors. Their testimonies are rooted in the belief that fuels them with positivity amidst despair and anxiety. In a documentary, journalist Howie Severino reflects on, uh, on this when he says, Marami na kaming lumalaban pero sa totoo, mag-isa mo itong haharapin. For survivors, reflecting on the people and the things they cherish most is essential. But the strength to move on comes from the divine whom they commune with personally, in isolation, in subjectivity, in passion of inwardness. This is the spiritual remedy that fuels them to fight. It also made them promise a life of gratitude and service to everyone once healed. Uh, Dr. Uh, Armin Supnet, no, a physician at the USD hospital, uh, once, said, uh, once thought that he's going to die already. And when he was able to, to, uh, to get healed, he promised to be better, a better physician to his patients. Let me now end. In Kaikigorgian faith, uh, in Kaikigor's faith prescription, if I may, one need not be technically religious, but must be perfectly still. With this pandemic, funerals without rituals, both Christians and Muslims are sympathetic more than ever. For the fortunate ones, goodbyes are said through two-way radio or via FaceTime, yet most heartfelt. Of course, all forms of death are earnest, but the pandemic made it enormously personally meaningful. Most victims die in silence and stillness in isolation, of isolation. The traditional worship of congregations has become obsolete as it turned into solitary prayer before a television, laptop computer, or smartphone while sitting perfectly still. 
Receiving Christ, this one is personal to me, no? receiving Christ via spiritual communion is something other than the usual reception inside a church of stone. The 2020 Easter celebration in the stillness of St. Peter's Square makes the Pope and, and, a new, and a few cameramen send a fresh message of Christ's resurrection throughout Christendom. In the stillness of everything, loudly speaks the truth of faith Faith is personal. With the stillness of pandemic isolation, uncertainty becomes clearer to those with purity of heart. When Kaikigor talks about death at length in three discourses and imagined locations, where Heidegger and uh, Sartre no, plagiarized, sorry, uh, their notion of death, he says, My listener, if you fear this stillness, even though you are doing your best to have a conscience, then keep on, then endure it. This stillness is not the stillness of death in which you perish. It is not the sickness unto death. It is a transition to life. This personal faith also opens up the world's perspective anew. In this pandemic, we fight by sitting idly on a couch. We realize washing hands frequently is not difficult at all. Long-distance communications strengthened relationships, as contrary to those long-distance never works now, uh, relationship. Fast-moving countries like the U.S., China, Britain, recalled and suffered from the effects of second and third waves of infection, China, very recently. Nations seldom heard, like Algeria, Bhutan, Congo, Vietnam, have become the trailblazers in flattening the curve with minimum deaths. Healthcare workers become crucial as that of a congressman or a military general. Offices have become remote. Meetings happen in the comfort of your living room while in shorts and fluffy slippers. Stock markets and crude oil plummeted, yet the local retailers and agricultural, uh, 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 agriculture thrived. Major cities are left empty, letting creatures of the wild cross the streets, including those extinct. Even the most enormous hole in ozone layer over the Arctic completely healed. Back home in the Philippines, the once coveted capital NCR as the center of finance and industry turned into a ground zero of contamination, providing once more that life in the countryside, albeit simple and still, is conducive to a healthy and happy living kind of life. With the pandemic, we realize that powerful people are not at all immune to viruses, while the less fortunate ones are more determined and vigorous. All these life lessons are revealed to us in the stillness of isolation brought by the pandemic and quarantine. In Kaikigorgian epidemiology, faith is the opposite of despair. If this is correct, faith, in the time of pandemic, is a reset of the spirit, a reset of the self, and perhaps a reset of humanity. Thank you very much to everyone for your patiently uh, listening. Salamat po. Okay, thank you, Doc Matienzo, for shedding some light and meaning to our experience of despair, putting some faith on it. So now we open the floor for questions, clarifications, or maybe some uh, resonance. Okay. Resonances from our own experience as well. Okay, uh, Marvin, go ahead. Uh, okay. uh, good, good afternoon, Dr. Hoshi. I don't know how to do this. It's very important. But Dr. Hoshi, thank you for a very enlightening Oh, no. Um, may ang tanong ko lang po, Doc, yung is there, parang is there a clear idea of hope for Kierkegaard? And uh, how do we characterize that hope po? Um, parang is it a hope for something beyond which we do not fully understand even if we have a faith? Or is it a hope po ba that is also tangible? Or, Parang it is based po sa faith po ng tao. Okay. Thank you po, Doc. 
Uh, thank you sir, uh, very much, no, sir, sir Marvin. No? Uh, sir Marvin Einstein is the chair of philosophy in our senior high school at the University po, no, of Santo Tomas. Uh, uh, we have to, I, I think, po, no, in my opinion, we have to understand that uh, Soren Kierkegaard is an existentialist. In fact, many consider him as the father of existentialism. Now, common among the existentialists is the doing. No? We, we, they don't even uh, to, uh, liken to be called existentialist. Uh, but out of terms, uh, uh, proper terms, we call uh, existentialism as, as, as a philosophical movement. Now, why is that so? Um, because they are more into praxis. They are more into actions. So I don't think, no, we can always speculate and interpret, but I don't think no, we can have a categorical definition of hope in the literature of uh, Soren Kalkigor because each of those uh, writings, there are even 18 pseudonyms no, of different persona. One an atheist, one is a, a scientist, one a philosopher, one a poet, no, one a skeptic. Yeah. But, but what, what, what is he trying to do? He's making a statement that throughout his corpus, though enigmatic and so un, uh, unorganized, he simply wants to say that there is hope in this life that we can always uh, uh, embrace to. We can always appropriate. We can always live. And he is very much clear on this. He is not into speculative kind of theology, no, and that made him make him excommunicated, no, kawawa, no. Uh, when when I do visit Copenhagen, you can see actually his his uh, uh, in a graveyard, no. Uh, beside, uh, what I'm saying is it's not blessed. He was not blessed. No? Why? Because for him, a uh, 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 faith is something that you must live, you must practice. And in doing so, he went against the organized church uh, during his time. So I think to make, I'm sorry for the long routine, but what I'm simply saying is his life is an embodiment of, 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 of hope. And ultimately, his life is an embodiment of what he teaches about faith. And he's very much against with those people who treat hope, who treat faith, in a speculative, in a theoretical way, which are imposed. Sa kanya, okay. it's more of a personal. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Dr. Rossi. Thank you. I hope I make sense. <laughs> okay. Now, Francis. I hope Francis is able to join us now. Hello, po, brother. Ah, Francis. There you go. Go ahead, po. Hello. Ang problem with ayon. Welcome, uh, Sir Francis. Looking good. Ah, uh, we we can't hear you, po. Uh, maybe you are. Oh, problem. I think with. Muted. Okay, lang po. If oh, you can write po sa be. sa chat. Uh, oh, so right I'll now in the chat, sir. To, to address the... We cannot, uh, we, we cannot hear you. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. Pa. We cannot hear you. Okay, sige. There's one in the chat box. I don't know if Mom Conception would like to verbalize her question. I'm in a car right now, so sorry. I, I'm in a car. Uh, yeah, I'm in a car right now. Hi. Ah, sige po. Uh, sige. Don't worry, ma'am. I will open the, the chat. I'll read the question po. Okay, sige. Hi, yeah. uh, sir, sir Ian. Yeah, sige, 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 doc. Uh, the question of ma'am uh, uh, Connie. Uh, let me read the question for me. <laughs> Using the framework of Kai Kigor, is there a possibility that we can give hope to the poorest of the poor who lost their jobs and cannot feed their families? Ang ganda, no? Ang ganda nung, nung katanungan, no? Uh, by mm -hmm. the way, uh, 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 Professor uh, Regalado is also a Kai Kigorian herself. I think she made the thesis on, on this one. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, uh, Ma'am Connie, um, uh, 
he, he belonged to opulent family back in 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 the 19th century Copenhagen Denmark um and his philosophy is more on personal he is more on subjectivity in fact one of the criticism against him is solipsism solipsistic philosophy uh fideistic kind of faith so it's more on me 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 and myself and that's the the idea behind leap of faith no? leap of faith is you express your 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 faith to god and god alone as in a case of abraham and god the others won't understand it no? the others won't won't understand what what's going on in the head of of abraham trying to kill uh, 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 his son so i cannot find no uh, based on my limited reading of soren kaikikor Uh, this direct no, uh, uh, addressing, he did not directly address this hope no, and, and, and faith, especially to the people who are, who are starving or starving, the poorest of the poor. But we can always speculate and we can always translate this. And my uh, answer to that is yes, definitely. No? Uh, we can make use of this definitely on... Uh, Um, in addressing this, uh, I'm not saying alleviation, no? but it's more on giving them hope. In fact, without knowing Kaikigor, these people who are not familiar with the philosophy of Kaikigor, the statements, marami itong aking ginawang interview and uh, statements, are actually very, very Kaikigorian. The irony is they don't heard familiar with Kaikigor, but this, the, the poor ones, you know, people on the streets, You can see it when they talk to them. They say, "May awa ang Dios, bahala na si God." No, kung palalalimin mo yung kanilang uh, 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 pananalita, bahala na si God. I was thinking, I entrust my health, my life, my everything, my career to God. Bahala na. In one of the papers, I I uh, I, I, I I interpreted as a kind of expression and manifestation, embodiment of leap of faith. I entrust to you. And these things commonly we hear among the, the, the poor ones. So with or without Kaikigor, I think no, this framework is uh, one of the uh, uh, hidden, hidden uh, uh, philosophy that they do, the reason why they are surviving in this time of pandemic. Yun po yung aking kasagutan. Okay. Sige. Uh, Sir Francis is making another attempt. Sige po, Sir Francis. Sir Francis. Ayon. Yeah. Sige daw. Sige. Yes. We can hear from you. Uh, this is just my point with regards to Soren Kierkegaard. I know that Kierkegaard is the brightest of, aside from Nietzsche, he's the brightest among the existentialists. But my question is, How can we proceed to that kind of level of understanding with regards to that kind of uh, hope? That that hope is not a normal kind of hope. Yeah, uh, um, that's that's a good no. That's a good and brilliant question, also, uh, Francis, Sir Francis. Uh, I think it's also akin to the uh, very practical question of Mamkori. No? Uh, how can they understand this kind of, of, of hope, what uh, Kai Kigor, in my interpretation, is telling us? Um, I think, Sir Francis, uh, let me reiterate my point here, no? my opinion on this one, is that they are actually doing it now. They are actually surviving on the basis of this special kind of hope. That is why sometimes we don't understand what they're doing. Bawal na ang pumunta sa Kiapo, no? Pero you see a lot of people there are trying to knock at the the the, the bars there at the at the wall, no? Even though uh, ATF says you are not allowed to be here, isn't it a special kind of understanding? among common people. And this is exactly, in my perspective, what Soren Kaikigor is telling. Now, of course, 
Kaiki Gore is not saying that go to Capo and so on. But this is this is I think no the the the, the basis why they express their faith even though the authorities is saying don't go there there are viruses but how come there are people anticipating and doing their their uh by all means the old ones are, are even uh, going out of their houses during January 9 before the pre-pandemic bawal ang buntis and so on and so forth but they still they, they are still there bringing their their kids and the majority of those who join the devotees are actually uh, uh, the less privileged, those poorest of the poor, I may, if I may say. So I don't think there is a, a, a need for us to tell them this, this is the, the special kind of hope and understanding, and I am wanting to teach this to you. Basically, in my opinion, they are embodying it already. So I don't want to impose Kaikigor on them. No? I want to do it the other way around. This is what Kaikigor is telling. No? And this is kagandahan, very indigenous among Filipinos. Very native, no? very, very natural among Filipinos. No? I have so many things to say, pero uh, for the interest of time, uh, baka po mayroon pang gusto mag-share o magtanong o... Uh, welcome po. The paper is still a uh, work in progress, so I need your input po also. You got some more. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, okay, Doc, go ahead, uh, go ahead. So uh, I understand the uh, Kierkegaard, the basis is uh, philosophy on hope on uh, Christian, on the Christian tradition. And uh, given uh, the reality, for instance, of uh, terrorism and uh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of uh, religious uh, conflicts uh, that uh, characterize uh, the contemporary times, how uh, will uh, the idea of hope uh, appeal to someone, for instance, uh, who experiences uh, exclusion uh, because of uh, one's uh, religion? Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, Islamophobia uh, happening in Europe, and uh, we also can uh, like only commiserate uh, with uh, a lot of people uh, on the basis of uh, our say uh, sense of humanity. And yet, uh, it's a matter of fact that uh, politics is uh, defined uh, by many of these uh, prejudices and biases against people. So. How uh, can this hope be considered as uh, something that is of universal value, um, considering that, uh, as I've mentioned, that there is this uh, tension uh, amongst uh, religions uh, in contemporary time? Thank you, sir. Ganda po ng uh, katanungan mo, no? uh, Professor uh, Ryan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very real. No? Uh, in fact, I uh, delivered another paper po, no, in 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 Romania uh, on 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 dialogue, religious dialogue, and I also made the framework of Sorin Kaikigor and specifically talking about that. And with me is uh, Muslim, both of Shia and uh, no, and Sunni mga magkakaaway, no. But there, uh, we we talk about uh, astrophysicist from from uh, Iran, no, who was an atheist and a communist from uh, Moscow, no, and there uh, we belong to different origins and orientations. But when we presented this, no, ang ganda nung aming naging uh, 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 talakayan because uh, we we talk about hope, no, we talk about faith, and we talk about uh, universality of this aim and intention. Of peace. Of course, we cannot deny the fact the fundamentalism who says that who can who may who might even misinterpret Soren Kierkegaard who's saying that the leap of faith is my uh, expression of highest faith. Therefore, uh, allow akba and then uh, uh, blow. No, of course, that's the extremist, the terrorism. Uh, that's the other side of it. But in that conversation. Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, the, the 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 what we are we are hoping for our commonalities and our my framework then was was Soren Kaikigor, and uh, uh, this is I think something universal. This is something universal as 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 you mentioned. No? Kaya nga, I, I tell you, 
with or without Soren Kaikigor, everybody is is having this 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 hope. No, uh, uh, Mandela no uh, was even saying, and and you know Gandhi and throughout history of mankind, and they are being attacked no by their their opponents saying that hope no is a very dangerous thing. It's because it gives us. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, liberation, emancipation? No, it it shapes uh, humanity. So and it gives us also meaning, and it also uh, legitimizes you know uh, our aims and hopes as a common people. Uh, and it kills, no, uh, and it opposes dictatorship. You know, uh, it opposes uh, atrocities, even terrorism. Um, medyo nakaikot din po ako no kahit papano and I see also this this yeah definitely there are there are uh, islamophobism exclusivity uh, even among Asians uh, and racial discriminations LGBTQ and so on but we cannot also deny the fact that uh, people are also becoming more and more aware about inclusivity no about about uh, recognizing the recognition of, of people one of which is the the the, the uh, notion of coloniality nowadays that somehow breaks no many uh, stereotyping in in the history of philosophy philosophy in 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 finance in politics no in society and i think no the world is becoming more and more inclusive and i'm i you can call me crazy but i am hoping i am hoping that someday we can get there and that I think no one of the uh, tenets uh, that we can get from Soren Kaikikor. Uh, thank you so much po sir. Uh, napakaganda po ng uh, paper ninyo and akmang akma lang na the conference uh, will end with uh, this kind mm -hmm. of message po. Mm -hmm. um, in truth, uh, hope kasi is not for something that is easy because if things were easy, there's no need for hope. Hope is for us to be able to overcome what seems to be impossible that's why uh, as you mentioned that there must be a leap of uh, faith and uh, thank you sir and uh, god bless you and uh, take care always so good then marvin when we talk about reset um is it a longing for something in the past pre-pandemic or is it something of Kasi parang meron din kasi tayong alaala of the future even if it's not happening eh. <laughs> parang may, may ganun concept. Um, um, ano po to, uh, no, yung, um, just, I'm, I'm just interested to know because parang part din po talaga no, ng anxiety yung an admission that there are things that never be really placated. No? Parang we can never placate some sort of void na nangyari na because of this. And sorry, I'm also having class kasi ngayon. But siya kala ko ba tatapos ng 2 p.m. That's a wonderful question also, no, uh, uh, Sir, Sir Teng. Um, um, the reset is actually not a concept of uh, sickness unto death, no? I'm sorry, Kai Kigor. I just deemed it to uh, unite it. I'm sorry, to, 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 to reflect on it with the with this pandemic, no? pandemic demos no? uh, with, with people. And this kind of, of phenomenon is worldwide. So I was thinking, Soren Kierkegaard is always telling us to look back and, and search no? for the meaning of our existence. And I think no? this pandemic, I'm not rejoicing no? that this thing happened. I think this is one of the most opportune time for us to reflect and go back and question our goals, our aims. When was the last time you read the book that you like most? Baka binili mo pa nga yan nung college ka pa na sa dami ng trabaho hindi mo nabuksan. At ngayon lang, itong taon na ito ay nagawa mo. I was able to finish seven paintings. No? I'm a frustrated painter but with the pandemic last time, I, I feel like I'm productive. And for the first time in 20 years, I am doing the thing I love. So in terms of faith, especially no, 
ang naka-attract naka ano sa akin talaga is that Pope Francis on the Urbis and uh, you see that that footage no? and that sino yan yung blind who was singing in front of uh, no uh, that that uh, Sagrada Familia ba uh, no no in in uh, Saint uh, uh, Mark's the square no sa akin parang uh, what the human person should be nature is telling us today that we should go back to the basic we should make meaning out of the things we do and this happened in the time of quarantine so yes it's anxiety anxiety he defines as uh something that we are afraid of but we are not aware Kaya nga, I tell you, plenagerize siya no, ni Heidegger and the rest and company no, because originally, Soren Kierkegaard was telling that no, 19th century pa lang. Um, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I'm trying to, to, to point out. No, with, uh, he wrote this without the pandemic. But he was saying that in a moment of crisis, in a moment of hopelessness, Hope arises in the moment of depression. The second book of Sickness unto Death is concluding that in the in the in the presence of despair, which he equates with sin, comes faith. No, comes uh, cleansing. You see, and the one I told you, kanina sa paper, kaya nga nagreset eh. No, so many things have been reset. At na turn over pa no of course yung iba maaring mas sumama no or mas naging mabuti again it's your choice no it's it's not something that that uh, uh, the society is telling you or what your your course is telling you your chairman is telling you but it is something of your own nagkaroon ka ng pagkakataong mag-isip isip magnilay-nilay at itong structure na to pwede mong ipataw kung saan man mo gusto at ito ay napakalaya. Isa sa mga battle cries of existentialism is freedom. And somehow, in this inclusion, we were able to loudly, in the stillness of this silence, we were loudly able to shout out no, the things that we really want to say in a moment of, of, uh, of a quarantine and isolation. Yung mga taong mamamatay na, no, lumalabas ay mas sinasabi ko in my interpretation i must mapalad sapagkat nagkaroon sila ng pagkakataon especially with the pandemic na alamin kung ano ba ang nararapat that's it thank you for do salamat sir ayan can i oh, have some doctor sable si uh, go ahead uh, uh, is there hope that uh, this uh, pandemic uh, will end something do, do we have hope can we hope you're done po, uh, professor but, uh, is there hope yeah that this uh, pandemic will uh, mm -hmm. uh, will end I something am, uh, I, I, I am not a, a scientist but I can yeah. always I am invoking the, the hope yeah, uh, yeah. experience uh, uh, professor sable um uh, uh, i can also throw that question to other <laughs> atria uh, atriaco uh or, or also fellow from who is a scientist also no who is trying to formulate a kind of vaccine which is actually and, and the test kits no which is actually for the common no? and that's actually his hope you know that someday this is going to 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 end no? uh, in a scientific way which i am not authorized to divulge uh, i don't have answer to that but soren kaiki gore's framework teach us that amidst these existentialities you mentioned this kanina no on marcel about problem and life and it's it's up for us to view it whether is it a hopeless case or we can stand above these existentialities and assert our humanity the choice is yours either kainin ka ng takot mo o kainin mo yung takot mo para sa isang mas magandang bukas o ikasasama ng bukas again it's it's still personal 
it's yours. And that itself is a Kaiki Gorgian framework. So I cannot, I cannot answer it collectively. But insofar as a personal uh, concern, I, 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 I'm believing no? the virus may not go around, but we can always treat it no? in a manner that we want to, in a more dignified one, in a more subtle one, in a very drastic one, it all depends on us. But still, a human person hopes to survive and, and have a living kind of life, healthy and happy in the future. Uh, another case is uh, during the Nazi Germany, uh, the prisoners, the Israelites, the, the Jews, queue towards the gas chamber. First, the first 10 were so hopeless. So they just faced death in the gas chamber. But the next bunch of 10 uh, Jews, they, they are smiling when they entered uh, the, the gas chamber. And uh, there, seems to have, there seems to have an element of hope, the, the futurity of, of that experience of hope. There seems to have, there, it makes sense to enter the gas chamber without fear. Uh, the, maybe these people are enlightened by that experience of hope. There is future in hoping. Uh, that, that is why they just enter the gas chamber uh, without any sense of fear, sense of despair, whatever. That's, that's very is that true. hope, sir? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yes, that's that's very much true, po, no? uh, Professor Sable. In fact, they are documented. And there are many also philosophers like uh, uh, Sir Teng, no? Levinas, who talks about, and the other one, the, the lady, uh, Pope Francis is always uh, quoting. No? It seems that they are anticipating death. No? It <laughs> seems that they are looking forward to death. I agree po, with you no? that they find something in death, this has also been talked about by uh, our uh, guest speakers earlier, no? that, that the more we, uh, we, we, we can only die, I'm sorry, we can only say that we have lived unless we are in the face of death. Sorry, uh, uh, Heidegger is saying that being uh, a Dasein is a being unto death. Once we know that death is just around the corner, we will do the best things in life. So, gusto ko sana marinig ng ating mga congressman, police officers, and so on, no? that, that tomorrow is going to be your, your death day. Tomorrow is your last day. And everybody else, bakit? Because when you have that concept, you will do the best thing you can. Kung ako ay congressman, hindi ako, magnanak hindi ako magnanakaw. I will do the best of my legislative abilities. Kung ako ang police, I will do my best. If I'm a teacher, I will teach the best way I can, knowing that this is going to be my last day. I think that's, that's, that's hope. That's the anticipation. And when you do that, no, it, you, you are making the essence and meaning of your life. And I think, no, and it's it, for Soren Kaikigor, it's revealed only to the self. It's revealed only in a person. So people might say, about, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the Nazi uh, officer, no, uh, SS. These people are crazy. Why they're laughing? Why they're anticipating death? They're crazy. Isn't it also Abraham? is so crazy wanting to kill his, his his child but this divine insanity makes him the father of all nations makes him the father of faith makes him even the muslims and, and christians celebrate because of his exemplary notion of hope and it's elevated to what we call faith we cannot understand but they see something Tama po kayo. they see something they see light. I don't know. I, I've never been into a Nazi chamber, no. But I've been to a lot of uh, uh, execution sites, no. When, when, when I, I visited those, uh, but that's also the thing I was thinking. No? What could they be thinking when they are inside that train? No? When they are being transported? When they are heading down to that uh, burning uh, uh, chamber? I could not stop imagining that some of them because of hopelessness and disillusionment, sees hope and life. And that's what Soren Kierkegaard is telling us, no? that, that there is a life 
and these things that is happening are transition. Hindi ko alam paano ma ma translate ito no sa more colloquial term but I I pretty much agree with you no that in a moment of death people would see it positively. No? They would see it positively and it's not always palatable to many. You know, uh and that's that's wisdom. That's that's wisdom. Thank you sir for such uh good uh insights and one of the best insights that i have uh, heard thank you sir maraming maraming salamat po my honor po professor sabli okay so i think that's it let's give uh a uh, virtual applause thank you thank you thank you very much Now to end this uh, afternoon's uh, session, we'll hear the closing remarks from the secretary <clears throat> of the Social Ethics Society, who is also a professor at the University of Southeastern Philippines. So let's call Dr. Moises Torrentira. Thank you so much, Rian. Yes, sir. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Mayong hapon, magandang hapon po sa lahat. The Social Ethics Society, of course, is a philosophical association that is committed to develop cutting-edge research and the scholarly outputs of its members. As we all know, as a professional organization, it organizes conferences, trainings, workshops, and seminars on ethics, politics, and society, development theory, and the social sciences. The outcomes of these activities are competent, highly capable and committed leaders in their own chosen field of expertise. So as empowered professionals committed to the pursuit of justice, the members of the organization possess the character and the initiative to share their experiences and ideas on knowledge and avant-garde research. So as such, it is expected that we engage with the state and non-state actors toward the achievement of meaningful goals that benefit Mindanao, the Philippine society as a whole, and as well as the global community. So in and on behalf of the board and officers of the Social Ethics Society, I would like to effectuate my deepest gratitude to all the plenary speakers, paper presenters, and participants to this very prestigious conference. I am very proud that this is, or this has been our 12th annual conference with the theme democratic inclusion and transdisciplinarity in the post-pandemic world. We have heard the philosophical standpoints of our presenters on matters that pertain on social ethics, justice, social and political issues, health and safety, the pandemic and the like. Our earnest duty right now is on the democratization of these insights so that they become functional at the grassroots level towards the development of the entire humanity. So this conference is definitely not the last. We will see each other again in the next conference. With this, I humbly declare the closing of this year's conference. Congratulations to the organizers and to all the participants. Thank you and God bless us all. Okay, thank you, Doc Moises. Thank you. Let's give uh, everyone uh, virtual clap. And uh, maraming salamat, bigang salamat.